Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Protecting the Wolf's Mate by Sasha Summers. Narrated by Connor Brown. Chapter One It's a wolf. Ellen ran her finger along the intricately detailed illustration of the fearsome creature on the page of the book. Like your father, and soon your mother. Like you, only bigger. You're still a pup. And the slight weight and baby smell of the small boy in her arms was pure heaven. Wolf, she repeated, adding a playful growl. Oscar's little hand rested on the page, unperturbed by the rather menacing-looking animal on the page. Instead, he burrowed closer to her chest, growled softly, and patted the book. I'm going to skip ahead on this one, I think. Your parents would not be pleased with me. Reading about the grisly, man-eating French werewolf was both horrifying and fascinating. But no matter how insensitive this pack thought she was, even she wouldn't read the tale of the beast of Jibudan to a sleepy toddler, wolf pup or not. Oscar would have plenty of time to learn all about the legends and folklore surrounding what they were when he was older. Much older. After the pack had eliminated the all-too-real monster hunting them. There are no monsters here. She buried her nose against the top of his head and breathed deep. Here, there was peace and safety and the promise of a future for them all. Oscar cooed, patting the page. Wolf, she nodded. Your pack would take care of that one, don't you worry. Besides, one day you'll be as big and strong as your father and able to protect the pack all on your own she whispered, his pale curls brushing her nose. He stared up at her, the pure sweetness of his grin tempting thoughts and feelings best left locked away. Pack member or not, this boy had taken root in a corner of her heart. You are adorable, she murmured, tickling his side until his giggle filled the room. She was laughing too, allowing herself a moment's pleasure. But the less than subtle throat clearing from the doorway told her they were no longer alone. Hollis, of course. You're lurking now? She wasn't surprised, not really. Hollis, in all his copper-haired, steely-eyed formality, was never far behind her. Following his alpha's orders, no doubt. I thought you were reading him a bedtime story. His voice was low. I am, she bit back. Go away. Hollis leaned against the doorframe, arms crossed over his wide chest, curls falling onto his forehead. What are you reading? A book? A book he would heartily approve of, about wolves. Oscar growled. Exactly. She was a proponent of embracing the inner wolf. The earlier Oscar and his wolf bonded, the stronger that bond would be, and the stronger he and his wolf would be growling was a fun place to start, especially for a wolf pup. We were almost done, weren't we? Oscar yawned, rubbing his eyes with chubby fists. It was impossible not to smile. See? Did his parents send you to check up on us, or are you being you? Hollis was immune to her insults. It was one of the more maddening things about him. Still, she'd keep trying. Nosy, bossy, condescending, judgmental, and... Is that my folklore book? He pointed at the book. Shit. No. I can see it, Ellen, he countered. He likes the pictures, which was true. So did she. Which aren't child-friendly. It was a statement with a hint of exasperation, the way he always spoke. We're not looking at those, she pointed out, holding up the book for him. Forget the pictures. He pushed off the doorframe and crossed over to her, taking the book and sitting on the footstool. You think historical serial killers make for a good bedtime story? I don't. Oscar rolled over, going limp with sleep in her arms, sidetracking her rising temper. We were talking about the wolf picture. Only, she whispered. Oscar's growl was sleepy. 
earning a smile from Hollis. You dream of being a big wolf, Oscar, she whispered in his ear. A big, proud wolf, running through the mountains with your mother and your father and your mighty pack. Run, and run, and howl at the moon. She tucked him close. Got him? Hollis asked. She glared. Of course she had him. And his slight, solid weight was all that was keeping her grounded. The air was alive with energy. Electrifying. Agitating. The impending full moon and the call to hunt singing in her veins. But instinct and her wolf told her this was where they were needed. Here, protecting Oscar. No matter what was happening beyond the walls of her temporary home prison. Instead of carrying him to his crib, she rocked him a little longer. Hollis sat quietly, his attention wandering to the low burning fire in the grate. The longer he sat, still and quiet, the harder it was to ignore him. He was an odd man, favoring his intellect over his instinct and arguing against the very existence of his wolf, which was one of the reasons he bothered her so. To choose to be an outcast in his own pack, an honorable and fierce pack, one to be proud of, and to refuse the gifts that lived inside of him? It was wrong. What? His gaze met hers. You're staring. I'm thinking about what a fool you are. She closed her eyes, resting her head against the chair. Did you need something? Or are you here purely to irritate me? He sighed but didn't answer. She got a lot of sighs from him. This time it felt different tense, uneasy. Hollis was rarely uneasy. For all his ridiculousness over denying who and what he was, his intellect was staggering. His ability to sift through and filter only pertinent information, no matter the circumstances or stakes, was something she admired. Not that she'd ever admit as much. Something is about to happen. It wasn't a question. Eyes opened. She studied him. That's a very broad statement. His grin was reluctant but disarming. He didn't smile often. He didn't emote, really. Making even the slightest expression was rewarding. Not that she was going to dwell on his devilish grin. Can you be more specific? The shake of his head was quick. Just a feeling. Your wolf? She wasn't about to let him off the hook. He's trying to warn you. Listen. It must be important. That earned her an eye roll. Or it could be that I think this expedition into the city is a mistake. Too many things could go wrong. Ellen agreed. This pack was fearsome, but young. Finn, their alpha, had yet to truly assume dominance over this pack. He'd have to in order to defeat their enemy. And like it or not, defeating the others was the only option. They were led by a wolf twisted beyond salvation. Cyrus. He instilled fear into the others, doling out brute punishment with just enough praise to keep the pack hopeful of earning his approval. Pointless, she knew, but surprisingly successful. The pack was fanatically devoted to their alpha. They would never yield, never listen to reason or accept that the world beyond their warped, cold pack still contained good. Oscar's soft groan pulled at her heart. This little one was good, pure, sweet, and innocent. He knew only the love of his parents and his pack, as it should be. Then tell your alpha. Finn listens to you all. If you protest, maybe he will delay. She stood, carefully carrying Oscar to his crib. Oscar was asleep. In the next room, Jessa, his very tired, very pregnant mother, was asleep. As was Finn, his very worried alpha father. But one look at the braced line of Hollis's shoulders, the tightness in his jaw, told her neither of them would be sleeping tonight. Of course she would go there. His wolf. Always his wolf. This wasn't about that. In ten years there had been no sign of his fucking wolf. Now, out of the blue, the thing's going to pop up in his head with some SOS about impending doom. 
Why now? Why ever? No, it didn't make sense. Stop glaring at me. Ellen slammed a hand on her hip and glared right back. She was better at it than he was. With her dark eyes and expressive features, she gave meaning to the term, if looks could kill. I'm not. He ran a hand through his hair, agitated. Liar. She rolled her neck and stretched, pulling her tank top tight across the abundant breasts he did his best not to get sidetracked by. Her lack of bras and consistently small shirts didn't help. At all. You came here, remember? For reasons he didn't understand. Since lunch, he'd been gripped with a queasy uneasiness that only increased as the day went on. Now his nerves were strung tight, and he had a piercing throb behind his right eye, and a dull roar in his ears. I wanted to check on Oscar, which was bullshit. Oscar was fine. He was with Ellen. She was probably the most capable and lethal wolf under this roof. Considering how many wolves were currently under the roof, that said a lot. Not because she was the strongest, but because she was the most experienced. They had only been living this dual life for a decade. Ellen, well, he had no idea how long she'd been a wolf. And she was in no hurry to share information with a pack that wasn't her own. She was only here to help Jessa through her pregnancy and delivery, a fact she repeated whenever the opportunity presented itself. Once the baby was here and Jessa was out of danger, she was gone. Liar, she repeated softer this time. What is it? You're more brooding and insufferable than usual. She simultaneously insulted and worried over him. That was Ellen. A paradox. Fascinating, amusing, protective, aggressive, and infuriating. Still, he couldn't imagine the hole she'd leave when she finally left the pack. He'd hoped, in time, she'd find a place here. But the woman was incredibly stubborn. So stubborn that attempting to explain his urgent yet intangible anxiety would only result in another pro-wolf lecture, which was the last thing he wanted to hear. Maybe it's just a headache. Her mismatched eyes narrowed. You foolish man. You've already said that, he shrugged. You can do better. I know you can. She smiled, quick and genuine and mind-numbing but staring at her like an open-mouthed idiot didn't go over well. The glare was back. I'm leaving. She brushed past him, hostility rolling off her lithe form. He followed. Why? She glanced back, the same question in her eyes. I thought we could look over Jess's delivery plan. The idea had only just occurred to him. Again? She shook her head. We have been over this again and again. At this point, she could probably deliver the child on her own. Finn is worried. Which was the understatement of the century. Jessa was Finn's world. The bond between them was so strong, Hollis worried about the effect losing her might have on his best friend. And his alpha. While Hollis's heart murmur altered the infection, which allowed his friends to become wolves, he was still bound by the unwavering loyalty to the pack, and Finn's rule as the leader of their pack. Ellen stopped walking, closed her eyes, and drew a deep breath. Jessa is strong. Finn is her mate. Their bond will protect her. And their child. You must trust in... Don't say it. They'd developed a mutual respect for each other, but when it came to the wolves and the infection, they would never see eye to eye. Things like destiny and fate were excuses for giving up on finding actual causes. Magic? She started walking down the hallway again. It's here, all around you, every day. Yet you refuse to see it for what it is. You can't see something that doesn't exist, he said in a whisper. Arguing with Ellen, as diverting as it was, wasn't high on his priority list tonight. Hell, he still wasn't sure why he was following her around, only that he was. I'm a wolf. I can hear you a mile away. She glanced over her shoulder again, but didn't slow. If you refuse to use your own senses, you can read about it in one of those books you have in your office. 
He didn't have to read about it to know it. His senses were just as accelerated. Smell, hearing, strength. If he didn't know that shifting was impossible for him, he might have considered the possibility that, deep inside, he had a wolf. Speaking of books, where is the one you were reading to Oscar? Once they reached the common room and kitchen, she headed straight for the refrigerator. It's in his room. She peered around the door. Either leave it, unless you want to deal with a screaming toddler, his angry father, and hormonal mother. Anders has been baking again. Her immediate delight at the plate of cookies was disarming. She continued to surprise him, even after spending months with him in his pack. Milk. She placed the carton on the marble counter. It's a wonder you're not all fat. He didn't argue. They all dealt with free time in their own ways. Anders cooked comfort food in large quantities. Delicious. She groaned around a mouthful of oatmeal raisin cookie. Want one? He reached for a cookie and knocked a picture over. She caught it before it hit the floor, her gaze lingering. What a motley crew you are. But there was a wistfulness. As far as he knew, she had no pack, no family, or anyone who cared about her. Which made him wonder all over again why she was so eager to leave them. She placed the picture back in place. You need a new picture. Olivia isn't in this, and the new baby will be here soon enough. With any luck, the pack will stop growing for a while. He ignored her glare. Besides, group photos aren't high on the priority list. Take time to record your history, Hollis. You know how important such things are. They disagreed on many things, from curing the infection that made them into wolves to the value of science versus superstition. But on this, leaving a record, they agreed. You're tense. More so than usual, if such a thing is possible. You need to find something to occupy your time. Besides trailing her like a lost puppy? Yes, he did. Something, anything, that would stop whatever the fuck was gnawing at his insides and keeping his nerves on edge. Target practice? she asked, taking a long swig of milk from the carton. He devoured two of the freshly baked cookies on the counter and took the milk jug she offered. Knives? Her affinity with knives was another mystery. Why would a woman, capable of turning into a near-perfect killing machine, need to be skilled with such weaponry? And saying Ellen was skilled with a knife didn't adequately describe just how graceful and lethal she was with a blade. Maybe you'll learn a thing or two. She was smiling, goading him. Something else she loved to do. At the very least... I'll get your mind off whatever is troubling you. He paused. Doubtful. If you don't want to bleed, you'll pay attention. Her smile wavered enough for him to see she was, in her way, offering to help. My wolf wants to hunt. Tonight, you're the prey. Chapter Two By morning, the entire pack was braced. Apparently, Hollis's mood was contagious. Ellen's only choice? Avoid them. All of them. Even if it meant sacrificing breakfast, something she needed. After a night of gleefully attacking Hollis with her array of knives, she was starving. And as always, after a fight, her senses were alive and firing, making it that much harder to ignore the mounting tension. It was her wolf that demanded she stop avoiding and ignoring and to go seek out Jessa. One look at her pale face as she gripped the changing table in Oscar's room was all it took to explain the odd buzz in the air. The Alpha's mate was in labor. Not just any labor. A human woman delivering a wolf pup child. A human woman doing her best to pretend as if nothing were wrong. Conserve your strength, Ellen murmured at the woman's side. Jessa glanced her way. I'm fine. You are, she agreed. And my job is to keep you that way. For your husband, your son, and that one. She nodded at Jess's tight stomach. It could be a false alarm. Jess's blue gaze darted toward Oscar, already down for a morning nap. 
I don't want to add more stress. Finn has enough to worry about. Come, sit, she snorted, watching as Jessa made her way to an upright rocker. Your mate is an alpha. Stress is part of that. And this stress he will welcome. Which was true. The larger Jessa became, the greater Finn's concern. While she was confident both mother and child would come through delivery healthy, the rest of the pack weren't so sure. But they didn't know what she did. She knew what it was to be a wolf. She knew the power of a solid mated pair. Cyrus and the others might have robbed her of her memories, but snippets slipped through and occasional glimpses of what was, what should be, remained. There was something familiar about the bond between Finn and Jessa. Something irrefutably solid and irrevocable. Her fingers absentmindedly ran along the scars, slashing along the crown of her head. How it came about, she didn't remember. Who put it there, she had no doubt. Soon this baby would be born, Jessa would no longer be in danger, and she would be free to go. That was the agreement they'd made. Finn had proven himself respectworthy in her time with the pack. She had every reason to believe he would honor their agreement. Ellen? Hands on her stomach. There was no missing the crease of pain between Jessa's brows. Ellen stopped pacing and sat. Breathe. She drew in a deep breath, hoping Jessa would follow her lead. The contraction was obvious. Muscles clenched, her stomach lurched. Skin paled. Heart racing, ragged breathing. Sweat. Fear. No fear, Ellen whispered. You are strong. Be strong. Jessa nodded, closing her eyes and breathed. Can I walk? Of course. She helped Jessa up. Walking will help move things along. Stop when you need to. They made a few laps around the room before Finn and Hollis, in deep conversation, joined them. Whatever they were discussing, it wasn't good. Both moved with a rigid agitation. Both wore the same grave expressions, and both of them needed to calm the fuck down. Now. You'll both need to eat a good breakfast today, she began, drawing their full attention. Breakfast you'll make yourselves. Once you've cleaned that up, you'll need to set aside whatever has you both scowling to focus on more important things. Finn's brow rose, a mix of amusement and irritation on his face. But Hollis understood immediately. How far apart, he asked. She waved her hand, dismissing his immediate need to calculate and quantify. Close enough. You're okay, Finn whispered, drawing his mate into his arms with such tenderness Ellen had to look away. She'd learned how to lock away frivolous wants like tenderness and affection. After being kept as Cyrus's personal plaything, she was lucky to be treated with civility versus outright aggression. When Jessa was kidnapped, Ellen had protected the woman out of instinct. The same instinct that surged within her now. Jessa nodded, looking far too uncertain. Life had taught her to be direct and, when necessary, brutally honest. It went against her disposition to be cheerful. Worse, to attempt to inspire a rally. But damn it, Jessa had to believe she could do this. Fear, now, was a waste of energy she'd need. Whether or not Hollis and Finn believed it didn't matter, as long as they acted like they did, Ellen had no doubt. She smiled, feeling a fool, and spoke with what she hoped was enthusiasm. She is strong. Before the sun goes down, you will be a father again. Her gaze darted to Hollis, seeking support. Instead, he regarded her with open shock. Her smile gave way to a frown. Ass. When did it start? Hollis asked, his gaze falling from hers. This morning, Jessa leaned into Finn, her hands tightening on his arms as her stomach drew taut once more. It's been getting stronger. Now would be a good time to talk to Olivia about watching Oscar. Hollis was talking to Finn. We can't leave him with Tess. Ellen agreed, but kept her opinions to herself. Olivia was a new wolf and new to this pack, but she was loyal. Beyond her pairing with Finn's number two, she'd carved a space for herself and enjoyed every aspect of connecting with her wolf. She understood the gift it was to be a wolf, unlike Hollis and his preoccupation with some attempt at cure. Finn lingered. I'll stay with your mate, Ellen offered. It might be best to go to your room so we don't wake up the little pup. Jessa nodded, 
hooking her arm with Ellen's and then leaning against her. Good idea. Maybe he'll sleep through it. I'll be quick, Finn nodded, practically running from the room. Do you need help? Alice trailed behind them, closing the nursery door as everyone left. You're the one with the checklist, doctor. My plans are to keep her comfortable, but I seem to remember a far more in-depth plan from you. Teasing him was a wonderful tension reliever. Be nice. Jessa squeezed her hand, coming to a stop in the hallway as another contraction rolled over her. Please, she ground out. Breathe, she whispered. It will all be worth it when you're holding your baby. A sudden lump formed in her throat, wrapped in barbed wire, making it hard to breathe. It was always there, that pain. Controlling it was sometimes a problem. He wanted to believe that the nerves and looming sense of anticipation were from this. Jess's labor was a big deal. But damn it, he and Ellen had prepared. If there was a problem, something Ellen adamantly refused to consider, they'd come up with a contingency plan for every possible complication. Together, they'd do everything in their power to make sure Jessa and the baby were safe and healthy. But the more time clicked along, the stronger the sense of foreboding became. You're doing well, Ellen praised Jessa. Maybe her behavior was part of the problem. He bit back a smile. She wasn't known for her cheery disposition or praise. She was... Ellen. Not that he hadn't seen glimpses of the woman within the hardened exterior. When she was with Oscar, she was an entirely different person. Soft, curious, smiling, almost hopeful. And this pregnancy, this baby? It mattered to her deeply. I'd like this to be over now. Jessa's words were ended on a long groan, her face going red as her entire body stiffened. Soon, Finn whispered, pressing another kiss to her forehead. His alpha shot him a tortured glance. Hollis couldn't imagine. He didn't want to. Ever. Even after he found the cure, and they were all normal humans again, without any remaining evidence of their prior violent canine-shifting existence, he knew he wasn't wired for this. Ellen nudged him. Go. Her gaze drifted to the door. Find out what's happening. Her pupils were wide, her wolf shining through. Confirmation that he wasn't losing it, but not exactly the best news considering where they were and what was happening. And that the pack was probably to the airport by now. Shit. What? The high shriek of the fire alarm split the air seconds later. Brown, the head of security, would take care of it. The man had stayed behind to watch over his daughter, Tess. Her rescue from the others was too new for the man to let her out of his sight for an extended time. Not after she'd been there captive for so long. Any time now. Brown was on top of things, but the alarm kept going. His gaze collided with Ellen's. Her wolf was raging, eager to get out. And Finn? The mix of rage and fear on his face set Hollis in motion. I'm going. His step quickened once he'd left the room. What the fuck was happening? Whatever it was, he should have clued in before now. Wilf or not, he'd picked up on something off and chose to ignore it. First things first, where was Oscar? Olivia met him in the hallway holding Oscar, looking ready and willing to shift. What's up? Calm. They had to stay calm, keep their heads until they knew what the fuck was happening. Wolves didn't do calm. Another reason he was glad he wasn't a wolf. I don't know. She bounced Oscar on her hip. Oscar and I were chilling out with Tess. Her eyes widened as she spun and hurried back to the great room. He followed, dread sinking deep in his bones. The room was empty and the alarm kept beeping. Fuck. Brown, he asked. She shook her head. Still in the control room? Bullshit. If he was, the fucking alarm wouldn't still be going off. He ran down the other hall, past the gym to the control room. No Tess, no Brown, and as far as he could smell, no fire. He punched in the code, silencing the alarm. What had triggered it? Brown? As a warning? A warning of what? His stomach twisted sharply, sweat beating on his forehead. If the others were here, they were alone. Vulnerable. Easy prey to a pack set on ripping them to pieces. Fuck. 
He punched the metal cabinet so hard it buckled before he headed back to the great room, hoping like hell the others hadn't found them. Not now. No brown. Jessa? Olivia glanced at the closed bedroom door. She's close. He ran a hand over his face. I'll find him. Tess was freaking out over Jessa. He's probably calming her down, Olivia offered. It was a logical explanation, one he immediately dismissed. Or maybe she got scared and ran, and Brown followed her, she suggested, sounding as skeptical as he felt. Finn came stomping down the hall, wild-eyed and tense. What's happening? Tess is gone. Brown isn't in the control room. She continued to bounce Oscar. Finn stiffened, bracing. Call Mal back. The look he gave Hollis turned his blood to ice. Wait, Olivia said, knowing how important their mission was. Give me five minutes to find them. No way. Mal, her mate, would have a shit fit if Finn let her go on recon alone. On a regular day, Mal's temper was a problem. When it came to Olivia, he and his wolf didn't hold back. What does your wolf say, Olivia? Finn was studying her, assessing her wolf. Ellen had been spending a lot of time with her, helping her bond with her wolf and to use the extra senses and abilities she now had. She was a natural wolf, according to Ellen. As if anything about their situation was natural. She frowned. Something's not right. Finn nodded. Call them back. Hollis headed again to the control room. He lifted the long-range walkie. Mal, come in. Hollis, what the fuck? Regret skipping this one? Mal chuckled. No point in dragging this out. Something tripped the alarm. Turn around, Mal barked, immediately followed by the squeal of brakes. Brown's take? We don't know where he is, Hollis answered. Or Tess. Jess is in labor, he continued. Did Tess know Jessa was in labor? Mal cursed, long and loudly. Hollis paused. Yes. Headed back, Mal said. Put down the blast doors, seal everything up. This is not a fucking drill. They know where we are and they are coming. Tess? Hollis mumbled. They should have known. She'd been the other's prisoner for years, been turned by them, and reuniting her with her father didn't change that. Still, she'd seemed broken too helpless to be a threat to the pack. Now, Hollis, Mal snapped. We're fucking idiots. Hollis pulled the earpiece out and scanned the wall of screens that showed the refuge from a variety of locations. Nothing out of the ordinary. Trees, birds, mountains, and a wide open sky. Nothing menacing. Yet, he lowered the blast doors, wincing when they slid into place. If Finn had sent Olivia, she was out there facing God only knows what. Hollis, Ellen's call had him running. It's time, Ellen waved him over, handing him a blanket. When the next one comes, Jessa, push. He'd seen it before. Childbirth was messy and loud. But the sound of that cry, of first breath, told the world of its latest arrival. Jessa pushed. Then the baby slipped free and into Ellen's waiting arms. And when the baby, a girl, wailed with force, Jessa began to cry. A girl, Ellen announced. He'd never heard such tenderness from her. She held that baby with awed reverence that made his chest heavy. The smile, full of anguish, joy, and haunted in a way, forced the air from his lungs. This Ellen was wounded and broken, no matter how hard she fought to prove everyone otherwise. Even now, she stiffened, pressing her eyes shut until her face was blank once more. She wrapped the infant up and handed her to Finn before facing Hollis. We should give them a minute alone. Meaning she wanted to know what was happening and didn't want to worry Jessa. He hadn't been aware of Oscar, sitting in his playpen, until Ellen scooped up the toddler and carried him from the room. Snack, Ellen said, leading the way to the kitchen. Tell me. Brown and Tess are gone. Of course they are, she spun. Olivia? I'm not sure. She wanted to go, but... Take him, Hollis. They are in trouble. We all are, her eyes blazed. The blast doors are down. Open them, now, her eyes narrowed. I'm going out. There was no arguing with her. He'd learned that shortly after her arrival. 
What are you going to do? He asked, awkwardly, bouncing Oscar. What I do best. Her gaze lingered on Oscar. Fight. Chapter 3 He can't be dead. He can't be dead. Ellen stood absolutely still, waiting, watching. No movement. No movement, nothing. And inside, she couldn't stop screaming, couldn't wrap her mind around what she saw. Pale, cold, and stiff on the ground. The wind reeked of death. Three bodies lay in the blood-soaked snow. Three bodies mangled and terrifyingly still. But only one held Ellen's attention. Byron. Byron the butcher. Byron the bastard. Motherfucking coward. Get up, she ground out, shaking her hands, fighting for control as she stalked the dark red patch of snow where he lay. If he moved, if so much as a finger twitched, her wolf would act swiftly. Even now, her wolf was pushing to get out. The urge to tear what remained of Byron's body to tiny pieces was almost beyond control. Part of her wanted that, too. Part of her wanted to run away. Far away. Where would she go? She had no place. No one and nothing. She'd be hunted by all sides. The good and the bad. Because she was neither. Peace was not in the cards for her. Time was slipping away. Dead or not, Byron had answers, and the only way to get them required touching him. Being weak was never an option, especially now. Palms clammy, heart slamming into her ribs, stomach churning, she forced herself closer to Byron's remains. Ellen? Hollis's voice, soft, his hand gently clasping her arm. She spun, her fist smashing into his nose without thought. Byron's presence put her wolf on alert. Instinct ruled. The instinct to protect and fight. At the expense of Hollis's nose. He released her, one hand covering his face. Jesus, Ellen, it's me. Of course it was. Hollis was her shadow. Always two steps behind. I forgot you were there, she murmured, offering no apology. He'd no cause to touch her. Ever. She understood his pack was too wary of her to allow her a moment's solitude. They had dangerous enemies. They should be wary, but not of her. Hollis was one of the few to believe that. Maybe that was why she didn't mind his constant presence. He accepted her as she was, even when she did foolish things like insist on running here, not waiting for reinforcement, and into what might have been a trap. Byron loved traps, setting them, waiting for them to spring, and playing with his new toy, unless his alpha had other ideas. Her gaze swept the perimeter of the meadow, looking anxious. Were there more here, waiting to attack? Waiting to drag her back. Her wolf sensed no threat. Not yet. But there was only one way to be certain. She spared a glance at Hollis, his curse muffled as he pressed a handkerchief to his bloody nose. He'd heal. Wolves healed quickly. But a broken nose wouldn't matter if Byron's pack, the others, were coming for them now. The only thing that would matter then was survival. No more standing around. Pushing aside the rising panic, she closed the gap between herself and the man who had delighted in torturing her. He is dead. Dead. Gone. No threat anymore. A gust of wind blew Byron's a shaggy mop of thick black hair, giving the illusion of movement. Her wolf whimpered. She froze, cowered, before red-hot anger took over. Bastard, she hissed between clenched teeth. Enough. No more weakness. Crouching, her bare knees numb in the biting cold snow, she shook her hands before pressing her fingers against Byron's chilled flesh. Faint sensations slid across her fingertips. Damn you, she ground out, biting into her lower lip, placing her palms flat against his body. Years of experience warned her she was too close, in striking distance, preparing her for the first blow. But her wolf demanded she stay strong. Clenched teeth, every muscle poised to run, breath shallow and uneven. Concentrate, breathe. He can't hurt us now. 
Byron was cold, stiff, gone. But it offered no relief. His death was her right, a right she'd have been robbed of. Rage rolled over her, so much she burned with it. To see him this way, throat ripped wide, a clean death, only added to the insult. Byron the Butcher hadn't deserved mercy. Focus. Information burned into her fingertips and palms, radiated along her arms and flooded her mind. Vivid images, conversations, sensory processing. Splintered, but telling. The answer she needed most was easy to find. He acted alone. The others didn't know his plan. They won't follow him, she told Hollis. Her mind was wandering, sifting through other images and sound bites, digging in places she'd best leave alone. An image of Cyrus rose up, his colorless size and humorless smile making her wolf wince and back away. Cyrus was Byron's alpha. He'd been her alpha for a time. Whatever damage Byron was capable of was child's play compared to the man. No, the monster. Cyrus doesn't know where he is, but we must burn the bodies. How do you know? Hollis's question was vague, muffled, far away. Something was there, something her wolf wouldn't let go of. She had to find it, whatever it was. Ellen? Hush, she barked at Hollis. Explanations would wait. Explanations now would only lead to more questions and answers. She wasn't ready for that. Her wolf was hunting, trapping her in Byron's head. Ellen didn't want to know how Byron had hated her, and loved her, and hated loving her, or that hurting her gave him pleasure. How he'd adored making her scream. The more she'd rejected him, the more desperate his need to hurt her. Cyrus was the only thing that stopped him from killing her. Killing her, losing her power, was an unforgivable act, and Byron hated her most for that, her power and her importance to Cyrus. But her wolf held on, searching until... No. Fuck no. Her mind shut down, but not before she'd seen... Oh, God. No. It was too much. Her wolf ran, hiding from the truth as her hands slid from Byron's body. Now was not the time to face the demons of her past. Not yet. Cyrus and his pack of others had taken everything from her. Everything. But anger. Anger was good. Rage was better. Her eyes fluttered open. Her wolf's growl spilled from her lips. But the sound was tempered with anguish. And she hated it. Hated the power Cyrus and the others still had over her. Cyrus lived. For now. Somehow. Some way. She would watch the life fade from his eyes. It was the only purpose she had left. Birdsong reached her, the Montana wind whispering through the trees. The sun was rising above the horizon, faint yellow in a pale blue sky. Life went on. No matter the pain and suffering and injustice that existed, life never stopped. No one could share in her grief for those she'd lost. But she held on to them, to remember why she fought. And holding on ensured the sharp pain of their loss would never fade. The pain was good. It kept her rage razor sharp and lethal. Her gaze fell to Byron, still cold and pale, still dead. But that didn't stop her fury. Your lucky Mal killed you. Lucky it wasn't me, she hissed, her hands fisting against Byron's chest. The air in her lungs expanded, tight, crushing, forcing her to scream. You would have paid for what you've done, you fucking bastard. You would have bled. She slapped him, the sound enraging her all the more. You took everything from me. You took her from me. A red haze clouded her vision, the roar of fury in her blood drowning everything else. Stopping wasn't an option. Her wolf didn't want her to stop. Over and over until her arms and body were shaking, she hit what remained of Byron. It wasn't enough. It would never be enough. Ellen... Hollis soothed. 
Steely arms slipped around her waist, pinning her arms at her waist and pulling her away from Byron. She struggled. His hold restraining her made things worse. He didn't know, couldn't understand. Don't touch me. She pushed out of his hold and slumped back in the snow, staring blindly around her. The connection was severed, and her endorphins crashed. Nausea set in, breathing ached, and staying upright took effort. Burying her hands in the snow eased the resulting burn, but not the feel of Byron from her skin. She stood up, swaying on her feet, rubbing her hands together, but it was still there. He was still there, clinging to her. She doubled over, throwing up until her stomach was empty, and dry heaves had her pitching forward. Hands on knees, she waited until her breathing steadied, then pushed herself upright and came eye to eye with Hollis. Green eyes, alert, searching, far too quick. He was waiting for something. Answers, most likely. He was a man of science, he said, always looking for answers. Well, he could wait. Where is the truck, she asked, glancing beyond Hollis. Her palms still burned, still tingled. Washing them would help, or scrubbing them, with bleach if necessary. Cold? He shrugged out of his carefully pressed shirt and offered it to her. She hadn't realized she was shivering. Even naked as she was now, she was rarely cold. Her wolf kept her warm, but her wolf was in shock, still reeling, still hurting. What can I do? His question was soft. As a skilled physician, brilliant at deductive reasoning and logic, could Hollis bring Byron back from the dead so she could kill him again, slowly, painfully? Even if he could, would he? Since it was a ridiculous train of thought, she kept her mouth shut and tugged on his shirt. His scent wrapped around her, offering her a warmth she'd never admit she craved. Craving, wanting, needing, weakness. Glaring seemed a perfectly acceptable response to his question. Copper brows arched, his gaze searching her face. You don't scare me. Liar, she whispered. He shouldn't look at her like that, like he cared. And to a point, he did. She was a puzzle he yearned to solve. He could try, but she wouldn't make it easy for him. Eyes narrowed, she stalked toward him, taunting. I scare you. You know I do. His concern evaporated. She smiled slowly, sweetly, enjoying the telltale tightening of his jaw. Teasing Hollis was one of the few pleasures she allowed herself. Whenever the possibility arose, she took it, like now. Right now, she needed pleasure, in whatever form available. He ran a hand through his tussled copper hair. You frustrate the hell out of me. That's not fear. Then perhaps you fear what I make you want to do, she asked. Black embraces wild side and find his wolf. He had a wolf, no matter how he denied it. Her wolf sensed his beast, inside Hollis, just beneath the surface, aching to be freed. You overestimate the effect you have on me, he countered, using his most detached tone to great advantage. Perhaps, she shrugged, her fight draining. He glanced at Byron, then back at her. What just happened? I know something happened. His bright green gaze was invasive and irritating. Are you okay? Stop asking that. I am. Enough thinking or talking about Byron. The bodies must be destroyed here. If you take them back, you risk leading the others to your sanctuary. Her gaze swept the horizon. It's too great a risk. Okay. She stared at him, then startled. No argument? You surprise me, Hollis. A frown creased his forehead. I only argue when necessary. When it comes to the safety of our pack. Your pack, she interrupted. The pack, he kept on. I won't take chances. You said the others aren't coming. Not now, but they will look for him eventually. She nodded at the corpse. Cyrus will. He was important to Cyrus to his pack. She swallowed back the rage that choked her. Cyrus appreciated the bastard's skill set, 
a skill set Ellen had endured far too often. Was he important to you? It was a simple question without any judgment. Hollis had the infuriating ability to stay rational under even the most trying of circumstances. His death was, she muttered. Countless hours had been dedicated to imagining ways to exact revenge on Byron. Each fantasy was more detailed than the last, offering a temporary balm to the aching hole in her chest. He deserved to die. Calm, assessing, clinical. Yes. Her gaze met Hollis's, unflinching, wanting him to understand, needing him to understand. But not like this. Not quickly, cleanly, drinking in fresh air on a battlefield. A hard knot lodged itself in her throat, making her next words garbled and thick. He should have suffered, alone and broken, choking on fear and begging for mercy that would not come. As she had. Hollis stepped forward, his hands hovering inches from her shoulders. Her wolf craved touch, comfort, and support. From Hollis? Yes, from Hollis. Ellen frowned and shied away. Until Cyrus was dead, she'd earned no right to comfort. The distant roar of a truck engine announced the arrival of the rest of Finn's pack. Will you tell them? It was hard to look at him then. Lying Twins Alpha was no small thing. Tell them what? Something happened, but I have no idea what. He studied her, those green eyes sweeping over her face. What can I say? She shook her head, avoiding his gaze at all costs. They were alone. The pack, for now, is safe. They need to know that. As long as we dispose of the evidence, no others are coming. Which was good. Finn's pack, Hollis's pack, had much to lose. Namely, children. Something the others had been unable to produce for more than two decades. While she belonged to neither pack, she would protect Finn's children. Her species was a proud race. Finn... Hollis and their pack honored that. That alone earned him her loyalty. Hollis was watching her again. Glad to hear it. Her nod was stiff, fighting back the drive to hunt, to fight, to run, to do something. Anything was better than standing here, knowing too much, feeling too much, with no hope of relief anytime soon. Finn and his pack had been treating her as a guest, but that didn't mean they would let her leave and she'd have to leave if she was going to defend those worthy of protection. It was time to confront her past, time to face her demons. Her gaze fell to Byron. Demon. Only one remained. Cyrus. No matter what the cost, she had to kill him. Hollis was beyond fucked up. Answers mattered to him. Information, facts, logic... Things that led to answers and understanding mattered. Protecting his pack, all of his pack mattered. And he relied on having the right answers. Ellen had them. More than he did anyway, so why was she holding out on him? She was a never-ending string of complex questions that had no clear-cut fucking answers. It was driving him crazy. As was the way she was acting this very moment. Slumped down in the rear passenger seat, Wrapped in his shirt, her forehead pressed against the truck window, oblivious to the conversation taking place in the front seat. She was quiet, calm, no sighs or sarcasm or biting comebacks. Today had shaken her, badly. And nothing shook Ellen. At least not in the time he'd known her. This was a woman who flaunted her scars, naked and unashamed, a visual fuck you to anyone who dared to look at her with sympathy or pity. It was an almost daily occurrence, one he enjoyed far too much. The woman was exasperating, but she was fierce and strong in a way he admired even if he couldn't understand. To see her like this, huddling in his clothing, almost dejected, was not only unnatural, it was distracting. Even his packmates, Mal and Dante, kept glancing back to check on her. Regardless of his medical and psychological training, he wasn't equipped to understand what she'd been through. What could he possibly do or say to offer her comfort? 
Absolutely nothing. When it came to Ellen, he was consistently out of his element. And what he'd witnessed today. It, she, defied logic. Ellen had placed her hands on Byron's corpse, and the air around her changed. Almost charged. Yes, electrified. Enough to spark. Her skin had flushed, her breathing slowed, and something happened to her. Rapid eye movements and muscle spasms, similar to deep sleep. But she'd been fully awake. Talking. Screaming words that squeezed his heart. You took everything from me. He wasn't sure he wanted to know what that meant. Still, ideas were already forming. Ellen was a fighter for a reason. A very skilled, very lethal fighter at that. You took her from me. Someone important. Someone very important. Whatever happened, her words had been a revelation. Her body jolted from the shock of it. Byron was dead, but somehow he'd told or showed her things. He knew about Byron the Butcher. Mal had spent months imprisoned, tortured by Byron at Cyrus's orders. But what had they done to her? Who was the her Ellen had mentioned? The raw pain on Ellen's face. He'd never seen pain like that. Whatever Cyrus and Byron had done to her had left a lasting impact. And Hollis didn't like it. Now that his temper had cooled somewhat, part of his brain was working through what had happened in the clearing. Obviously, it worked through touch. But what sort of connection was it? And why hadn't he known before now? One more question to add to his mile-long list of Ellen-related questions. The last three and a half months had been the most interesting, exhausting, and confusing of his life. Because of her. Still, he liked her. Without sound reason and against logic, he trusted her. She fought against his reliance on knowledge and his methodical attention to detail, but she respected his opinion and the way his mind worked. And while she insisted that magic and fate held as much weight as more concrete science, he couldn't deny their world might have room for both. Perhaps that's why they worked so well together. While their fundamental ideas were opposite, they'd been working toward a common goal keeping his alpha's mate, Jessa, and the baby she carried alive and well through pregnancy and delivery. They'd succeeded in something Hollis thought was impossible, and Ellen had never, ever doubted. Today had changed everything. Again. When or why, he didn't know. Maybe it was when they'd moved the other's bodies and she'd jumped away from Byron's touch. Maybe it was the slow easing of her posture as the other's remains disintegrated in the roaring flame. Or maybe it was before that, when she'd delivered Jess's baby, and he'd seen hope in her eyes. Hope and joy. That he'd liked. His gaze returned to Ellen. Mismatched eyes were closed. His shirt pulled tightly together. A slight flex and stretch of her hand was the only proof she wasn't sleeping. He reached for her hand without thinking. Curious. As he suspected, the skin of her palm was blistered. Did you burn yourself? Which might be a plausible explanation if she'd helped them burn the remains of the others. She hadn't. These welts and blisters were caused by whatever the hell had happened between her and Byron's corpse. She tugged her hand from his and pulled it inside the shirt out of sight. I'll get you some salve when we get back to the lodge, he offered. Not a word. Jesus, what happened? Mal asked. I can't take it. Call me an asshole or threaten to cut my nuts off again. Say something. Hollis smiled, appreciating his attempt to break the tension. Is she sleeping? Dante asked, glancing over the front passenger seat to check. Only explanation, Mal agreed. If she were asleep, she wouldn't be smiling. And she was, slightly. Dante and Mal kept up a steady stream of conversation for the rest of the drive. Mal was on a high, not the norm. But then again, he had taken out the fucker who had kept him chained to a wall and used him as a carving board. Reason enough. Dante, like Hollis, was just relieved. Today had been high stress from the get-go. Knowing that no one else was coming, they'd wiped out a small part of Cyrus's and his others. It was just that. A huge fucking relief. Even if they all knew it wouldn't last long. 
If his time with the pack had taught him anything, it was to enjoy every victory, no matter how big or small. Today had been pretty big. Killing three others, Cyrus's right-hand torture master included, was pretty big as far as he was concerned. Jess's early morning delivery of a healthy baby girl made it even better. The pack was growing, which meant more to protect, more for the others to target. It was a sobering thought. All the more reason to find answers. He missed life before Finn was turned, before Finn had turned to them, even if it had been predictable and boring. More than anything, he missed not having a pack of motherfucking monster wolves out to kill those he cared about most. That's why he was working so hard to develop a cure. If he could cure them, this would all be over. Life would be normal again, as normal as could be expected after living this way for a decade. He could spend all his time researching things that affected the world, not a small, violent group content to rip one another apart. Not that his pack wanted to rip anyone apart. The only fighting they engaged in was defensive. They'd spent the first few years hiding their secret and attempting to live normal, peaceful lives. But once Cyrus and the others knew of their existence, that became increasingly harder to do. Today's attack, with Jessa in labor, it was too convenient, too easy. He didn't want to believe someone on the inside had been waiting for just the right moment to tip off Byron. His gaze shifted to Ellen. Would she be blamed? She'd been another. Well, she'd have lived with them. That would make her a suspect. Not that it made sense. She'd put up with his pack, their questions, jeers, and cynicism for Jessa and her unborn baby. She wanted their species to survive. She'd never willingly endangered Jessa and the baby, especially at such a crucial time. No. He was certain Ellen hadn't done this, and he wanted to prove it. Somehow. But if it wasn't Ellen, who? Finn was careful about who he brought here. The refuge was a safe place for them where they could be themselves, away from society and their enemies. Only the pack, Brown, and Gentry, Finn's security team, were the only ones welcome here. As soon as they pulled into the yard, Ellen slipped from the back seat and ran into the house. She's acting weird, Dante agreed. Not that I like her bitchy sarcasm, but this, he shook his head. Guess she was friends with them. Hollis thought about her reaction to Byron's body, her fury and tension and fear. Whatever he'd been to her, it wasn't a friend. Byron wasn't the type to have friends, Mal said, staring after Ellen. Whatever, he's dead. Sort of wish you'd waited to kill him so we could have grilled him. Dante pushed open the passenger door. Next time I'll try to remember that, Mal snapped, slamming the driver door behind him. Dumbass. Dante was still laughing when he pulled open the front door of the lodge. The son of Marinera and Garlic greeted them. And Burning Wood the dull roar of conversation, followed by a terrified scream. Chapter Four Energy hummed in her veins, pure, sweet anticipation tensing her muscles. It was always like this before a fight. She hoped there would be a fight. Her wolf needed one. Bloody and violent, a challenge they could sink their teeth into. It had been too long. Byron's memories had confirmed what she'd already known, that there was a traitor under Finn's roof. And it was the poor, pathetic, wide-eyed innocent that no one, no one, would ever suspect. Tess played the victim well. And if she left it to the pack, Tess's blue eyes and pitiful act would cause doubt. Or worse, they'd think she was using Tess as a way to hide her actions. Brown, Tessa's father had served as Finn's head of security for years, hoping he'd have the chance to bring his daughter home. When he had, when he'd finally rescued her, she'd not only turned on him, but also on the pack the man considered family. Mal had stopped Byron's attack before it got out of hand, but not before Brown had been shot. Now he lay fighting for his life with his darling daughter at his bedside. And it turned Ellen's blood cold. Daughter or not, she was an other first. Cyrus would have made sure of that before sending her out on missions for him. An other that would undoubtedly try to frame her as the traitor, if Ellen didn't move swiftly. Proof or not, she would expose the traitor in Finn's pack. 
and with all the pent-up frustrations and hostilities today had stirred up, she would greatly enjoy doing so. She didn't stop to check in with Finn or Jessa, not yet. Not until she knew Brown was safe. He might have been human, but he was a good man. He understood the value of things like loyalty, family, and trust. Everything he did was for one of those reasons. The poor man had no idea what his daughter had become. If she had it her way, he never would. Getting rid of Tess was the only way to stop her from being a threat. But that was Finn's decision, as Alpha, not hers. All she could do was expose the truth, leaving no room for misinterpretation or doubt. She closed Brown's door behind her and paused. Brown's heartbeat. Though pale, there was fight in the man. She could sense it. Maybe the girl still cared for her father. Not that it mattered. She'd lost the right to sympathy and reprieve the moment she endangered Finn and his pack. No, more than that, the survival of the very species. You haven't killed him? Tess stared at her, wary, but not quite fearful. Oh, but you should be afraid. You were one of his pets, weren't you? Her voice was calm, triggering no alarm. One of his playthings. It hurt to lose his favor, didn't it? Cyrus, I mean. Tess was a pretty thing. Blonde, pale, weak in the way men seemed to find so appealing. Use the urge to protect and claim to your benefit. That's what Cyrus said. Ellen had never been any good at it. She needed no man to protect her. And if she survived killing Cyrus, she would be the one to do the claiming this time. Tess. Her smile was toothy. A hunter toying with its prey. I know what you are, and what you did. That Byron was banished for letting Mal escape, and he was desperate to earn his place back at Cyrus' side. You were going to help him with that here. Tess paled, then her voice wavered. Do they know that you're a witch? Ellen's wolf bristled, the insult causing an immediate reaction. Cyrus made sure everyone knew she was different. It was the only way to keep them away from her. It had worked. They avoided her, unless they were torturing her. She shrugged, struggling with her calm. Am I a witch? She paused, sniffing the air. The scent was familiar. Decay. Illness. Tess had been shot in the skirmish this morning, along with her poor father. The wound wasn't fatal. As a wolf, she should already be recovering. But not this time. Maybe. A witch would know you won't recover from your wounds. A witch would know it will fester and you will die, rotting. Tess pressed her hand to her stomach, her lower lip quivering. You're wrong. No, I'm not. She rolled her neck, stretching the muscles. Why do you think he kept me around, Tess? I was useful. He wanted me to cure this sickness weakening his pack. But you know that, she asked. When she angered Cyrus, he'd let the pack on her. But his warning was always the same. Don't kill her. Once, when things had gone too far, she'd almost been bled dry. Cyrus had taken great pleasure in using them as an example. Tess tensed, her gaze searching the room. Looking for a weapon? A way to defend yourself? You can't win, Tess. You will fail, as Byron failed. Her voice dropped, almost a whisper. Byron, who bled himself dry on the snow. That happens when you rip a victim's throat away. The jugular pulses, beating steadily, pushing the blood out. Causes quite a mess, really. Tess's nostrils flared, eyes narrowed, teeth bared. Ellen had hit a nerve. We'll fight. Ellen taunted, after we talk. Tess crossed her arms over her chest. You wish. I wasn't asking, Ellen smiled. One way or another, you're going to answer all my questions. Tess backed up, panic on her face. They will protect me, she pointed at the door. No matter what you say, they won't believe you over me. Ellen grabbed the girl's hand. Will they? Maybe it doesn't matter. 
She gripped one of Tessa's fingers between her thumb and forefinger. Maybe I need to tear something into pieces, she paused. You're already weak, sick, like the rest of the others. No one here would miss you. Your father is the only one who truly cares about you, and he might not survive what you did to him. Anger, regret, and finally fear registered on Tessa's face. Too little, too late. Tess had made her choice. Now she would suffer the consequences. There's nothing you could do to stop me. Nothing. Ellen snapped the finger with ease, pulling a sharp scream from the other woman. The thundering of footsteps signaled the pack's arrival. When the door hit the wall, Ellen turned, still holding Tess's hand. Hollis was first, taking in the situation with a frown. And Finn, eyes wide and ready, was breathing hard. This was her chance. Tell them the truth. You owe your father that much. Finn was Alpha. He needed to know. If Tess wasn't willing to speak up, she hoped Finn would let her do what needed to be done to pull the truth from the foolish girl. What's going on? Finn's pale blue eyes narrowed, as if assessing. Ellen? It was a warning. When Ellen ignored. Tess? Answers were all that mattered. Then Finn would understand. They all would. Tess sniffed. Her chin quivered. Poor and pathetic. Cyrus had trained her well. Ellen's patience evaporated. There are nine more, she offered. No, wait. Hollis, ask Gentry for his silver knives. She glanced at Hollis, hoping he would follow her lead. My weapon of choice. Cyrus and Byron taught you to ensnare and trap. They taught me how to shield and disable. It takes skill to draw out the suffering without too much blood loss. What point is there in proper torture if your captive loses consciousness? She smiled. Is that necessary? Hollis asked. She nodded, staring at Finn, needing him to listen. Finn's nod was slight, but enough. Tess, is there something you'd like to tell us? Tess burst into tears. Enough, Ellen snapped. Where are the tears for your father? He has loved you, looked for you, never gave you up. And you do this to him? She pointed at Brown, still and silent on his bed. Finn and his pack welcomed you into their home, and still you led Byron here knowing what he wanted. She paused. Look at your father, Tess. Look at him. Will you cry if he doesn't wake up? He is strong. He is human, Ellen reminded her. Humans are more breakable, more vulnerable. They die from things like being shot. And if he dies, you are to blame. Know that. She shook her head. Just as you are dying, too. It started the day Cyrus turned you. Your time is close, Tess, so choose to die with honor. Tell them the truth. Your version of the truth. Tess stared at her with pure hatred. You're trying to scare me. Ellen ignored her, and the flare of pity she felt. Tess was another, conditioned to be at Cyrus's beck and call. What she'd done today had put them all in jeopardy. She had to remember that. Remember Tess deserved no sympathy. What happened, Tess? Finn asked. Tess sniffed, wiping her nose with the back of her hand. She was so young, pretty even, but she'd been tainted by her time with the others. Tessa's pale gaze locked with Finn's, then fell, her cheeks flaming red. He wasn't supposed to follow me, Tess whispered. He was supposed to stay here. Byron said he'd be safe. Safe? Anger rolled off of Finn. You honestly think your father would stand by and let Byron take my family? Or you? Jesus Christ, Tess. I know you've been with those motherfuckers for a long time, but come on. He shook his head, his eyes flashing. Byron would have killed everyone who stood in his way, including you. Tess sobbed then, shaking her head. He loved me. He would never. Love? You were his mate? Ellen asked, wishing she could pity the woman. Tess sniffed, anger flashing in her eyes. No. Her gaze darted between Hollis and Finn. 
but he'd said we were meant to be. You're more stupid than I thought if you believe that. Did it make it easier to betray them, thinking he'd make you his mate? Ellen stood back, her grip tightening on Tessa's hand. You were an other long enough to know the pack. You know what they would do with the children. And Jessa? The woman who's been so kind to you? Think of what they would do to her. She glanced at the door, hoping Jessa wasn't among them. In bed, Hollis assured her. Tell them, Ellen prodded. Tess shook her head. No, she frowned. The children would have been studied, possibly dissected for their blood. Cyrus wants the cure. She stepped closer, their faces inches apart. And Jessa? If he can't cure the sickness, he'll breed new wolves. But he'll never get her pregnant, I can assure you. And once he knows that, he'd give her to the pack. You've seen what they do, Tess, how the women scream and fight. Not that it helps. No, it only adds to the pack's excitement. Tess kept shaking her head, tears streaming down her face. They wouldn't. Why not? She asked. Because Byron told you he wouldn't? Byron isn't the Alpha, is he? Tess stared at the floor, her hands clenched at her sides. You believe what you want to believe, Tess, to ease your guilt. What happens to Jessa when she's no longer of any use? She growled, her wolf longing to tear free. And so would you, if you go back. A fate you have earned. She and Finn's children, this pack, your father. If Cyrus has his way, none of them would survive. Ellen waited, willing to let Finn take over. But one look at the Alpha told her he was battling for control. Let her go. She wants them, deserves them. She straightened, meeting Finn's gaze. Let me take her back to the others. She can die at their hands, or slowly, painfully, from their sickness. Either way, she has no concern of yours, or a threat to your pack. Hold on, Hollis finally spoke, his words harsh. No one is going back. Not yet, Finn's command rolled over her. Oddly, her wolf listened. She, however, refused. I am not your pack. Her fight wasn't with Finn or his pack, but she wasn't about to let him, anyone, force her into anything. No, you're not. But you're not another. Finn shook his head, his irritation coloring each word. Right now, all I can think about is tearing her head off. He looked at Tess with pure rage. No one is going anywhere or doing a damn thing until we all calm the fuck down. He cleared his throat. How did you do it? Communicate with them. Tess bit her lower lip, uncertain. He's dead now. Then it shouldn't matter, Ellen bit back, her blood reaching a higher temperature. Who? Who else? Tess pressed her lips together. I'll get the silver knives, Hollis offered. Fine. Finn sounded off, crossing his arms over his chest. Hollis headed from the room, looking grim. Ellen pushed Tess into the corner before tearing the room apart. The room was mostly bare. Only her bed, her father's bed, and a small bookcase. She tipped the bookcase, flipping through each novel, running her hands along the lip of each shelf, then turning the whole thing upside down. Nothing. One glance at Tess told her the woman was keeping her vow of silence. Ellen attacked the bed with a vengeance. The mattress, the sheets, feathers rained down all over the bedroom floor. Hollis returned and joined in, standing the box springs up and shaking it. Something's inside. He felt along the seams, found a clean cut hidden by the fabric piping, and shoved his hand inside. He pulled out a slim cell phone. Who else? Ellen asked. Whoever it was, Byron didn't know. She'd been keeping secrets. No one, she muttered. Then why not just tell us about the phone? Finn's tone revealed he was rapidly losing his patience. I don't have time for your fucking games, Tess. No one, she glared at him. I kept it, in case he told someone where I was, in case they tried to rescue me. Rescue you, Hollis repeated. She doesn't know any better. She almost felt sorry for her then. 
Almost. I know who my pack is. I know what loyalty means, Tess argued. You have nothing. Nothing. Her face grew a mottled red. There was a ring of truth to her words. Ellen had nothing. I have nothing to lose. Her smile was back, a hard, evil smile full of threat. There's more, isn't there? What else was Cyrus after? If Byron was trying to earn his way back into Cyrus's good graces, he would have told her everything. Finn unrolled Gentry's knapsack. As an ex-special ops team, Gentry was the only human Ellen understood. The man enjoyed danger, risks, working for the pack. He was, Hollis said, an adrenaline junkie. He got to shoot at bad guys and carry all the latest fancy weapons, which meant the knives would be silver and offer a variety of uses. Namely, extracting information from an unwilling wolf. You wouldn't, Tess whispered, staring at Finn in shock. He won't, Ellen agreed. I will. Answer me. Tess cleared her throat, glancing nervously around the room. The bone. Ellen glanced at Hollis and Finn. And you, Tess added, her eyes narrowing. He wants you back, Ellen. He has special plans for you. Ellen smiled at her. I know he does. And only she knew the reason why. Do I use these? She asked, sliding a knife from the leather strap. No matter what you do to me, you can't stop him. Tess pressed herself into the corner of the room, looking around wildly. I look forward to proving you wrong, Finn said. For now, we're done. You're no longer a guest here, Tess. You're a prisoner. Until I figure out what to do with you, you'll stay locked in the storage closet next door. Get it stripped down, he said to Alice. Have Gentry and Mal work out guard rotations. His pale gaze was hard. Otherwise, she's to be escorted at all times. Tessa's threat hung in the air, forcing her from the room. The roll of knives clutched tightly against her chest. Armed or not, she couldn't hide from Tessa's horrible words. Her wolf was restless, pacing inside, anxious, trapped, and there was no way out. She paused in the kitchen, the scent of dinner holding no interest. Not hungry? Hollis asked, nudging her. Good call. On Tess. She'd done the right thing. Nothing more. Still, hearing the warmth in his voice was pleasing. When their gazes locked, the most delectable heat traveled down her spine to pull deep inside. Hungry? At that moment, her wolf would happily have Hollis for dessert. Life rolled off of him, vitality and strength and raw masculine energy stirring something deep inside of her. She was so used to seeing him in slacks and oxfords, an oxford she was currently enjoying, that his tight cotton undershirt was distracting. In the best way. Every muscle was hugged, showcasing just how capable and masculine he was. She couldn't fight the anticipation she had no right to. His puzzled grin unleashed a sudden, fierce throb between her legs. Starving, she managed. It seemed her wolf had come up with another way to soothe their frustration, and it involved Hollis. It had been so long since she'd craved the touch of a man, but the image of Hollis's hands on her body was oh so tempting. A temptation she could never give in to. Hollis kept his mouth shut through dinner. He didn't consider himself an exceptionally intuitive person, but even he was aware of the awkward tension saturating the air. It had something to do with Mal, nothing new there, and his mate, Olivia. Apparently the oversexed lovebirds were having a spat, and the whole pack had to be a part of it. More spaghetti? Anders, the pack's resident cook and funny man, shoved the mountain of pasta at Mal, who ignored him. As much as he disliked being drawn into other people's business, he felt for Olivia. She was new to this. Her life before becoming a wolf had been fairly sheltered. But once she'd been turned, everything she thought she knew was a lie. And Mal, her mate, was an ass. Their bond was still being forged. Mal had killed Byron today to save Olivia, an event that had obviously scared the shit out of them both. Mal stared at Olivia. Olivia, ramrod stiff and pale, stared at her food. 
Yeah, they weren't dealing well with the day's events, but damn it, it was over. He was tired and hungry and irritated that this was somehow his problem. A man should be able to eat in peace without feeling like he was sitting on a powder keg, especially after the day they'd all had. He wanted his spaghetti and beer and no more goddamn drama, which was going to be downright impossible because Olivia was crying. At the table, in front of everyone. Shit. Olivia? Anders patted her back. You okay? She sniffed and nodded, which was a blatant lie. If she were okay, she wouldn't be sobbing into her dinner. He liked Olivia, even if she did have questionable choices in her mate. A maid who was sitting there, doing nothing while she cried. He sighed, glancing Finn's way, then Ellen's, desperate for someone to help her. Does she look okay? Ellen asked. No, Anders answered, panicked. Killing someone is hard, Ellen answered, especially the first time. Hollis glanced at Olivia then, truly sympathetic. Killing for Olivia would be hard every time. She wasn't made for it. She should never have had to do it. She and Jessa were gentle. Y yes, Olivia sniffed, hesitating before adding, it is, but I'm fine. She was amazing. Dante attempted a compliment. As soon as that gun went off, she was on him. Saved Mal's ass. I'm fine, she repeated. If Hollis had needed evidence that Olivia wasn't fine, that was it. His gaze crashed into Ellen, but she shook her head, nodding pointedly at Mal. She was right. Mal could fix this. He needed to. The sooner the better. Leave her alone. Mal's growl silenced the room. I don't need you to talk for me. At least she wasn't crying anymore. Anger coated every word. He sat back, watching the couple with interest. The whole bond pairing thing was still a fairly new occurrence for their pack. He'd yet to truly study the dynamics of a mated pair. Since there seemed to be no way of avoiding their altercation, this was as good a time as any to start. Mao's eyes narrowed. But Olivia didn't back down. Or make decisions for me, or lie to me, or or leave me when you swore you promised you never would. I'm fine. Score one for Olivia. Mal was a fuck-up. They all knew it. Sadly, Olivia was just figuring it out. All eyes swung to Mal. The energy in the room charged. He wasn't the only one watching with interest. Mal was floundering, squirming under the microscope. It was awesome. Olivia, Mal said in a low voice, awkward and tight. Let's go talk somewhere private. Olivia shook her head. I don't think being alone with you is a good idea. Hollis grinned. The idea of Olivia unleashing her wrath on Mal was sort of comical. Mal radiated threat. Anders' chuckle turned into a smothered cough. You're mad, Mal ground out. Hollis almost laughed this time. Olivia stared at her mate, stunned. That is one of the many emotions I'm experiencing. Mal's nostrils flared. My day hasn't been a fucking picnic either. No, her voice shook. Hollis had never seen Mal like this. Raw and vulnerable. He didn't understand it. Olivia was a wolf. She was naive and a little too trusting, but according to Ellen, she was a very capable, very lethal wolf. If Mal doubted that, why had he fucking turned her? It had to be the whole mate thing, something he hoped he never understood. If somehow he fell victim to a mate, he'd make damn sure the rest of the pack didn't know about every bump or snag in their relationship. No. The word erupted from Mal, grabbing the attention of every person in the room. Once I knew you were in danger, I couldn't get back here fast enough. Mal pushed out of his chair and stalked around to the table. I didn't give a shit about anything but you, and it scared the shit out of me. Be pissed. Yell at me. Do whatever you need to do, but don't expect me to let you out of my sight again. He leaned forward, his hands gripping the chair. I can't go through that again. That should do it. Now everyone could get back to eating. 
A ragged sob slipped from Olivia. Or not, Hollis sighed, holding in his breath. No more speeches or declarations, please. He'd met his quota for emotional duress before noon, and his patience not too long after. Thankfully, Mal had always been an action man, something Hollis was incredibly grateful of at that moment. Mal scooped Olivia up and carried her from the dining room, the distant slam of their bedroom door effectively ending the evening's drama. He hoped. At least it was over. Hollis spun a healthy heaping of spaghetti onto his fork. Maybe I don't want to meet, Anders murmured, returning to his meal with gusto. Exactly. Hollis swallowed down his pasta and went back for more. Finn laughed. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And that was the part that troubled Hollis. He'd already lost his free will when Finn turned him. If Finn ever played the alpha card, Hollis had no choice. But not choosing the person he'd spent his life with? Having some uncontrollable urge picked for him? It bothered the hell out of him. Not like there are a lot of choices, Anders said, his gaze bouncing around the table. He paused when he reached Ellen. Ellen, who was staring at him. I mean, no offense, Ellen, but none taken. Ellen said, swirling her fork in her spaghetti. I fear you wouldn't survive. Her eyes narrowed slightly, every bit the predator assessing her prey. Hollis smiled. Anders chuckled. Besides, now that the baby's here, she'll be leaving. Not exactly mate material, Dante said, his eyes on his plate. Ellen glanced at him then, her mismatched gaze holding his for an instant. Finn said that wasn't going to happen. Not yet. But Ellen was stubborn. She wouldn't give up. Try as he might, he couldn't imagine the pack without her. But keeping her here wouldn't be easy. Finding a mate here would take care of that. He swallowed, set his fork on his plate and glanced at Anders, then Dante. Either choice was a recipe for disaster. Then again, both Mal's and Finn's restlessness had been tempered when they found their mates. Not that he could imagine the same happening to Ellen. What sort of mate would she be? Hollis had spent the last ten years watching them all shift. His heart murmur was a blessing and a curse. Not being able to shift took some pressure off, but sitting back while his family faced danger over and over while he was left in his human form and a liability in action sucked. He stayed in shape, working out tirelessly to keep his body in peak condition. And weapons? Gentry put him through his paces. Sometimes he'd drag his ass out of bed at three in the morning just to test him. Knives, guns, explosives, staying light on his feet and senses sharp. That was all he could do, so he did it. But he still couldn't shift. Ten years of being infected, but never shifting. Or meeting his wolf, if he had one. Jessa sleeping? Hollis asked, eager to shift gears. Finn nodded, glancing at the door. Kids, too. How does it feel, man? Married and two kids. And, you know, the whole alpha thing. Anders shook his head. Talk about responsibility. Finn didn't seem to mind. He looked happy. Even knowing there was a pack of bloodthirsty fuckers eager to hunt them down, Finn was happy. It agrees with you, Ellen said, biting off a hunk of garlic bread. How a man bears his responsibility reveals his potential for leadership. Finn sat back. I'm pretty sure that was a compliment. His pale blue eyes regarded Ellen. Hollis bristled. It won't happen again. Her finely arched brows rose, the intricate tattoo framing the corner of her eye raising, too. Hollis couldn't hold back his smile. She was fearless. I'm too tired to think of a good comeback to that. Finn shook his head. I'm gonna crash before someone wakes up. Let me know when Jess is up. I'd like to assess her and the baby, he said. Will do, Finn nodded, carrying his plate to the kitchen, then disappeared down the other end of the hall. Ellen stood unfolding herself from her chair and moving silently across the floor. Three pairs of eyes followed her. She was mesmerizing to watch. The illusion of femininity. Graceful, agile, and lethal in a way that both terrified and impressed him. Up for some pool? Anders asked her. His attempts to teach Ellen had ended with her breaking two pool sticks, one over Anders' head. 
Can't give Anders props for his determination. Ellen shook her head. Boger? Anders asked. She shook her head again. I need to hit something. Alice is free, Dante muttered, making both he and Anders laugh out loud. Ellen was smiling when she looked his way. Are you? She asked. I promise not to hit too hard. The spark in her gaze should have warned him away. She was agitated and restless. A dangerous combination. No, Ellen asked. I didn't think so. She could goad all she wanted. He wouldn't take the bait. Her smile grew. Damn it. He stood, carrying his plate into the kitchen. We can work out. I'll change and meet you in the gym. Ellen was laughing when she left the kitchen. What the fuck, man? Dante asked. You know she doesn't fight fair. We were working out, not fighting, he answered. Right, they snorted in unison. He ignored the back and forth between Anders and Dante. He didn't know why the hell he had just agreed to this. Maybe it was the taunt in her eyes daring him. Maybe he was just as wound up as she was. Maybe he enjoyed her company. Maybe he was an idiot. Chapter 5 The gym was 80 degrees. Ellen wasn't a fan, but the pack liked sweating it out. A phrase she had yet to understand. There was so much she still didn't understand about this pack. Namely, why they acted like being a wolf was wrong. It was a gift, not a curse, and they'd be that much more powerful when they realized it. That Hollis thought he could cure them was infuriating. She rolled her neck, stretched her arms over her head, and bent low to touch her toes. The tug and burn of her muscles felt good. So did slamming her fists into the punching bag that hung from the ceiling. It wasn't the same as a striking flesh. No, hitting a body was different. The impact absorption was all wrong, but it would have to do. For now. Over and over, she kept up a steady rhythm until her blood hummed and her skin warmed. Don't need me after all, Hollis said from behind her. She wiped the sweat from her forehead with the back of her hand and turned to face him. That was her first mistake. Hollis, pressed and starched and buttoned up, was the norm. Today had been anything but normal. First the white undershirt, now this. His gray wicking t-shirt stretched to accommodate the impressive expanse of his chest and arms. His thighs, equally impressive, were hidden beneath long black running pants. Even his athletic shoes were appealing. Not appealing. Sexy. Logically, she knew her reaction had nothing to do with Hollis. No. He was simply the catalyst for the frustration and unspent aggression piling up from the course of the day. But that didn't do much to ease the very real thrum and throb of building within her. He waited, arms crossed over his chest for her answer. I can find a use for you, she murmured, swallowing down the lump in her throat. Her mind was imagining all sorts of uses. A slight furrow formed between his copper brows. Such as? She bit hard into her lip. So many words threatened to spill out. Warm up first? He argued he had no wolf, but Ellen sensed its presence, just beneath the surface. His wolf needed an outlet. This should work for both of them. Up for sparring? You've promised not to kill me? His smile. Oh, his smile. I'll make no such promise. She turned back to the punching bag so he didn't realize she was staring. Her knuckles throbbed from the power she packed into her punch. She would not be ruled by her basic instincts. If Cyrus had taught her nothing else, he'd taught her control. No matter what he'd done to her, how he'd tormented her, she'd learned to box up her reactions. And now, when her mind was buzzing with rather disturbing and arousing images of Hollis, there was so much to box up. Mal and Olivia, Hollis said. That normal? She gritted her teeth. Only if one partner is an ass. And yet, watching Mal come apart in front of his pack had made him infinitely more understandable. He had been through hell at the hands of the others. That was why he was so protective of Olivia. He couldn't bear thinking about what they'd do if they ever captured her. He is, Hollis agreed, but he is loyal. She nodded. A good trait for a wolf. She pounded the bag again, rapid jabs and punches. 
their offspring will be well-balanced, insightful, and fierce. Offspring, Hollis groaned. Malice is still buying condoms in bulk. Ellen laughed. <laughs> Good. True mates should take the time to learn how to truly please each other. A flash of Hollis, nostrils flared and jaw locked in passion, flashed through her mind. Disagreements are often forgotten when you've a partner who makes you scream out your release. Hollis's muffled curse drew her gaze his way. What? she asked, draping an arm around the bag for support. His green eyes flashed. Nothing. Then let's get started. She pushed off the bag and walked toward him. His jaw tensed. I've never hit a woman. He shook his head. Don't think of me as a woman, she argued. He snorted. Impossible. Interesting. She paused, hands on hips. Why? His gazes swept from her head to bare toes. I'm not blind. His confession only stoked the sensations she was struggling to hide. That's what you see when you look at me? His green eyes locked with hers. A woman? He swallowed. Yes, that's what I see. If she listened, she could hear the erratic thump of his heart. His pulse galloped along, the beat visible in his throat. Apparently, he wasn't as immune to her as he pretended to be. Her wolf was delighted. Stupid animal. Think of me as a worthy opponent instead. I know you're a worthy opponent. I know you want to kick my ass, he sighed. But I can't fight back. The spark in his eyes was a serious threat to her calm. Even if he was attracted to her, he'd never do a thing about it. Which was good. And insanely frustrating. Fine. She spun away from him, collecting the sparring mitts from the rack on the wall and tossing them his way. Don't complain if any bones are broken. When he shook his head, his disheveled auburn hair bounced, playful and young. And his grin, one corner cocking up as he tugged on the mitts, only added to the whole boyish charm. But his rock-hard, cut body said otherwise. I don't complain. Is that a challenge? she asked, barely waiting for him to get the other mitt on before landing a solid blow in his right palm. No, he laughed, shaking his hand. Hell no. She ignored him, focusing on her footwork, the angle of her strikes, the strength of her core. The flex of his jaw was not distracting, neither was the soft grunt he made when she landed a powerhouse hit. She tried not to notice the slight narrowing of his green gaze, the flared nostrils, and his bewitching scent of sweat and man. Her fist sailed past the sparring mitt and into his gorgeous clenched jaw. Fuck, he snapped, glaring at her. You moved, she lied. I didn't realize you wanted me to stand still. He was angry. Let him be angry. You were distracting me. Her fist slammed into the sparring mitt, a quick one-two combo raining down so fast he stepped back. By breathing, he asked. There was no way to answer that, not honestly. Being distracted by Hollis, simply being wasn't something she was willing to share with him. That's the second time you've punched me in the face today, he grumbled. You said you didn't complain. Her laugh was breathy. I'm stating facts, not complaining. I'll aim for another part next time. Your side? She faked her next throw. Stomach, perhaps. I'm betting it's hard for you to keep sparring partners, he shook his head. She burst out laughing, too surprised to stop herself. He shook off the mitts, wiped his hands on a towel, and headed for the weight machine. We're done? she asked, still laughing. I am, he ground out, already adjusting the machine. Spoil sport? Any other insult died a quick death the moment Hollis flexed. There wasn't a single thing she could do about the staring now. The corded muscles, rippling and flexing beneath the weight, were truly a thing of beauty. That this Hollis was the same man she'd spent so many hours alongside was hard to reconcile. What? he asked, misinterpreting her open gawking. Am I doing it wrong? She shook her head, momentarily speechless. He stopped, his irritation giving away to something else. Their gazes locked long enough for his to burn. He stood, his hands clenched at his sides, before muffling an angry curse and heading into the shower room. Every inch of her tightened with want. Ellen stood, panting, conflicted. 
Her wolf wanted her to go after him. Her wolf's craving for Hollis was growing more concerning by the minute. She followed him because she needed a shower. It had nothing to do with the hot and intense ache pulsing between her legs. It wasn't her fault that the large communal shower was built when the pack was all men, offering up no privacy or room for modesty. Not that it mattered. He'd seen her naked countless times. She, however, had never seen him naked. And tonight, her wolf wanted to go to bed with something pleasing to occupy her mind. Maybe, for once, her dreams would be an escape versus a hellish trap of pain and torment. Hollis stood beneath the cold water, eyes closed, arms bracing him against the tile wall. His body was in overdrive. Correction, his dick was in overdrive. There'd been no misunderstanding the look in Ellen's eyes. None but he wasn't stupid enough to think it had a damn thing to do with him. He was a fucking doctor. Trauma, turmoil, shock, grief. The body often sought an outlet, and he didn't mind being her outlet, which was a huge fucking problem. He rolled the bar of soap between his hands and stared down at his hard-on. She got to him. One soaked hand slid over his chest and down his stomach, his breath hitching as he moved lower. If he closed his eyes, she was there, with that grin, that wicked and taunting grin. Fuck. He stroked his erection, firm, slow, his breath powering out of his chest. This was chemical, basic instinctual. Space. Lots of space. That's what they both needed. Then he'd be less preoccupied by the tattoo at the corner of her eye, or the way the arch of her brow spoke volumes or the fact that she never wore a bra, and her nipples, well, he damn well noticed them. Being confined in close quarters when emotions and stress were high was bound to distort their connection. That's all this was. It didn't stop an image from her, naked and smiling, to appear. He groaned. Another stroke. Are you done with that? Ellen's voice. The bar of soap slipped out of his hand. What the hell are you doing here? I think it's obvious, her brows rose. This is a shower, isn't it? He frowned. There's a shower in every bedroom of this house. Why are you using this one? Why are you? Wide-eyed and feigning innocence, she leaned her head under the stream of water. Rivulets formed along the sides of her face, streaming along her neck and along the delicate ridge of her clavicle, then lower. Damn it. He forced his gaze away from the path the water was taking. Shit. He'd seen her naked countless times, but not like this. Not when she'd looked at him with such hunger. Primal. Raw. Gorgeous. Now, with her close and wet, his baser instincts were definitely in the driver's seat. That's why he had a massive heart on, something Ellen was just discovering. Gripped in his hand. I'm interrupting something, she asked, her gaze fixed on his dick. She'd asked something. Interrupting something? But the tip of her tongue, skimming along her lower lip, had temporarily disconnected his brain. There are drawbacks to being alone. Shared pleasure is always more satisfying than taking care of oneself. She stooped to pick up the soap, but her eyes never left his erection. When she bent over, his dick throbbed. Your body is a most impressive surprise. Another throb. Hollis, she stood, her gaze finally returning to his face. She expected him to answer her? To function? Now? What the fuck do you expect me to say? He growled, startling them both. Her grin was pure mischief. Thank you, she shrugged. I hadn't expected you to be so well endowed. But you are, another throb. Stop. Why, she asked softly. Most men like flattery. I'm not most men, he scowled at her. Her eyes fell to his rock-hard dick. No, I see that now. Not at all. She was teasing him and loving every minute of it. But she was the one who had looked at him with hunger in her eyes. She was the one who followed him in here. Why? What do you want, Ellen? He ran a hand over his face. Right now? She pretended to think about it before saying, 
I want to help you finish what you started. Fucking hell, he ground out. I didn't start a goddamn thing. I was taking a shower. Period. You were... washing yourself? Her brow rose. Even if I did believe that, you're clearly in need of some attention. She lathered up her hands. He watched, staring at her hands, torn between arguing and accepting. But then she washed her arms and chest, her teeth worrying her lower lip and making him growl out, Shit. Is that a yes? she asked. He stood his ground, refusing to back down. She was teasing him, tormenting him. It's what she did. Normally, they weren't both naked, and he didn't have a hard on. I can take care of myself. Can you? Let me see. She crossed her arms, making her already taut nipples jut forward. Go on. Now? he asked, thrown. Yes, now. Clearly, she pointed at him. From the way you are reacting, I'd say right now. Her gaze, her words. She might as well be touching him. She wasn't. She shouldn't. They both knew that. You are tense, Hollis. Perhaps you're not taking care of yourself often enough. Her soaked hands moved over her breasts in slow, leisurely circles. Fuck, he ground out, planting a hand against the tile wall to steady himself and staring up at the ceiling. He wasn't prepared for this game, and he sure as hell didn't want to play. You're crossing a line, Ellen. Either you leave, or I will. Like that, she sighed. What will the rest of the pack think? He glared at her. You're bored, restless, whatever the hell this is. But I won't let you fuck me over for your entertainment. I'm fairly certain I wouldn't be the only one enjoying things, she finished, her fingers working over her nipples. He stared. Damn it. What else could he do? She had no intention of touching him. This was about control. She needed to feel in control. But there was a hint of desperation about her. A momentary flash of vulnerability in those disarming eyes of hers. It was enough to deflate his temper. Today had been hell. The look on her face when she'd seen Byron had been laden with torment, anger, and fear. She was hurting, lashing out. And he was here. He was here, and no one else was. He had the pack, his family, and she had no one. A wave of empathy crashed over him and wiped out all else. I'm sure I would, but it's not what you need. He didn't think as he drew her against him. The press of her silky soft skin against his chest almost challenged his good intentions. Almost. For a second, she yielded to his hold, and he was lost. Everything was off, but in a good way. Having her pressed against him filled him with hunger, yes, but there was something more. The need to protect and comfort her. Things she would dismiss with a laugh and a wave of her hand. Her hands, sandwiched between them, pushed against him. Gone was the soft and willing woman. I don't need comforting, Hollis. Comfort is a false promise. What I need is distraction. Something to ease the heat in my blood. She stared up at him as her hands explored his arms and shoulders but he was still trying to make sense of whatever had happened the few seconds she'd relaxed in his hold. He'd been aware of something hovering in the periphery of his subconscious, some fleeting sense of belonging. Pinning it down was impossible. Her scent tugged him back to the here and now. The stroke of her fingers along his hips set off warning bells. It was his fault. He'd pulled her close, putting them both in harm's way. Her arousal the flush of her skin, the rigid tips of her fantastic breasts brushing against his chest. It took everything he had not to give in, not to press her against the wall, wrap her legs around his hips and bury himself deep. He groaned at the thought, gripping her wrists and holding her hands still, away from him. Hollis? Anders' voice drifted in. You in there? Anders' voice was a hell of a lot more effective at snapping him out of it than the cold shower he'd been attempting to take. With a stern look at Ellen, he released her, grabbed a towel from the hook, and marched from the shower room into the gym. You said you wanted to check on Jess and the baby when they woke up. Anders waved him forward. 
They're awake. Hollis ran a hand through his wet hair. I'll be there as soon as I get dressed. He glanced back at the shower room, but thought better of it. Once Anders left, so would his resistance. He'd never been so helpless beneath someone's touch, so hungry for more. The smartest thing to do was stay away from her. Today had put everyone on high alert, multiplying every sensory experience and reaction. Tomorrow would be different, a return to sanity. Until he'd found his self-control, he'd do his best to stay away from Ellen. Chapter 6 Hollis watched the interplay between his packmates, his cell phone to his ear. While they were swapping jokes and laughing, he was trying to get work done. Important work. He cleared his throat, again, hoping they'd take the hint and leave the room. Did you get the attachment? His assistant, Kim Su, asked. Anders punched Dante in the shoulder. Dante pushed Anders off the arm of the chair, sending him onto the floor. Hollis sighed. I did. I wasn't expecting the numbers to be this good. He scrolled through the spreadsheet, highlighting cells with the highest numbers. Great work. Kim laughed. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Robbins. If I've been sparing on the praise, I apologize. He clicked through the other attachments. Sparing on the praise? Anders asked from his place on the floor. Who the hell talks like that? Dante and Mal laughed. Thankfully, Kim didn't seem to hear them. The paycheck makes up for it. Please email or IM me if you want to go over any of the data or have questions, she said. Will do. He hung up and sat back. You guys are a pain in the ass, you know that? Yep, Mal agreed, tossing a wadded up piece of paper at him. What are you working on? Finn asked, working on his laptop across the table from him. Stem cells. I'm beginning to think they might save the world. He shook his head. You? Sending all the information we've collected on the trafficking ring to Gentry's man in the FBI? Finn ran a hand over his face and yawned. Hollis frowned. The other's involvement in sex trafficking had been one more black mark against the pack. Werewolf or not, they could choose to be good. Finn had. Their pack was. They had incredible strength and heightened senses, but for the most part they were still decent people trying to do good things. The others didn't seem to understand that concept. Kidnapping, trafficking, murder. Cyrus and his pack weren't discriminating. If it got them what they wanted, they did it. Now that Finn's pack knew that, they were doing what they could to stop him, like preventing his trade of women to the highest bidder. Gentry? Our gun-loving, shoot-em-up explosives guy? Mal was skeptical. You mean he's good for more than destruction? Anders asked, leaning over Finn's shoulder. Wait, Gentry has someone on the inside at the FBI? Dante asked. I thought the FBI was the best of the best. How the hell did that happen? Anders laughed. He's smart, very smart, Finn sighed. He was recruited by the FBI, but went special forces instead. We're damn lucky to have him on our side. Hollis nodded. He didn't always get their weapons expert's sense of humor, but he'd proven his loyalty time and again. Considering the others vastly outnumbered them, they could use all the support they could get. What's left, Mal asked, sprawled in the chair at the end of the table. California is pretty locked up. The Texas border is still an issue, but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Cyrus, Finn sighed, running a hand over his head. Cyrus and the others are done in Chicago, period. They're on every watch list out there. No shit, Mal asked. No shit, Finn nodded. Finn and the pack had learned about the other's human trafficking dealings when Mal had been their prisoner. He'd been kept in a cage, repeatedly skinned and tortured until he was able to break out, with a fellow captive in tow, Olivia. It was her brother who helped Cyrus with the girls, her brother who had left her to be taken by the others, and her brother who Mal wanted to kill. But for Olivia, he'd restrained himself. Can you arrest a werewolf? Anders asked. Everyone looked at him. Are you seriously asking? Dante asked. If a wolf is foolish enough to be caught and arrested, it's possible. Ellen chose that moment to walk into the room. Hollis forced his attention back to his laptop. Since their encounter in the shower, he'd been more aware of her. So it is Dick. 
which could be problematic to say the least. She, on the other hand, treated him exactly the same. But they'd have to be kept collared with silver to keep them weak and prevent them from shifting. She stretched, moving with her normal predatory grace that warned a person away, but was oddly impossible to resist. Especially when she stretched her arms behind her back, pulling the thin cotton of her tank top tight across her full breasts. Shit. No bra. Of course not. Not Ellen. He knew how she felt. How deceptively soft she was in his hands. The last few nights he'd dreamed of little else. Hollis cleared his throat, flexed his hand, and stared at the spreadsheets, the numbers blurring before his eyes. Cyrus did that? Finn asked. Regularly, she nodded. He was researching injections that contained slight traces of silver to keep a wolf weakened. Everyone he tried it on died while I was there, but he believed it would be successful. She bit into an apple, the crunch drawing his gaze back to her. A drop of juice hung from the corner of her mouth. His chest compressed, a hollow, aching heat taking up residence deep inside. Jesus, Dante shook his head. He's one sick fuck. You're just now figuring that out? Mal asked. Dante glared at her. And do you want to go back to that? Ellen glared right back. No, she didn't want to go back. He knew that much. It was more than that. Not that she was going to tell him about it. I have unsettled the business with him. Speaking of business, if Cyrus keeps turning people, might be a new industry. Like a how-to-be-a-good-wolf training camp, you know? Once he's dead and all, Anders picked up. Your brain is a mystery, Dante muttered, shaking his head. But Hollis kept watching her. The slow ease of her posture as she regarded each member of the pack. Her expression remained closed, until her eyes met his. For a brief moment, their gazes locked, long enough to make it hard to breathe, let alone think. Then her gaze fell away from his, but still he couldn't look away. Dentry's contacts know what they're dealing with? Mal asked. Finn nodded. As much as you can know before you come face to face with them. Ellen was staring at the apple in her hands, turning the red fruit with unsteady fingers. When you killed Byron, her mismatched eyes homed in on Mal. Mal nodded, his dark gaze meeting hers. Did he suffer? She asked, her chin thrust out in defiance. Mal cleared his throat. Not enough. He should have suffered. Her voice was edged with fury and grief. He'd done unspeakable things to so many. His death should have reflected that. Mal studied her for some time. I agree. But Olivia was in danger, Ellen interrupted. Your mate's wolf is more capable than you give her credit for. Mal's jaw clenched. Something that caused most people to back off. Not Ellen. No. Her eyes narrowed and her hands fisted. And damn it all, she was gorgeous. Olivia rested her hand on Mal's arm and, with that touch, stole Mal's wrath. You can protect yourself. Your wolf is a badass, I know that. He spoke to his mate before turning back to Ellen. But you wouldn't stand by and let your mate fight if you knew the opponent didn't fight fair. It's not about trusting her, it's about knowing them. He shook his head. When you have a mate, we'll talk. Hollis was all too familiar with the hard smile she gave Mal. It was a defense mechanism. Mal had hit a nerve. Something that had Ellen's eyes blazing and her cheeks flushing a deep red. He waited, hoping the storm brewing inside would spill out into the room. If he knew what demons still tormented her, maybe he could find a way to help chase them away. But she bit angrily into her apple and stalked from the room, leaving more questions than ever. Claws, flaying skin from her body in long, fine strips, her blood scenting the air. Teeth, biting her, tearing flesh away in chunks. So deep her nerves jumped and quivered from each new assault. Cold chains around her wrists and ankles kept her secured to the stone floor. There was no escape. She was trapped, their prisoner. Images, sounds, scents, pressing in on her until she wanted to cry out, but she wouldn't give Cyrus more satisfaction. 
Her lungs were too empty to scream, and there was no one to scream to. No one would help her. She had no one. Cyrus had made sure of that. This was her fate, facing death, alone. She couldn't see through the bag over her head. For that, she was thankful. She didn't know some of her tormentors. Maybe Cyrus was right. Maybe being blind kept the victim consumed by the pain. But seeing those she'd healed, shared a meal with, or comforted through grief as one of her assailants was a suffering she'd been spared. Besides, they'd been on her so long, pain no longer registered. This was a game to Cyrus now. Power. Dominance. She was a means to an end in his eyes. As long as she was alive, she'd bleed. And her blood was all that mattered to him. For that reason, he would never let her go, or kill her. The whole. Cyrus's calm announcement broke her then, forcing a long, rasping cry from her lips. No! She couldn't do it. Not again. And Cyrus knew that. The hole was complete blackness, the only light a pinprick far overhead. One she'd stared at for hours, waiting, hoping for some sort of relief. It never came. The diameter of the hole forced her to stretch her arms up over her head to fit. Each breath was constricting, removing the slight space between her and the walls of her prison. Her bare feet sunk into muck below her. Climbing out was impossible. The walls slick with damp and too slippery to find traction. Still, she'd torn nails free and dislocated fingers trying to escape the black cold. Staying calm was key, keeping her wolf under control. She couldn't shift here. Too many bones would break. But her wolf rebelled, wanting to break free, believing she was capable to climbing out, reaching freedom. Calm. She had to stay calm. But the confinement wasn't the worst of it. Alone, in the dark, time ceased to exist. The mind wandered when left to its own devices, and that was when true punishment began. Memories were far more torturous than anything that could be done to her. Ellen? The voice was soft. Not Cyrus. Ellen, open your eyes. Open her eyes? Didn't he see the bag? But something changed. It wasn't cold. Her feet were dry. The air smelled clean, not dank and earthy. Only the blackness remained, partly because her eyes were pressed shut. What would she see? Could she bear it? She sucked in a deep breath, searching for scent, hoping. Nothing. No scent of Cyrus. She lay absolutely still, letting the here and now replace the hellish remains of her nightmare. That was all this was, a terrible dream. No memory, not nightmare. Still, she could wake from it. No cold, no moisture, no difficulty breathing. Her fingers moved, tracing the skin of her forearm. She wasn't chained. Her arms weren't pinned overhead. Ellen, the voice again. The fingers that encircled her wrist were familiar, but they weren't offering her support. They were taking her pulse. Odd that such a clinical action eased her panic. But, she snapped, knowing exactly who was speaking to her. But is it Hollis? She rolled onto her side away from him, tearing herself free from his assessment. Breathing was easier now. Thoughts of Cyrus, the whole, pain and fear fading. Leave me. Breathing. Calm and steady breathing. You were talking in your sleep. Ever calm and emotionless. She sat up, glaring at him over her shoulder. Unless she was screaming, he had no business coming into her bedroom. Perhaps you should stay out of my bedroom. Then I wouldn't bother. She realized she'd passed out in the lab. Again. Not the sanctity of her bedroom. I disturbed you? That was why he'd woken her. His green eyes studied her like the specimen she was to him. Since her humiliating attempt to seduce him in the shower, he was more reserved than ever. Still, she'd caught him looking at her more than once. You seemed agitated. Then the answer is yes, I disturbed you. 
She pushed off the floor, tugging on the sweater she'd used for a pillow, and crossed her arms over her waist. What time is it? Two, I think. He turned back to the table covered with his laptop, files, computer printouts, and an ancient volume of folklore he insisted on using as a reference. He was always hunting, always seeking. His brain was never quiet. It was exhausting and oddly fascinating. Of all Finn's pack, Hollis was the only one she didn't understand. As frustrating as his refusal to consider non-scientific solutions was, she respected his ability to remain calm and analytical under the most challenging of circumstances. He fascinated her, more so with each passing day. Maybe it was her wolf, sensing something more. Or maybe it was the lingering effects of that embrace in the shower. He should never have held her close, never have acted as if her well-being mattered. But for whatever reason, she liked that he saw her as the woman she was, not an enemy. When she was with him, she liked feeling like a woman. She studied the man. He wore his daily uniform, a starched, buttoned-down Oxford and pressed slacks, as if he were on his way to an important business meeting somewhere. For a man so immaculately dressed, his hair was as tussled as ever. She smiled, resisting the urge to smooth the thick copper hair. Always rumpled. It was as if he'd lost his comb or forgotten to brush it all together. To in the morning or the afternoon? He glanced at his watch. Morning, she chuckled. You weren't sure? Green eyes settled on her. No, I was working. His curiosity was back. The few instances they were alone... He'd begun to question her about what he'd witnessed in the field, what had happened between her and Byron. She'd yet to give him a straight answer. Always. You are an odd man, she murmured. Your poor wolf must resent you for that. His gaze remained on her, his expression as guarded as ever. He might, if he existed. Ellen rolled her eyes. You have a wolf, Hollis. You are a wolf, whether you like it or not. A heart defect can't stop that. She dismissed the ailment Hollis insisted prevented his ability to shift. There was more to it than that. There had to be. Shifting would likely cure him from his heart murmur. But that was one topic Hollis refused to discuss with her, or anyone. His left eye twitched, signaling his irritation. It was a small thing, but it was enough. She enjoyed these small victories, pleased to know that he wasn't as indifferent to her as he pretended. But then she remembered just how indifferent he'd been in the shower. It, he, had taken her breath away. She cleared her throat and tried again. First, I disturb your work, then I insult your pride. Tell me, are you angry with me? She leaned against the table, watching him closely. I'm not angry, he grumbled. She grinned. You're a terrible liar. He sighed, his forehead creasing as he frowned. Do you want me to be angry? I want you to react, she countered. With a simple shake of his head, he dismissed her and turned back to his work. One long finger trailed over notes, handwritten in red. Is that Jess's file? She came around, leaning over his shoulder to read their notes on the alpha mate's file. One note jumped out at her. The same note, every time. Hollis's script was tiny and careful. Compare bone with blood samples of Jay and Baby. The bone. The bone Cyrus wanted more than anything, and must never get. In her time here, she'd heard no talk of it, had no idea where it was kept. But Finn and his pack were smart enough to guard that information. As long as it never fell into the other's hands, there was no cause to worry. It is... Hollis never offered up more information than was requested. It was tedious. But she'd learned to accept it was the only power he wielded in his pack. Since he refused to fight the defect that prevented him from becoming his wolf, information mattered most to him. Not just acquiring it, but understanding its significance to the smallest detail. Still looking for a biological explanation? Her restlessness had returned, making Hollis easy game. Hollis ran a hand through his hair, his scent distracting her. Clean. Male. Good. This close, it was impossible to resist him. She ran a hand through his thick hair, pushing his head, playfully. 
Her wolf loved these simple exchanges. It gave her a chance to be close to him, to touch him, and breathe him deep without suspicion. He turned on his stool, putting them face to face. She stepped forward, wedging herself between his legs before she could stop herself. He reacted as he always did when she ventured outside his comfort level. With his green eyes narrowed and his jaw clenched so tightly, she wondered the bone didn't splinter. Some answers can't be found in books, Hollis. Is it truly so hard to accept I was right? One copper brow arched. Do you think this is about you being right? Yes, she chuckled. Because it means you were wrong. He shook his head, stiffening as she placed her hands on his shoulders. Her gaze searched his, wishing their wolves could communicate. It would be easier between them. She teased him because she liked him. On second thought, maybe it was better their wolves couldn't communicate. If they did, he'd know her wolf liked him far more than she should. Chapter 7 Hollis's world was upside down. After years of living carefully, deliberately, he was treading water. While he'd yet to irrefutably determine the cause, there had been a fundamental shift in everything. One thing he knew, Ellen was at the center of it. What started as playful teasing was now seriously messing with his head, his body, and his self-control. She'd poked and prodded until his frustration made him snap. It was a power play for her, something she seemed to need. When he snapped, she responded. Her smile, an authentic smile, was a rarity. And something he'd begun to look forward to. How or when this had begun to alleviate his anxiety, he didn't know. But it did, or it had. Until the shower. Until he could no longer deny he wanted more than just her companionship. And while he still enjoyed her smiles, he was having a harder time with her teasing. Every bit of him was acutely aware of her, inescapably so. She was driving him crazy. The confusing part was how much he'd liked it. The teasing and touching, the long stares and brush of her body against him. His body reacted, hard, throbbing, and needing release. A man could only take so many cold showers before they stopped being effective, and if she kept playing with him like this, it was only a matter of time before she saw just how much he was reacting to her. What would she do then? Would she still tease and laugh? Part of him didn't want to know. Now, with that gleam in her eyes and the lopsided grin on her full lips, he was caught in her spell. He breathed in, drawing her scent in, and putting his dick at full attention. Damn, but he was doing his best not to stare at her, and having no success at all. Her eyes, one green and one blue, held him captive, mesmerizing. To him, she was quite possibly the most fascinating creature he'd ever met. Of course, her array of tight tank tops and low-slung black utility pants revealed the curves and dips of her incredible body. And that fact that she never, ever wore a bra. Her nipples pressed tight against the thin knit, begging for attention. Like now, tempting him, driving home just how little control he had over his own body. But he couldn't ignore the never-ending map of scars that covered most of her body. Flaunting her survivor status, defiantly refusing to be a victim. To him, her scars and her strength defined and enhanced her beauty. And reminded him she'd been through enough. He didn't want to add to any scars, internal or otherwise. She would laugh at that. Him? Being able to hurt her? She'd find that hilarious. A small smile crossed her lips. You think too much, she whispered her fingers sliding through his hair. So I've heard, he swallowed. She sighed. Well, tell me, Hollis, have you made any new discoveries since I fell asleep? He shook his head. No, she laughed. Of course not. I feel certain you could recite every word and note in that file without prompt. She yawned, stretching her arms behind her and pulling her shirt taut. Aren't you tired? Craving a fluffy bed? Soft sheets and warm blankets to burrow under? At the moment, the last thing he was feeling was tired. 
He was headed to a cold shower. Possibly a frigging ice bath if she didn't give him a rest. The tight tips of her breasts strained against her shirt, making his pants unbearably tight. He cleared his throat and shrugged. He would have gone to bed two hours ago, but she'd fallen asleep, and he couldn't leave her alone. For all her bravado, he knew she didn't sleep well. Waking her up had become one of his many responsibilities. He didn't mind. If he could pull her out of whatever hell waited for her when she drifted off to sleep, he would. Besides, he liked being close to her. He'd stopped asking himself why since none of the answers made sense. I wanted to review it again, he mumbled. Sometimes the eye needs distance to see something new. She glanced at the file, reaching forward so that her breast brushed against his shoulder. Her scent slammed into him and stole his focus. His baser instincts had never interfered with his work and focus before. Now his baser instincts were constantly on the verge of taking control, and it pissed him off. To my unscientifically trained eye, they look well. Jessa is growing stronger, and Diana pink and round, she sighed. Does your learned opinion differ? Baby Diana and Jessa are doing well, are they not? No need to worry there. So what are you looking for? She was right. After the weeks they'd spent poring over the data prior to Jessa's delivery, it was nice to know Jessa and the baby were no longer in harm's way, as long as the others weren't part of the equation. Her blood work is perfectly normal now. The increased hormones and enzymes of her pregnancy are gone, along with the altered proteins brought on by Diana's chromosomal deviations. Deviation? she asked, grinning. If she'd move one step back, he could turn around, put space between them. She didn't. Is it truly impossible for you to accept how special Finn's children are, Hollis? First Oscar, now Diana? They will be as strong as their father, possibly stronger. If Mal would breed Olivia, I have no doubt her pregnancy would be easy and the child just as strong and healthy as Finn's. Hollis shook his head. They wanted two very different things. She wanted the wolves to thrive. He wanted them to no longer exist. We've covered this. Mal has no interest in breeding with Olivia. Ellen sniffed, grinning widely. He has little interest in anything. Her brows rose. But he has no interest in fatherhood at the moment. That's what I meant. He ran a hand through his hair. Between Mal and Olivia, and Alpha Finn and his mate, Jessa, the number of their pack could double in no time. But no one wanted that. Growing a family was one thing. Growing a pack was another. Ellen might think shape-shifting was some great honor, but he did not. This world, werewolves, full moons, and violent pack feuds, wasn't something they'd chosen. How the hell could they relish bringing a new generation into their world? He couldn't imagine it. He had one goal. A cure for the infection in their blood might give them a chance at a normal life. Relatively normal. He'd begun testing shortly after being infected. Every vaccine and trial had led to nothing but frustration. He had every resource available to him, yet he'd nothing to show for it. That was why he was looking through her file again. Hope. Resolve. And a growing desperation. Ellen studied him, making no effort to pretend otherwise. When she was done, she shook her head. What was she looking for? Thinking. Did she want him to ask? Or was this another way of teasing him? He shouldn't let her get in his head and press the buttons. He shouldn't give her the satisfaction. He pressed his lips together, watching as her eyes narrowed slightly. Now what? Damn it. What? he asked. You should find a mate, she said, tilting her head. It might help you relax. Smile a little. He laughed. <laughs> Relax? Sure, because nothing says relaxation like having a mate. Bonding, relationship, commitment? I don't think so. He would never do that to himself or the woman he cared for. It was selfish and foolish. He'd like to think he was neither. There's important work to be done first. I can't waste my time on anything else. He didn't want the distractions that Finn and Mal were saddled with since finding their mates. They couldn't make a decision without worrying over Jessa and Olivia. You're right. 
A bond requires work and time. She paused, running a hand along her neck and down her shirt front. Her soft moan made the hair on the back of his neck stand tall. No mate, then. But sex? Mate or no, Hollis, everyone has time for sex. When there's no hunt or fight to be had, sex is the best way to keep the wolf tame. She leaned forward, her breath tickling his ear. If it's done well, you might even make time for it. Sex would do you some good. She was a hair breadth away, so close, close enough. All he had to do was turn, and his lips would be on the skin of her neck. He stared at her neck, the thrum of her pulse, her sweet scent, the brush of her hair on his forehead. It feels good. She pressed her hand against the side of his face. Don't you want to feel good? She had no idea what she was doing to him. Or did she? He cleared his throat, refusing to be distracted by her gaze or the softness of her touch. I will feel better when I've found a cure. She sighed, straightening. When your wolf breaks free, it will be interesting to watch. We're not talking about this again. He meant it. Her preoccupation with his wolf's existence only reinforced the fact that he didn't have one. If he did, he'd know it. Finn, Mal, Dante, and Anders all had an obvious relationship with their wolves. Each of them were separate, strong and capable creatures that lived inside their human skins. For the most part, they were a team working together. Apparently, relationships between man and wolf could be complicated. Mal remarked on more than one occasion that he wanted his wolf to shut the fuck up. But that was Mal. Olivia said she enjoyed the camaraderie she and her wolf shared. The wolf was each individual's guardian, and a guardian of the pack. When needed, the wolf took over to do whatever man couldn't or wouldn't do. That, Hollis envied. Doing his part to protect his pack when threatened. With Cyrus and his pack of others waiting in the shadows, the threat was always there. Wolf or not, Hollis wanted the man and his wolf to suffer and die. And Akira would be able to do that. If he didn't let her distract him, that is. With any luck, I'll find a cure before that happens. He spun on his stool, his knee brushing her hip as he did so. Her soft growl told him all he needed to know. You cling to your facts and your fancy computers, Dr. Hollis. But you know we, our species, cannot be quantified. Diana should not exist. Jessa should not have survived. No human gestation was so hurried. But they did. Both of them, perfect and healthy, because there is no genetic deviation. They, we, are meant to be. What if we are important, part of the ecosystem, necessary? Ellen's calm assertion that Jessa would deliver safely had been the only reason Finn had held on to his sanity. While well, he'd been considering all outcomes, making hypotheses and coming up with treatment plans for a variety of outcomes, Ellen had pointed out flaws, inconsistencies, and remained maddeningly confident that, for no logical or possible reason, Jessa and the baby would be fine. And she'd been right. He'd never been so relieved to be wrong. But now, that they'd no reason to work side by side, Hollis was... disappointed. She'd kept him on his toes, challenged his every word, and provided insight beyond his realm of reality. He wasn't happy Tess was ill, but he was happy Finn had turned down Ellen's offer to return Tess to the others. Her nightmares told him, but she wouldn't. And they gutted him, infuriated him. Ellen wasn't meant to beg, but whatever the fuck Cyrus and Byron had done to her had her begging, pleading, and screaming. Wolf or no, Hollis's blood boiled with the need for action and justice. It was only a matter of time before she asked to leave again. What would Finn do? Even if he wasn't concerned over Ellen's welfare, how could he let her return to the others knowing all she knew? Nothing, she asked. He'd been lost in thought, and she thought he was racking his brain for some suitable argument. The wolves. Part of a necessary ecosystem? 
No logic there. None. What possible purpose could monsters serve in the real world? And, sadly, this was the real world. But he was too tired to launch into another debate with her. I didn't realize there was an acceptable response. She was studying him, looking smug. And sexy as hell. The strap of her tank had slipped off her shoulder. There is. You admit you cannot cure what we are. Each word dripped exasperation. For a man of science, your inability to see facts is troubling. We are what we are, Hollis. We are what we are because Finn had an accident. Her nearness and that damn strap were taking a toll on his patience. An accident? Ellen shook her head. You don't believe that. Finn was meant to find that bone, meant to start this new bloodline. Meant to? Then there must have been a purpose. Any ideas on that? Something important, considering what we've all been through. It has to be more than just challenging Cyrus. The idea of being faded werewolves was too abstract for consideration. The facts were simple. Finn was impaled by an old bone. Whatever DNA entered his bloodstream had changed him, infected, and genetically altered him. In a fevered state, he'd attacked Mal, Dante, Anders, and Hollis, infecting them all. Their reluctant pack was born. Your science was born from magic and mysticism. They are often the same thing. She dismissed him with the wave of her hand. Fate or an accident? What is done cannot be undone. He glanced at her, noting the slight dip between her brows as she pushed aside the folklore book he'd all but memorized and rifled through his papers. Are you looking for something in particular? He asked, frustrated by the mess she was making. No, not really. She paused, glancing at him with that small, teasing smile on her lips but I know you don't like it when I touch your things. He sat back, stunned by her confession, and amused. You can keep studying and making your notes, she tapped his papers, but her gaze met his. I need to do something. I'm restless. My wolf is restless. Which instantly reminded him of the shower. She'd been restless then, too. And since I know that you'll say no to my first suggestion, you'll have to come with me for a run? No again? Fuck it. He knew exactly what her first suggestion would be. So did his dick. And that strap. The exposed skin and hard nipples straining against her shirt wasn't helping. Fine, he said, standing and backing away from her. Space helped. A little. A run was a good idea. But she wasn't allowed to run on her own, so this was her asking for permission to let her wolf out. He pushed off his stool. I can't keep up. I know, she said, but you always try. The night air was cold and bracing, whispering across her skin and teasing the wolf within. Her lungs emptied, preparing for what was to come, craving it. You want to talk about your dream? Hollis asked, following her into the woods. No. She glanced at him. Why would I want to talk about it? When Olivia was having nightmares about Cyrus and the others, you told her the dreams were important. She stopped walking then, scowling at him. He wasn't just watching her. He was also listening to her. That conversation had nothing to do with you. He sighed, irritated. If it was a private conversation, perhaps you should have had it in a private place. The irritation faded to amusement. Hollis and his infallible logic. Perhaps. You've made friends with Olivia and Jessa. She had, and regretted it. Her time with them was coming to an end. She had a part to play to ensure the species was safe, and they would survive. This was right. New life. True loyalty. Respect and love. Finn and his pack would restore honor and nobility to the wolves. The joy of baby Diana's birth almost choked out the flame of her vengeance. Almost. It pleased her to know peace was possible. After she killed Cyrus, Finn's pack would go on to live many long and happy years beneath the full moon, even if she wasn't around to see it. Her wolf pushed, eager to be free, 
impatient to put space between her and the cabin. For now, her plans, thoughts, and worries could wait. Her wolf wanted only to run. Your dreams, are they from the past or of what might? She stopped again, spinning to face him. My dreams are my business, Hollis. I will make an effort not to trouble you with them again. The pity in his eyes sliced through her. She neither needed nor wanted his sympathy. Anger, irritation, and amusement were common between them. When working, they took care to consider the other's viewpoint and opinion. His mind was sharp, while his methods were maddening. These were things she had come to expect, even value where Hollis was concerned. But not pity. Or this new and alarming spark between them. He had been right. She had crossed the line in the shower. Her wolf had approved. Far too much, which was dangerous. The sooner she left, the better. The wolf's frustration took over, demanding she shift. Now. She tugged her shirt up and over her head, then tossed it at Hollis. The air on her bare chest was more divine than the touch of a lover. She shivered. Then again, it had been a lifetime since she'd had a lover. In seconds, she was naked, her body taut with excitement. Nothing was as liberating as letting the wolf run. Poor Hollis stood, frozen, holding her things, forever trapped. This is what you're missing, she said, stretching her arms over her head and letting the cold night air caress her. But he wasn't looking at her. He was staring up, overhead at the brilliant night sky. If it had been anyone else, she'd assume it was for modesty's sake. But not Hollis. He was a man of science. Except for their run-in in the shower, he saw her as a scientific oddity. One to study and poke, question and prod, until he could classify and label her. Order was important to him. It's how he lived his life, infuriating as that was. She studied him, closely noting just how rigid his posture was and how tight his jaw was clenched. You never long to shift, she whispered, not even a little. His gaze found hers instantly, and it made her smile. How could he say he had no wolf when his senses said otherwise? She saw him, there, blazing in his gaze. Felt him. Surely he felt the wolf. His hearing, his sense of smell, and his vision, better in the dark than the bright light of day. His wolf taking care of him, part of him. His eyes narrowed. Why does it matter? My wolf is my partner, as is yours. I cannot imagine my life without her. It's a simple question. And her wolf craved an answer. I suppose, he blew out a slow breath. From a purely scientific standpoint. She covered her mouth, but her laugh slipped out anyway. Purely scientific? Even now, whispering in the dark, he insisted on fighting his instincts. What a foolish, beautiful man. Instinct was key to her wolf. Right now, instinct demanded she touch him. She stepped closer, pressing her hand to his cheek. There is so much more to our world, Hollis. If only you could see that and embrace it. Her wolf longed to show him. Maybe it was understanding the way his mind worked or how much he would appreciate every tiny detail and sensory experience. What about your instinct, Hollis? The pull inside. You feel it, science or instinct. Call it what you will. For an instant, he leaned into her hand, surprising them both. Go run. He stepped away from her, the edge to his voice unmistakable. I'll follow. She lingered, staring at him, tempted to argue, but her wolf was done with arguing. The change was quick. Years of practice eased each bone realignment, muscle dislocation, and the shifting of internal organs. Giving in made all the difference. Anticipating, being fearful or timid, turned a perfectly natural event into something painful and traumatic. When her skin was covered with a thick gray coat and her claws sank into the ground beneath her feet, she stretched. It was so good. You make that look so damn easy, he murmured. She rubbed against him, 
throwing her full weight against his thighs and almost knocking him to the ground. He laughed, pushing her off of him. She grabbed her the waist of his pants with her teeth and tugged, hoping he'd follow her. I'm coming, he mumbled, still smiling. She shoved her head under his hand, groaning at the back of her throat as he rubbed along her head and neck with heavy, sure strokes. His touch was heaven. Her wolf would gladly stay under his hand. He chuckled. Ellen rubbed against him again, then sprinted into the towering pines of the forest. Cyrus had never let her run. If he had, it had been to train the pack to hunt. Her, the prey. This was different. Even with Hollis tailing her, she felt free. Her wolf refuge sprawled, offering the pack a perfect place to run and explore. The native wolf pack accepted them, submitting to their superior size and strength. Ellen wasn't as large as the wolves in Finn's pack, but the local wolves still recognized her as something to respect and, possibly, fear. Sadly, they shot away from her, leaving her with no one to run with. Anders and Dante were far too wary of her to ever play. Mal had Olivia, and Finn was Alpha. Play wasn't something he did. Still, she ran and ran, stretching her legs and filling her lungs with the fresh night air. She circled back to Hollis now and then, bumping into him and knocking him to his knees before tearing off again. Again and again she ran, nosing a rabbit free from the underbrush and chasing it until it froze in abject terror. She had no desire to kill it, so she lay still until the poor animal made a mad dash for cover. She circled back to Hollis, sneaking up behind him this time. She plowed over him, glancing back to see him push himself up and off the ground. If she could have laughed, she would have. Her wolf barked, whimpered, and ran on. There was a path that led to the summit of the closest peak. Her wolf took the long way, climbing and leaping, crawling under fallen tree limbs and nosing through moss and ground cover. When she reached the top, her wolf was peaceful. Eventually, Hollis joined her. You don't play well with others, he sat on a boulder, breathing hard. She crossed to him, flopping into his lap. And you have less respect for a man's personal space as a wolf. But his hands buried themselves in her fur all the same. Her wolf was up to no good. Ellen realized it the minute Hollis touched her. The full body strokes were far more comforting than they should be. Every inch of her relaxed and welcomed his touch. Each stroke down her spine rub along her side, or deep massage of her neck was soothing. Her wolf was calmed, content. Stupid animal. Her wolf ignored her insult and rested her head on Hollis's knee. Yes, they were lonely. Very lonely. But she'd have been lonely for a long time. Why was she reacting like this? It hardly seemed fair that Hollis would be the one to draw such a reaction from her wolf. Now? when hunting Cyrus should be the only thing that mattered. She looked at him through heavy-lidded eyes. He was handsome. Green eyes, thick copper hair, a full lower lip she'd recently spent hours contemplating, and his body, pure perfection. Every last inch. And there were, oh, so many impressive inches. He was honed for battle, if need be. Dreaming of him... Waking up tangled in the sheets and aching for release was far better than waking up trembling in fear. For that distraction, she and her wolf were thankful. When the wolf forced his way out, and he would, Hollis would understand what he was and how fundamental his animal was to his being. What would he be like? Hunting. Braced for battle? Ready to face the monsters hunting them? Cyrus was a monster, but he understood that and abused it. At first, she'd simply reviled him. In time, she'd come to fear him. He was twisted beyond redemption, so twisted that his pack suffered. Sickness set in, slowly at first. Her knowledge of herbs and medicines were useless against it. While Cyrus demanded she find a cure, she suspected there was none. Cyrus had forgotten what it was to be a wolf. His actions had tainted their bloodlines and doomed his pack. Those turned were dying within five to seven years of being bitten. 
Considering it was the pack, not Cyrus, that suffered, the sickness was a further injustice. Hollis ran his hand along her side, and with a sigh he leaned back against another rock. If her wolf turned to him, there were sound reasons. He was different from the rest, his mind and his candor. He saw her. With Hollis, she knew exactly where she stood. A gift after living so long under Cyrus's roof as another. And he treated her with respect, not suspicion. Even if he was foolish for fighting back his wolf. Maybe she could help with that. Since Finn was keeping her here, she and her wolf would do whatever it took to unleash his wolf. She and her wolf couldn't wait to get started. Chapter 8 The sun was rising when they made their way back to the house. In a few hours, Hollis had a conference call with the board of directors for Robbins Pharmaceuticals and Research. They were moving forward with the second round of stem cell leukemia trials. The first round had succeeded at the research team's expectations. Changing a few parameters, tweaking the numbers would, he believed, make an even greater difference. Everyone, including investors, were eager to get started, which meant he needed to make a trip to RPR's research center soon. But RPR's classified headquarters, in which Finn was a primary investor, explored lesser-known illnesses and outbreak prevention. Part of the facility was dedicated to finding a cure for the infection. Ellen brushed past him, attempting to push him down again. He grinned, all thoughts of work and responsibility vanishing. She was a playful wolf, considering how she loved to tease in human form. It wasn't totally unexpected. It was impressive, really. She bore the scars of torture and suffering on her skin, but found joy in simple pleasures. Apparently, she found great pleasure in knocking him on his ass. Ten years of study and research had taught him many things. Balance was important. If the wolf was happy, the man, or woman, was too, for the most part. When the wolf felt trapped, it was a matter of time before he or she lashed out. Ellen was more in tune with her wolf than any other member of Finn's pack. If she said she needed to run, Hollis wasn't going to argue with her. Listening to her mumbled pleas would have him pacing the lab, twitching to do something, to hurt someone. What was the hole? Who was William? Isabel? And what the hell had Cyrus done to them? Waking her had been the only option for his peace of mind and hers. Her wolf circled back to him, but he dodged her this time, laughing at her cocked head and perked ears. Missed, he said, laughing at her whimper. She barked, then ran on ahead, her tail swaying as she went. Ellen's earlier question resurfaced. Had he ever longed to shift? No one had asked him that before. The pack seemed to have some unspoken agreement of never mentioning it unless it was to mess with him. In the beginning, he'd waited, dreading it. But the moon came and went, and he didn't shift. His friends were torn apart, suffering as they turned into animals while he'd developed a fever. His body weakened, aching and throbbing, until he could scarcely move. Each and every pump of his heart was razor sharp, every breath labored and thick. There was no escaping it. He couldn't claw his own heart out. Delusions set in, cloaking reality. It was hell. But he was still him. A part of him was relieved. Another part was not. Grief, cold and heavy, hung on him. The more moons that passed, the deeper the grief seeped into his bones. He had a choice to make. Let the grief consume him, or lock it away, until it didn't press in on him. His friends needed him to find a cure. It took time, but eventually he grew numb to whatever was missing deep inside. Eventually he grew accustomed to the impact of the full moon on his body, and he was able to function. Somewhat. Whatever internal wolf the rest of his pack had, he lacked. He was neither a werewolf nor a whole man, thanks to the fucking infection. In order to understand why his heart murmur prevented his shift, he'd have to understand the way the bacteria that had forever altered their cell structure worked. And if he knew how that worked, he could cure them, and it wouldn't matter. Why would he want to shift? He didn't. Hadn't in years. 
until she'd questioned him and knocked him over. What would it be like to run with her? Did you lose my clothes? Ellen asked, standing in his path. He'd been too lost in his thoughts to realize she'd shifted, or that he was missing her clothes. It would appear so. He put his hands on his hips. Probably one of the times I was knocked down. She laughed then, her smile wide. It was worth it. Her curves moved in time with her laugh, demanding his attention. Hollis was a man, after all. She was strong, muscled, and lean. But her breasts were full and round. And her nipples jutting tightly in the cold air made him ache. Her skin was soft. He'd touched her enough to know that. His gaze traveled lower. A flat stomach, a tattoo on her hip, a paw print. Hollis, she cleared her throat. Are you staring at me? He was. He liked to keep staring at her. But then he realized something. With all the scars, it would be hard to see. Olivia had scars. But the one that changed her was different. So was his. So was the rest of the pack. Raised, pale, impossible to miss. If there was one. Where is your origination wound? She frowned. You stare at me naked, and that is what you're thinking? She rolled her eyes and spun, heading back to the lodge. I'm hungry. He moved closer, bending and stooping to explore the curves of her back, the dip above her hips and the distracting curve of her ass. Distracting or not, there was no distinctive mark. No bite, he said, almost a whisper. She glared at him. Oh, I might bite you before the day is through. She walked on, her hands fisted at her sides. His mind was reeling, filtering through possibilities. Only one made sense. You know what this means, he murmured. She spun, pushing against his chest with both hands. And now you have a thousand questions. Questions I have no answers for. She stared at him, as if weighing her words and the risks. Slowly, warily, she leaned forward, her fingers sliding through her hair and parting it. A raised scar ran from behind her left ear up and around her skull. My memories begin the day I woke up with this. Before that, I only have snippets, here and there, scattered, more dream than reality. Her words had a chilling effect on him. Her life with the others was all she remembered? May I? he asked, already sliding his fingers along the scar, then through the silk of her black hair. No, she snapped, stepping away from him. He blew out an unsteady breath, remembering the panic in her voice when she'd slept. Perhaps not knowing the specifics of her past was a good thing. Whatever had happened had resulted in massive head trauma. The scar was proof of that. He stepped closer, lifting his hand to probe the scar. You don't know how this happened? She pushed his hands away. What did I just say? She asked, her words growing thick. Even if I did, why would I share it with you? There was pain in her eyes, and so much sorrow. I didn't mean to upset you, Ellen. She blinked rapidly, sniffing. What you say or think doesn't matter. You can't upset me. Which was a blatant lie. Anger was Ellen's defense mechanism. He'd learned that early on. I'm sorry all the same. Apologizing wasn't easy for him. I try not to be an ass to those I consider my friends. She glanced up at him. You are an ass. He nodded. Am I your friend, Hollis? She asked, cocking her head to the side. He nodded again. Interesting, she said, turning back to the house. He stood there, watching her, appreciating the sway of her hips and her graceful movements. He never knew what she was thinking, even when she was speaking. One minute she was pressing herself against him and waking up an all-consuming hunger. The next, she was dismissing him as inconsequential. But that didn't change what he saw, or the realization that followed. No bite. She'd been born a werewolf. Like Finn's children, Oscar and Diana. Her drive to protect her species immediately made sense. 
self-preservation was a natural instinct, and for the first time he understood her resistance. If he did manage to find a cure, what did that mean for her, or Finn's children? Before Finn's offspring, before Ellen, finding a cure was of the utmost importance. But now, a jagged hot coal settled in the pit of his stomach. Hollis, Finn called from the porch. You're up early. Ellen went for a run. I went with her, he said, making his way to his alpha and his friend. I ran. You fell, she said, slamming inside the house. Good morning, Finn asked, leaning against the porch railing. Hollis shrugged. It's hard to tell with her. Finn grinned, nodding. Not the most assuring answer, considering you're the one who knows her the best. Only because I don't treat her like she's the enemy. Hollis's brows rose. Not that I blame her for being guarded. Agreed, Finn said. Do you think she'll want to know about Florida? We have a lead, someone who used to work with Cyrus. Looks like he's trying to bring something in from Cuba. Maybe more girls, hopefully not. Either way, there will be a raid. Hollis digested this news. Every time he thought about some young girl getting kidnapped and sold off to the highest bidder, girls who were pure and innocent, he wanted to hurt something or someone. Badly. Preferably Cyrus. Ellen had given them the information that started dismantling the trafficking ring. It was important to her. He nodded. She'll want to know. She seems restless, more than usual. Has she mentioned leaving again? Finn asked, sighing. I'm trying to understand why she wants to go back to the others. Her reasons are her own, meaning I only know what she tells me. One of the things he'd come to accept about Ellen was once her mind was made up, there wasn't much anyone could do to change it. Still, he agreed with Finn. Her drive to return to their rival pack made no sense. Finn sighed. No matter how badly they treated her, if we're wrong and she is part of their pack, she's not, Hollis said. Her eyes say as much. All of the others had near colorless eyes, making their kind immediately recognizable. Ellen's eyes were vibrant and mismatched. She wasn't another. Finn was watching him. Then why was she with them? Like I said, I know what she wants me to know. He shook his head. It's possible her situation there was no different than the girls we've saved. But knowing she'd been born a wolf made that less likely. Even young, trying to enslave a wolf would be dangerous. Finn frowned, his gaze sweeping the trees and the mountains beyond. Those scars. They did that to her? Finn's question was one he'd often wondered about. He thought about her dreams, the words that slipped from her lips. I think so. Finn's hands tightened on the porch railing. Will she be safe if she goes back? Is anyone safe with the others? He paused. He kept nothing from his alpha. There's something you should know. He glanced behind them, making sure they were alone. She has no bite scar. Finn frowned. She's covered in scars. But not an origination bite. Nothing like what we have. Finn stared at him, stunned. You're saying she was born into this, like Diana and Oscar? To a pack that wasn't the others? There are more? He blew out a long, slow breath. Are you fucking kidding me? How is that possible? I stopped asking that question ten years ago. He shook his head. Her pack is a mystery to her, too. She says she doesn't know. How can she not? Finn's eyes narrowed. She's keeping a lot of secrets, Hollis. I don't want one of them to come back and bite us on the ass. Which was a fair point. If her plan was to annihilate us, why wait? She's had plenty of time and opportunities. I agree she has secrets. But do you blame her? Her scars say a hell of a lot about her past. And when you found her, she was beaten to a bloody pulp protecting Jessa from the others. He glanced at his alpha. Preserving the species is more important than anything to her, which means she'd never endanger our pack. I believe that. His eyes locked with his alphas, hoping to drive his point home. Was Ellen difficult? Hell yes. But that didn't mean she wasn't on their side. 
Mal was difficult as fuck, and he was Finn's right hand. Finn's nod was enough for him to go on. Besides, why tell us something that might put her in a vulnerable position? Or, possibly, give us an edge she doesn't want us to have. She's evasive, but she's not a liar. You think we should convince her to stay? I'm not the Alpha, he argued. No, you're not. But I respect your opinion. And I want it. Hollis drew in a deep breath. She distracted him far too much. Stirred something inside he wasn't comfortable with. Something primal and beyond his control. But she'd become a member of this pack. One he considered essential, if infuriating. He couldn't picture the future without her in it. He didn't want to. And he sure as hell didn't want to think about what might happen to her once she was alone and unprotected. She's safe here. Not that she sees it that way. I'm not sure there's a way to get her to agree to stay. Damn it, he ground out. Agreement or not, she leaves and goes back to them. She dies. I can't willingly send her to her death. For one thing, Jessa would never forgive me. She believes Ellen is the reason she's stayed alive, surrounded by wolves. She's probably right, he agreed. Ellen knows more than any of us about what we are. Finn nodded. But she doesn't trust us enough to share. For good reason. Hollis ran a hand through his hair. She has her own way of doing things. I've noticed. Convincing her to stay will be harder than ever. Until now, we've had a common goal in protecting Jessa and the baby. The baby's here. Just as fine, and now finding a cure is all that matters. The exact opposite of what she wants. We're no closer to a cure than we were nine years ago, Finn sighed. He was right, but his words cut deep. Through no fault of yours, his alpha was quick to add. If anyone can fix this, it's you, Hollis. One blonde brow cocked. Until then, we'll keep her here. She'll find her place as part of our pack, and we'll treat her as one of us. Make sure the pack understands that. He stifled a yawn. And be prepared. Once she knows she's not going anywhere, she'll be ready to fight. Up until now, she'd only been irritated with the majority of the pack. If Finn put his foot down and kept her here against her will, Hollis suspected they'd see a whole new side of Ellen. More wolf than woman. Good thing her wolf was so fond of him, even if he didn't know why. What about Tess? Finn glanced at him. Brown will want us to save her. Hollis blew out a long, slow breath. There's only one way to do that. He met his alpha's gaze. You're willing to bring her into the pack? I don't know. Brown is part of the family. The man has blood for us time and again. He's recovering so he can stand by and watch his child die? I can't do that to him, he growled. Not if there's a chance to save her. That's not going to sit well with Ellen. Or Mal, for that matter. Hollis leveled his alpha with a look. When Mal learned what Tess had done, he'd been ready to tear her to pieces. He still was. Now Finn was considering having Tess as part of the pack? You're alpha, he shrugged. I am. If she's one of us, she's loyal to me. And right now we can use all the help we can get. Ellen's question surfaced again. Did he wish he could shift? Yes, damn it. He did. He'd welcome the pain if it gave him the power to stand against the others and fight with Ellen instead of against her. Ellen sat, her legs draped over the large padded arm of the leather easy chair. Her restlessness had her twitching, her wolf pacing and her senses on high alert. But watching Finn's pack provided a slight distraction. Their dynamic was fascinating. They communicated, shared ideas and made decisions. Together. It was beyond her understanding to see an alpha behave so. Yes, somehow Finn managed to maintain control while respecting the rest of their opinions. Cyrus's head would explode at such an idea. Brown's contacts on the force said the last bust went well. Finn paced the office, rocking his sleeping infant daughter. Tipping them off was the right thing to do. He shot a look at Anders and Mal. They don't need us in Florida but I won't stop any of you who want to go. Ellen watched with interest. Anders and Mal had been prepared to storm one of Cyrus's businesses, alone if they had to, and stop the girls from being handed off. Finn had expressly forbidden it, 
knowing Mal was too emotionally compromised to act with a level head. Luckily, Mal and Anders had been stopped before things could turn ugly, but it had been close. Considering they'd planned to defy an order by their Alpha, Ellen knew they'd be punished. What would punishment look like here? With Cyrus, it would mean equal parts humiliation and pain. For days, depending on his mood or the severity of the infringement. Not that she could ever remember anyone openly defying one of his orders. He would have tortured them, then killed them without mercy. We are a pack. I am the Alpha. You can question my decisions, but acting against my orders will not be tolerated. His gaze bounced between Anders and Mal. Ellen held her breath, her foot stopping mid-bounce. Yeah, I got it. We were acting like shits, and you have every reason to rip us each a new asshole. Anders had the decency to look ashamed. Finn's gaze pinned Mal, waiting. Mal prowled the room, clearly swallowing back what he wanted to say, but could never, ever say to his alpha, especially now in front of the pack. She realized then how much they respected him. Friends or not, when Finn decided to play the alpha card, they had no choice but to yield to him. I fucked up. Got it? Loud and clear. The words ripped from Mal's throat, thick and angry and bitter. You can't blame me for wanting to see that twisted son of a bitch dead. I don't. I understand. Finn bounced Diana with a little more enthusiasm than was required, almost pulling Ellen from the chair to collect the child. But it wasn't her place. And this, none of this, was her business. But we are a family. Finn glanced down at his daughter. Whatever we do, we do together. We are stronger together. Understood? Every head in the room nodded, including her own. Each of them had seen pain at the hands of Cyrus White, some more than others. Mal had been tortured, kept hostage, and had his mate threatened. Finn's mate had been kidnapped, his children endangered, and his family tormented. Olivia, Jessa, Brown, even Tess. On and on. The list of wrongs was long and detailed and sordid. But he'd had done worse to her. Her nightmares were memories, fully formed since the day she'd set hands on Byron. How she wished she could erase what she'd seen. Dozing off sent her straight back. Too real. Scents and sights, familiar faces, and so much more. Over time, some of her dreams filled gaps in her patchy memories. She'd hoped her dreams were building off of the trauma she'd suffered. But Byron had confirmed her worst fears. Isabel, her daughter. The hole in her heart had been torn wide, bleeding anew, jagged and fresh since that day in the snow. She remembered the feel of her baby's slight weight in her arms, felt the rapid thrum of her heart beneath her palm, drawn in her sweet scent. Nothing was more painful. Nothing. And William, her mate? Whatever affection she'd held for him was forever tainted by his pride, too proud to yield, too proud to beg for their daughter's life. Cyrus had killed everything she'd loved in this world. He'd taken her daughter. If any one person deserved the right to kill Cyrus, she did. Not that any of them needed to know that. If Cyrus really is cutting ties with his former contacts, we'll need to find a new way in. Dante leaned over the map, his dark hair falling forward onto his forehead. She shifted in the chair, the now familiar restlessness stirring. The effects of her run had been short-lived. A fire burned inside her, impatient and hungry, for a hunt. Or a fight. Or, since neither of the first two were likely, a fuck. The view of Dante's ass was tempting. He was handsome, big, and able. Ellen appreciated the strength and physical prowess of the man. He was single, available, but her wolf had no interest. And he looked at her with nothing but contempt. Pass. Ellen sat back in the chair, her attention wandering to Anders. Anders with his quick smile and laughing eyes. Few men could break tension with as little effort. Humor aside, his body was agile and fit. But then Finn's pack were all perfect physical specimens. What did her wolf want then? She knew and refused to hear it. Hollis. Her wolf instantly perked up. No, she pushed back. He glanced at her, 
briefly, his must copper curls and the stubble on his strong jaw distracting and appealing. He hadn't had time to shower and shave since their outing this morning. Her wolf had enjoyed every second of that run, partly because he was with her. All she had to do was close her eyes to visualize one very good, very impressive, very large reason to take him to bed. She breathed deep, letting the mix of pine trees, sweat, and hollis flood her senses. It was a delicious scent, heady and rugged. His shirt sleeves were rolled back, revealing the shift and flex of his muscled forearms as he reached across the map. A damning wonderful fluid heat pooled between her legs. Can you help us? Finn asked. Hollis's green gaze locked with hers. Blazing tingles ran along each nerve, stirring the heat into something electric and molten. What she wouldn't give to know what his wolf was thinking. Her wolf and her body wanted one thing, but taking Hollis to bed had consequences that extended beyond a few hours of sensual pleasure. Her wolf's preoccupation with the good doctor was dangerous. Besides, even if she was willing to risk it, Hollis might not be eager to have her drag him to her room, no matter how tempting the idea was. And it was. Very. Ellen, Finn's voice startled her. What? She sat upright, tearing her gaze from Hollis. Her breath escaped on a long, shuddering breath. You came here for Jessa. Finn glanced at the tiny baby in his arms. I am forever in your debt. We've never talked about what happens now. The warmth in her stomach turned to ice. It's time for me to go. Finn's brow furrowed. You want to leave? It's what we agreed to. I live by my word. Had he expected her to ask to stay? She glanced around the room, trying to decipher the expressions of the pack. They didn't want her here. They viewed her as another. True or not, she suspected she was and always would be an outsider to them. And her wolf, its affections for Hollis, would fade once they left. So you won't help us, Mal asked, his tone hard. I thought I had with Cyrus and Jessa. Her annoyance flared instantly. Mal was a fool. Now she understood why he irritated her. His short fuse reminded her of William, ready for the fight, ready to act, but slow to think and plan. She only hoped Olivia would not suffer because of him. You have, Olivia grabbed Mal's hand. And we are all thankful for you, Ellen. Mal stared at his mate, his mouth pressed shut. He seemed to love his mate in a way that offered hope. Perhaps he'd love her enough to listen to her. You're the one who said Cyrus wouldn't give up. Dante turned to Finn. She can't leave. She knows how to get here. She can lead them here. Sorry, Ellen, but we all know what he's willing to do to get information. Even if you don't want to betray us, you will. He pushed off the table, staring around the room. The call to fight warmed her blood. You can't keep me here against my will. I know you to be a man of honor, Finn. I'd like to discuss this calmly, Finn said, holding his hand out. He shot Dante a look. There is nothing to discuss. I'm not your enemy. Her gaze settled on little Diana, sleeping peacefully in the crook of Finn's arm. She ached, the flood of memories gripping her by the throat. Did they really think so little of her? That she would risk her life to save this baby, only to hand her over and endanger her? Never. If that's what they truly thought, she'd already stayed too long. I would never give you or your children up, she managed, sadness and anger all but choking her. She pushed herself from the armchair and hurried from the room before they saw her pain. I'll go, she heard Hollis say. No, she called back. I have no need for a babysitter. But his steady footfalls followed anyway. She waited, slamming the door in his face at the last possible moment. It was petty, but the surprise on his face was rewarding nonetheless. Her forehead rested against the thick wooden door, eyes pressed shut, breath coming in short bursts. Ellen, Hollis's voice was soft. Let me in. She stared at the door, willing the memories crashing over her, pulling her away and tearing at her heart. Tiny Isabel, so soft and sweet, 
innocent to the dangers of their world. She'd had her daughter too short a time. What would she be like now if Cyrus had not found them? Her mind wouldn't show her. Her dreams never ventured beyond Isabel's and William's deaths, the same way she'd been struck by whatever had left the corded scar along her head. They should have had their vengeance by now. Ellen should have found a way to avenge them. It was time. They would have their vengeance, and Diana and Oscar would be safe. Ellen, Hollis's voice was muffled through the thick door. Let me in, please. Better to embrace her anger than drown in her sorrow. The doorknob was solid in her grip, but she nearly ripped the door off its hinges when she yanked it wide. Worried I'll climb out the window? Her anger almost choked her. No, he frowned. Of course not. They don't know you the way I do. The way you do, she repeated, his calm dismissal smothering some of her fury. You know nothing about me. You're not mad at me, he said. Dante's acting like a dick. I agree. But he's scared. They all are. Of me? She crossed her arms over her waist. No. Of what you can bring down on the pack. He pushed into her room and closed the door behind him. To be honest, I don't understand why you're going back. If you won't stay, why not go someplace new? Start again. Start again? She swallowed down a bitter laugh. He was right, she wasn't angry with him, but she was angry. At the world. Not yet. Not yet? He studied her so long and silently that Ellen began to think the conversation was over. His question surprised her. Cyrus will let you live? She'd imagined her homecoming a dozen different ways. Each time, she was successful. Cyrus was dead, ripping off his head, tearing out his throat, slicing through his stomach. Her promise was honored. She'd made peace long ago with the fact that she wouldn't survive. Do you care? Of course I care. His surprise was disarming and oddly adorable. She smiled. I've lived enough, I think. His face paled. Poor Hollis. Instead of living this life, he'd studied it. Buttoned up in his lab coats, surrounded by every possible gadget and resource, he knew nothing of his heritage. While he sought to destroy the very thing that made her who she was, she craved revenge against the man who'd nearly broken her. It was all that mattered to her now. The species would go on without the constant fear of Cyrus and his pack. Hollis couldn't understand that until he accepted what he was. I will pick my end, not stand by wringing my hands and worrying over every shadow. She drew herself upright. If it is my time, it is my time. There's nothing left for me but revenge, Hollis. You want children, he argued, his green eyes flashing. If you didn't, this wouldn't matter to you. The tick in his jaw surprised her, as did the flare of his nostrils. She'd upset him. And it humbled her. I want a great many things. Oh, Hollis, you have no idea. Her fingers stroked his hair from his temple. But I want nothing more than his death. His hand circled her wrist. Then stay. On that, we are all united. You want me to stay? She asked, hoping to divert him. He did never understand why she must do this alone. He wasn't driven by emotion and passion. They were alien concepts, things too insubstantial to warrant further investigation. Tell me why, he frowned, swallowing. Because what you're planning won't end well. For Cyrus, she agreed. For you? Damn it, Ellen, you can't give him that. He doesn't deserve you. The hint of a growl made her insides tighten. You don't need to fight alone. I won't have anyone else's blood on my hands. Who says this is your choice? His eyes narrowed, the tightening of his jaw doing incredibly delicious things to her body. This Hollis, angry and rigid and demanding, her wolf adored. If Finn knows this is what you're planning, you won't be going anywhere. 
She was too intrigued by the effect he was having on her body and her wolf to get angry. It had been years since she'd needed a man's touch, needed the taste of his lips and the growl of his release. But right now she trembled for this man, needed what only he could give her. The moment she realized it, her heart shuddered to a stop. He stared at her, unguarded. Beyond his anger and frustration, he burned. For her. His hunger was undeniable. Without thought, she pressed herself against him, pressed them both against the door, and brushed his lips with hers. Feather light at first, then more. She needed more. While she was reeling, her wolf reacted. Her hands fisted in his hair, tugging his head down to her. Her lips sealed against his, exploring the feel of that full lower lip. His breath fanned her cheek, unsteady and rapid and harsh. Her gaze met his as his lips parted beneath hers. She shuddered, gasping with pure pleasure as he spun her against the door and pinned her there with his hip. His hands stroked up her sides, cradling her breasts firmly while his tongue slid between her lips. On and on, his sweet invasion made her drunk on him. Clinging to his shirt, arching into him, hoping he'd take what she so willingly offered. His hands, his growl, his touch. He was pure bliss. And then he was gone. Jesus Christ, Ellen. He stared at her in complete confusion. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry, but she was too caught up in the thrum of lust to form a coherent response. That was... He stood straighter, pulling himself together and putting distance between them and the process. I don't know what that was, but it won't happen again. He was staring at her mouth, gasping. She licked her lips, pleased by the instantaneous hitch in his breath. Are you sure? Chapter 9 I'm sure. No, he wasn't sure. What the fuck had just happened? One second he was pissed as hell at her calm willingness to sacrifice herself to the motherfucking others. Then the next he couldn't stop touching her. She'd filled his hands, his senses, and stripped away whatever willpower was left. All that mattered was her and the thrum between them. He had to have her. Needed her, desperately, to claim her, to bury himself inside of her. In the three feet that separated them, he could make out the rapid beat of her heart and the husky rasp of her breath. Her scent, her arousal, for him. She craved him, too, and damn it, he wanted her. His hands fisted at his sides. If he reached for her, he wouldn't stop. She pushed off the door and paced the room, the quick glance between him and her bed too much. I'm going. He forced himself from her room and closed the door behind him. Then he stood there, staring at the door like an idiot. He'd kissed her. No, he'd fucking mauled her. Against a door. A door that he could open easily. Would she be right there, waiting for him? Would she welcome him? Her scent had been invitation enough. He groaned, his head falling forward to thump against the closed door. The echo of her breasts filling his hands, the tips of her nipples hard against his palms. She'd been so soft against him, yielding. She never yielded. Buck, he whispered, his fingers biting into the wood. The door wasn't enough of a barrier. He wanted to finish what they'd started, to lose himself in her, but knew... That would be the biggest mistake of his life. One he'd likely never recover from. With a groan, he spun on his heel and walked back down the hall, around the corner and into Finn's office. If he didn't do something, he'd turn back to her room. Being surrounded by the pack might help, too. Everything okay? Finn asked when he entered. He nodded. If he was lucky, they'd believe him. Did you talk to her? Olivia asked. I know she's not officially one of the pack, but she's not another. If she goes back, they'll kill her, Mal finished. You guys can't seriously trust her. Dante was unapologetic. Just because her eyes are different doesn't mean she's not one of them. She's been living with them for years. 
Like Tess? Hollis snapped. That we're considering turning her? Tess, who has done unforgivable things, when Ellen has only helped us. The room fell quiet, all eyes on him. Because he sounded unhinged. His voice trembled, almost a borderline growl. Finn cleared his throat. I trust her. I trust her with my children's life. And the safety of this pack. His face grew thoughtful. She's too careful, Mal nodded. There's a reason she's going back. The reason that sent him out of control. Cyrus, Hollis said, clearing his throat. She can't stop until he's dead. It's personal. He glanced at each of them. She talks when she sleeps. Her nightmares. Cyrus is always there. She's going back to kill him. He glared at Dante. And protect us. Dante's gaze fell from his. Mal snorted. That's not her job. She feels differently, Hollis argued. Death sentence or not, she's going back. She's determined to finish this. For our pack, our wolves. No, Olivia's voice broke. You can't let her. Mal's nod was tight. Fuck, Dante's whisper was soft. I didn't know. Your time with them was hell on earth, Finn looked at Mal. That's been her life for who knows how long. She has every right to want vengeance. Finn spoke calmly. But she is one of us now. How do we convince her of that? Anders asked. No offense to Ellen, but she's downright prickly when she wants to be. Being nice to her is a good place to start, Olivia said, elbowing Mal on the side. She's tough because she has to be. Hollis couldn't argue with Anders' description or Olivia's insight. But the Ellen he'd pressed against the door not five minutes ago was anything but prickly. He cleared his throat, moving across the room to pour himself a glass of water. Sounds like Hollis has an in. The amusement in Mal's voice drew all eyes his way. I do? He took a long sip of his water. Um, yeah. You're sleeping with her. Dante sat on the edge of the desk, grinning when Hollis choked on his water. Anders chuckled. <laughs> Never pegged you for being so adventurous. Is she your mate? Finn asked. He set his cup down with more force than he intended. I'm not sleeping with her. They waited. She's fallen asleep in the lab, he cleared his throat. Then why is she always touching you? Anders added. She's nicest to you. He's nice to her, Olivia explained, her hazel gaze searching his. I don't think she's had many people be nice to her. Hollis stared into his glass. She wouldn't thank him for sharing what little he knew with them. But he wasn't done. We can't let her leave, he said. If she goes, she dies. You're asking me to keep her here? Finn asked. Hollis nodded, ignoring the variety of expressions the pack wore. They could interpret his request however they wanted. As long as Ellen didn't leave, he was happy. You're not sleeping with her. Yet, Mal chuckled. Olivia punched him in the arm. Well, I don't know who to feel sorry for, Anders winked at him. You for having to tame the wolf, or her for having to break yours free. Her, definitely her, Dante chuckled. Can we stick to the facts? Hollis snapped. It's not about getting laid, goddammit. It's about saving her life. The room fell silent again. Finn nodded. She's not going anywhere, Hollis. Hollis slumped into the easy chair then. It was easier to breathe and think, knowing she wasn't immediately in harm's way. She'd fight this, fight him, but the pack would have his back. He had to find a way to show her this was where she belonged, and together they could beat Cyrus without anyone else dying. When baby Diana started to fuss, Finn headed out. Hollis, he called, leading him down the hallway and into the living room. How did the conference call go? The conference call he'd almost forgotten since his run-in with Ellen. He drew in a slow, calming breath. It went well, but I'd like to be there when they implement the new protocols. He paused. I'd like to fly to San Antonio for a few days. Finn nodded. When? The sooner he went, the sooner he could come back. Is tomorrow too soon? Finn shook his head. That's fine. Take Ellen with you. 
The break might do her some good. We have a full week until the next full moon. Hollis sucked in a deep breath. Leaving her made him anxious. But he and Ellen, alone in the residential hotel he called home, was dangerous. Now that she'd woken up whatever the fuck this was, he had no idea how to control it. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Ben looked at him. Why? How the hell was he supposed to answer that? I can't watch her and work. It would be easy for her to leave. Mal and Olivia can go with you, Finn answered quickly. Pick up some things. Have a little break. Give us a little break from them, he smiled. He hadn't meant to sigh, but he did. And Finn heard his irritation loud and clear. She really gets to you, he asked, a small smile forming on his lips. You have no idea, Hollis ground out. I might, Finn glanced at his daughter. He shook his head. Why does everyone automatically assume this is about that? When he'd had her in his arms, the last thing he'd felt was tenderness. He'd wanted her, craved her, needed to dominate her. All firsts for him. It's not, Finn frowned. If you want me to take her with me, I will. He didn't want to talk about this with Finn. Closing things off, shutting things out, he could do that. Finn's eyes narrowed slightly. I do. Hollis ran a hand through his hair and tried like hell not to reveal his frustration. Is this some sort of test? Finn's brows rose. Hell no. If you really can't handle taking her, fine. He pushed the word out. Handle her? Unlikely. Finn's slow nod only irritated him more. I'll tell Mal and Olivia, and make sure the plane is ready in the morning. How long will you be gone? Two nights, no more than three. Between Mal and Olivia's regular display of affection, and the way he was still burning for Ellen, two would definitely be better. Finn chuckled. <laughs> I've known you for a hell of a long time, Hollis. This isn't something you're going to be able to get a hold of. Believe me, I tried. He smiled. I get where you're coming from. Life is complicated enough as it is, and Ellen isn't what you'd call an uncomplicated woman. He shifted his daughter to his other arm. But you don't have a choice here. You want to keep her close and protect her because, for whatever reason, she's special. And necessary. Fighting it won't stop it from happening. If your wolf has chosen, you will too. It didn't help to hear Finn describe exactly how he felt about Ellen. When, or how, or why she was necessary, he didn't know. But damn it, it couldn't be like that. Couldn't happen. I don't have a fucking wolf, he reminded Finn. No wolf, no mate. None of that applies to me. He leveled a long, cold glare at his alpha. But Finn just kept right on laughing. She waited until the house was quiet before venturing out of her room. Nerves frayed. Back up and in a pissy mood, she wasn't up for company. And punching one of the pack in the face wasn't likely to improve their feelings about her. But she was starving enough to risk a run-in. As long as Hollis was nowhere to be seen, she'd be fine. The log in the fire popped, causing her to jump. Shit, she hissed. Hollis shouldn't have followed her. His touch had left her more agitated than ever, and his response had been completely unexpected. Now that his desire for her was no longer in question, Ellen had no idea what to do about it. Her wolf, on the other hand, did. In the seconds they'd been entangled together, his wolf had made its presence known. The yearning to breed had her skin flushed and tingling. I thought you'd get hungry, Jess's voice startled her. Ellen turned to find the alpha's mate nursing her tiny daughter before the fire. Another reminder of what her wolf wanted. To mate and breed. The urge clamped down on her heart, cold awareness slicing through her body. No. Diana's small hand pressed against Jess's skin, soft and helpless. The wolf's instant yes slammed into her. For the first time in her existence, her wolf was going to fight her. Sorry if I scared you, Jessa grinned. Diana was fussy, so I thought I'd bring her out here. Give Finn a chance to sleep. He and Oscar were up late. She pointed. 
There's food in the microwave. Anders cooked. What would we do without Anders? She tore her gaze from Jessa and Diana. This was ridiculous. As if Hollis was willing to take her to bed. He wanted her, but the man had the self-control of a monk. Even if he did suffer a moment of weakness and take her to bed, would a bond form? And if it did, that didn't guarantee a child. Hollis hated this life too much to bring a child into the world. She knew him too well to pretend otherwise. A child. Where the hell had that come from? But the idea took root, and damn it all, the idea was tempting. Her hands were so tightly fisted that her nails bit into her palms. It's really good, Jessa encouraged. You should eat. Ellen opened the microwave, her stomach growling at the aroma of chicken, onions, and herbs. Pie? Chicken pot pie. The man has a gift with comfort food. I need to start exercising, or I'll be the size of a house in no time. Jessa cradled Diana against her shoulder and patted her tiny back. You okay? Finn said there was a bit of a disagreement and that you were probably upset. She'd rather talk about Finn than think about Hollis. It was easier that way. Anger was always easier. Why should I be upset? We had an agreement and he's now breaking it. She turned on the microwave. To him, our disagreement was over nothing at all. What agreement? Jessa asked. I stayed to help you, Jessa. You no longer need that help. Her gaze wandered to Diana. She should not feel so connected to this child, or Oscar, or Jessa for that matter. They were nothing to her, and she was nothing to them. I should have left long before now. It would have been easier for all of us. Then she wouldn't be craving babies, babies with Hollis. Her wolf had officially lost its mind. You want to leave? Ellen hadn't expected the other woman's sadness. But you've a home here, and a pack. Jessa's words plucked at her heart, attempting to draw her in. But the will of one could not make her part of this pack. A pack doesn't work that way. She pulled her piping hot dinner from the microwave and sat at the long counter. If you're not born, bred, or bitten into a pack, you are not part of that pack. Was that why her wolf was so determined to have Hollis? She was looking for a solid tie to this family? Whether she was part of the pack or not, she would fight to protect it. And they would need protecting. Cyrus had made sure the others knew what he wanted, and that he'd reward anyone who helped him get them. Jessa. The children. The bone that caused the transformation and started this pack. Cyrus believed that the bone was the reason Finn and his pack were stronger, bigger, and able to reproduce. He believed it was the key to their species. Ellen worried he might be right. Cyrus must never have it. She could tell Finn, or Hollis. Her wolf urged her to. Jessa situated Diana on her breast before continuing with the conversation. Where will you go? You saved me. Went against Cyrus's orders to keep me safe. She pressed her eyes shut. I saw what he did to you, Ellen. It almost killed you. And then Mal, she shuddered. He enjoys violence. You know it. I know it. Please, you can't go back to that. Jessa's plea tugged at her heart. Her wolf perked up, recognizing the footsteps before the man actually entered the room. Hollis. Finn followed, but her wolf didn't care in the least. She was too preoccupied with Hollis, mesmerized by his must copper hair and flashing green eyes. Stupid animal. Agreed. Hollis's voice was firm. Her irritation bubbled up. Instead of attacking him physically, she assaulted him verbally. You agree? Ellen shook her head. Your sole purpose is wiping out my kind. I'm giving you one less to wipe out, one way or the other. A broken cry came from Jessa. Hollis took two steps closer, then stopped. Damn it, Ellen. What will you do, Hollis, if you find your cure? What happens to me, to Oscar and Diana? We were not made. We were born this way, formed this way. This infection was woven into our DNA at the point of creation. What effects will your cure have on us? 
I can't answer that. Hollis stared at her, his eye violently twitching. Good. He should be upset. She was upset. But still you push forward. She shook her head. You know much about science, and nothing about magic. Hollis's eyes narrowed. This is magical to you? Losing control? Becoming something other than yourself? He crossed the room, coming closer. She could hear the rapid thump of his heart in his chest. Taking life, running from those who would happily torture and kill? Wolf or not, that is life. She stood, coming to stand inches from him. His scent was pure heaven. His jaw locked, the slight flare of his nostrils and the constriction of his pupils mesmerizing. At least we are equipped to handle it. Her words ended on a growl. Oh, how she adored this Hollis. Fired up and passionate, throbbing with life. The promise of his wolf was there, just beneath the surface. His eyes narrowed, the switch returning with a vengeance. She wanted to meet his wolf. If she kept pushing, would she pull him out? Angry and glorious and ready to fight? She shook her head. I would rather face Cyrus than die from your cure. Hollis growled. Since we have no cure, this debate seems premature. Finn's calm declaration sliced through the mounting tension in the room. Hollis's gaze studied her mouth, the slight quiver of his nostrils sending a white hot jolt along her spine. He stepped back, running a hand through his tussled hair. Ellen blew out a long, slow breath, her agitated nerves refusing to calm. She asleep? Finn's whisper was pure adoration. Ready for bed? I didn't mean to wake you, Jessa answered. You weren't beside me. Of course I woke up. There was no denying the man loved his woman. Besides, I needed to firm some things up with Hollis. Oh? Jessa asked. I'm going on a trip tomorrow. Hollis's words earned her full attention. Where? Ellen hated how quickly the word slipped out. He should go. Distance would do them both some good. His eyes narrowed. The pharmaceutical company I run, RPR in San Antonio. He paused, swallowing. You'd be impressed by the facility and the equipment. Only the best. You're telling me this why? She asked, turning to face Finn. Am I going with him? Finn nodded. You think sending me off with Hollis will change my mind about leaving? You are not my alpha, Finn, and this is not my pack. Finn's expression hardened. It can't hurt to have a change of scenery, Ellen. He sighed. Go. See what Hollis does. Take a break. When was the last time either of you did something fun? Fun? Hollis asked. The startled look on his face chipped away at Ellen's annoyance. He doesn't seem familiar with the word, she said. Not that she had vast experience with it. But how was she expected to have fun with Hollis? In the very place he was working to eradicate her species. Then you should show him, Jessa grinned, letting Finn help her from the rocking chair. Enjoy yourselves. Hollis's grunt conveyed his irritation, but he still found the energy to issue orders. You should go to bed and rest while she's sleeping. Hollis nodded at Diana sleeping in her mother's arms. Jessa waved away his comment and took Finn's arm. I'll make sure she rests and take good care of the three of them. The tenderness in Finn's voice triggered something. Ellen's throat tightened sharply, making it hard to breathe. She had no such memories of William, save what Byron had shown her. There was no remembered tenderness or moments of love. When she thought of William, tenderness was the last thing she felt especially now. Anger, sadness, and always the need to act. What would life be like to have such a bond? To have someone looking out for her, caring for her, wanting her companionship? Such thoughts were foreign to her, and pointless. Hollis was watching her, she could feel it, but she refused to acknowledge him until they were alone. She didn't want him analyzing her or dissecting her thoughts, but once she looked his way, her wolf had no interest in looking elsewhere. She'd wanted to stay angry. Her wolf overruled. He stared right back. Sharp eyes, vibrant and beautiful. A good face, thoughtful and strong, strikingly handsome. 
even with a bend in his nose, she'd never noticed that before. But she rarely stared at him before. You broke your nose? she asked, desperate to break the thickening silence. His brow creased. When I was a child. Hollis as a child? I can't imagine it. Were you a serious child? Her fingertip itched to trace the line of his nose. Already collecting bugs and putting them in jars to study them? Red stained his cheeks, making her smile. She'd guessed right. Sometimes, he cleared his throat. I was a boy, climbing trees, skipping rocks, and getting in trouble for smarting off. Always telling people how wrong they were? Is that how your nose was broken? She asked, easily imagining that. He shook his head. I think it is, she argued. When you weren't smarting off and getting punched in the face, you laughed and smiled? One eyebrow arched, a reluctant smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. Yes. He would have been a beautiful child. Big green eyes and curly red hair. Enchanting. I might have liked that, Hollis, she murmured, her gaze falling to his lips. Hollis's green eyes traveled her face, searching her eyes. You like me? His smile grew. Her wolf would like it better if he was kissing her, touching her. This was dangerous territory. It would be easier if they didn't like each other. Her wolf, however, was the problem. And his wolf, there, eager to break free, staring at her from his brilliant green eyes. So close. Close enough to touch. She wanted to touch him. And you like me, she whispered. Whether or not he did wasn't the problem. His wolf did, and that was a very serious problem. Chapter 10 Like? No, he did not like her. He didn't know what the hell this was, but he couldn't shake it. Things like the ridge of her shoulder blade, the angle of her neck, and her slightly parted lips had him mesmerized. He was standing there, staring at her, and he couldn't do a thing about it. Are you taking me with you because it's what Finn wants? Her words were thick and husky, pure and devastating temptation. His brain was shorting out, and she expected him to answer questions? Finn is alpha. It was the first thing that crossed his mind. And safe. Wrong answer. She went rigid, her gaze falling from his. Fuck. He was never any good at hiding things. No point doing it now. Fuck it. It's what I want to. True, and dangerous to admit. Her posture eased instantly. Is it? Why? His chuckle was tight and forced. <laughs> I'm not sure. No? A slight smile, almost curious, curved one side of her lips. One green eye, one blue, both fixed warily on him. My wolf might take it as an invitation. For what, he asked. She smiled then, biting her lip and turning back to the kitchen counter. For what? He ran a hand over his face. He needed to hear her say it. Out loud? So he could further torment himself? Her wolf wanted him. And he wanted her, which was stupid, dangerous, reckless. But the way she sauntered across the room and straddled her stool, it was impossible to look away. She picked up her fork, then stabbed a bite, the pie disappearing into her mouth. She took her time sliding the fork out from behind her full lips. You enjoy that? He crossed the room, standing close enough to breathe her in. Heaven and hell wrapped up in one spitfire package. She smiled up at him. Teasing you? The steady weight of her gaze made his pants unexpectedly tight. I do. You know I do. She speared a carrot with her fork. Very much. He watched, far too interested in her teeth, her lips, and how much she seemed to enjoy nibbling the tip of her carrot. She couldn't seem to stop smiling. Did you eat? She asked. Yes, he snapped. She laughed. <laughs> Sit with me? He frowned. I should get things packed up for tomorrow. She shrugged. 
Tell me, do you take your book of bedtime stories with you to your fancy lab? He wouldn't take the bait. Whether it was published as fiction or not, he'd learned some of it was useful. Maybe the author had passed stories down through the generations. Maybe they'd had encounters and lived to share bits and pieces. Whatever the reason, he found value in the massive collection of myths and parables. Well, I have another copy there. She paused mid-chew. You have another copy? I have an extensive library at the lab. I understand that proven fact and legend or myth often have the same origins. It's sifting between the details, understanding the symbolism and metaphors and nuances of ages past. He headed into the kitchen, pulled a cup from the cabinet, and poured himself some cold water. Your magic, I guess. She was up, pressed against his side, scraping her dish into the sink and rinsing the remaining crumbs into the garbage disposal. He froze. She pushed between him and the counter, pulling open the dishwasher and bending to load her plate. Her ass. A perfect curve, pressed against his rapidly shrinking pants. As if her scent wasn't intoxicating enough. Or the brush of her silken hair beneath his chin. His hands wanted to explore every curve and dip of her body. He wanted to know her taste, drown in her scent, and bury himself deep inside of her. Hollis, she asked, staring up at him. He blinked, unable to breathe. Breathing only flooded his senses with her. I asked if you were done with your glass. She was the picture of innocence, minus the flare of hunger in her eyes, and the far too satisfied smile on her lips. He couldn't look away from her lips. He stepped forward to put his glass on the countertop, but she wedged herself between him and the counter. He could step back. Give her space. Give him space. But she was testing him. If she thought he was going to back down, she was wrong. He gripped the marble counter on either side of her, pinning her there, warm and soft against him. Big mistake. Every inch of him hardened with craving. No, I'm not done with my glass. He ground out the words. More water? She reached behind her, the action pulling her tank top tight against the full swell of her breast. No bra, only thin cotton. The tip jutted up, tight, for him. No, he snapped. He didn't want water, and she knew it. There was no missing the throb of his erection pressed against her belly. No, she repeated. Then you don't need your glass? Her bravado slipped when her gaze fell to his mouth. Damn it, he growled, his lips descending on hers before he could stop himself. Her lips parted instantly beneath his, stealing his breath and making him sway into her. How she managed to shift onto the counter he didn't know. Her legs wrapped around his waist and her fingers tangled in his hair, tugging fiercely. He wasn't sure who was kissing who, but her tongue stroked his and he no longer cared. This was all he wanted. Her teeth nipped his lower lip driving him on. Her breasts overflowed his hand. Soft. So soft. With the brush of his thumb, she arched into him, grinding herself against him. One hand gripped her hip, the other savored her breast. His mouth along her neck, the rake of his teeth along her skin making her shudder. He wanted this. Wanted her. A growl snapped him out of it. He'd growled. He released her and stepped back, panting. What the hell was that about? Heat singed his skin, turning it thin and brittle. The hair covering his body stood straight up. The veins in his temple thrummed. The urge to touch her made his palms and fingers tingle. Everything felt off. He took another step back. Damn you. Her voice was gruff. Hands propped on the counter behind her. She stared up at the wooden beam overhead her breasts shuddering and shaking in time with her ragged breathing. Hollis stared, watching every move. She was hypnotizing. It's unhealthy, she muttered, still staring up. He cleared his throat. What is? She stared at him then. Bottling things up this way. Her gaze drifted south to the aching evidence of his arousal. You want me. I want you. 
Every fucking word was a kick in the chest, intensifying his discomfort. If only it was that easy. Nothing ever was. Taking Ellen to bed would be anything but easy. Want doesn't equate to need. He saw her mouth open and quickly clarified. Need as in necessary for survival. She stayed as she was, breasts jutting out, legs spread wide. Her determination was admirable. My wolf is likely to threaten your survival if you do this again, one brow arched. He swallowed, tearing his gaze from her distracting pose. I apologize. For stopping something we need, she interrupted. You and me, and our wolves. You should apologize. He glared at her then. Glower all you want, Hollis. When you touch me, I feel your wolf. The urge to dominate, to bite and twist me to your will. To make me groan, to claim me. That is your wolf, she smiled. Fighting to get out, to get to me. Let him out. There is nothing my wolf wants more. He bit back another growl. Her words played through his mind. Ellen beneath him, fiery and passionate. He'd never dominate her. He wanted her as she was. But the biting and groaning and claiming? Hell yes. That and so much more. Admitting that would open doors that needed to stay firmly shut, preferably padlocked. It took effort to dismiss the firestorm between them, but he did his best. It's arousal, born from mutual attraction. Even he had a hard time believing what he was saying. This was more than arousal. But to consider what she was saying, that their connection called to his wolf was unfathomable. Her eyes went around, a startled laugh making her all the more beautiful. <laughs> I've lived a long life, had many... Lovers, but no man has made my blood burn as you do. She realized her mistake as soon as she'd spoken. He saw it. She paled, the taunting smile fading from her face as she slid from the counter. In the time she'd been with the pack, she'd taken care to measure her words to reveal nothing. This was one hell of a revelation. One with surprising effects. As a scientist, he tended to rely on facts and research, not instincts and feelings. But there was no fighting them now. Possessiveness thickened his blood, pumping through his veins until it took a firm hold on him. While he was forcibly holding himself from reaching for her, she was in full panic mode. Her gaze looked everywhere but his. From soft and seductive to stiff and pacing, she was agitated. Clearly, she hadn't meant to say it. And she was pissed, at herself, presumably. I'll pack if I have to go. But she didn't look at him. Hollis cleared his throat. You do. Her hands fisted at her sides, but still her gaze avoided his. And who else is going? Anger laced the question. Mal and Olivia. Now he was incredibly thankful for their presence. He never thought he'd need a chaperone to help keep him in check, but now he wasn't so sure. She nodded, staring into the flames with narrowed eyes. I would send him out too. Hollis waited, but Ellen, as usual, didn't elaborate. Meaning, she rolled her eyes. You are the ploy. Olivia is the distraction. Mal, the last resort. He ran a hand through his hair. Or maybe he just wanted them to have a change of scenery too. We can't stay here forever. Olivia and Mal need time to figure out what their lives will be like outside the refuge walls. Ellen spared him a hostile glance. Be that as it may, finish sending Mal to make sure I don't run. She'd run? From him? His stomach dropped, lead lined and cold. Pressure crushed his chest. He closed the gap between them but stopped short of touching her. I won't let you run. The words were gruff and hard. She smiled into the fire. You couldn't stop me, Hollis. My wolf is too powerful. It was his turn to smile. Is she? Then I won't worry. As long as your wolf wants me, I don't have to worry about you running. She spun then, the flash of fury in her eyes glorious. 
Even her solid slap across the face couldn't completely erase his victory. He had the upper hand, and there wasn't a damn thing she could do about it. Ellen had long since given up having control in her life. Cyrus had made sure of that. But that didn't mean she liked it. Did she have control now, living with Finn's pack? No. But she didn't live with constant fear. Regardless of how they felt about her, she'd never once felt threatened or afraid of Finn and his pack. For that, she was grateful. And uncertain. All of her memories included aggression and violence, torment and abuse. So now, even knowing that was no longer a part of her life, her instinct was still to brace for the worst. They were leaving the refuge. She'd never wanted to be here, never acknowledged the sense of safety or peace it had given her. But it had. Even if its newness had also been slightly terrifying. While they kept an eye on her, they gave her certain freedoms. She'd discovered things like the internet, television, and phones that a few clicks of a keyboard could give her the answers it would have taken her hours to find buried in books was incredible. But phones were too much like a tether, invasive and obnoxious. She'd continued to lose hers, hoping Finn would give up on the idea of her carrying one. He didn't. Cyrus would have punished her for losing a phone. He enjoyed punishing her and dictating her days. From the food she ate to the clothes she wore, Freedom hadn't been part of her world. If her nerves were on edge and her wolf was skittish now, sitting in an airplane with couches and champagne, televisions and computers, overstuffed recliners, and classical music piped into the spacious cabin was unnerving, she had good reason. Why did anyone need such extravagance on an airplane? Why did a person need an airplane? Want to lie down? Mal grinned at his mate. He wasn't suggesting a nap. You know where the bedroom is. Now stop, Olivia whispered, her cheeks going red. Bedroom? On a plane? Ellen curled into one of the chairs and stared out the window. She had no interest in flying, or being trapped in something that would take her off the ground and into the sky. This took losing control to a whole new level for her. She ran her palms along her pants, wiping away the sweat. You okay? Olivia asked. She nodded. You sure? She pushed. You look tense. She always looks tense, Mal quipped. Ellen ignored him. I'm still astounded by the excess of your pack. She pointed it on the cabin. Is such luxury necessary? Mal laughed. <laughs> Pretty sure the words luxury and necessary don't belong in the same sentence. Olivia pushed against his chest. Finn is a wealthy man. His family owns Dean Automotive, and they have all sorts of investments. He works hard to stay that successful. There's a lot riding on his success, beyond planes, big houses, and nice things. Hollis sounded off, ever defending his alpha. Like all the latest scientific and research gizmos? Mal asked, grinning at Hollis. You're saying Cyrus isn't a fan of living things up? With all the black market dealings and silent partnerships he's involved with, he can sure as hell afford it. Can he? I've no knowledge of such things. I've only seen him spend money on useful things. Useful things equated to dangerous things. Advanced targeting weapons and traps. Security to reinforce the numerous pack houses Cyrus has spread around the country. Things to make the others deadlier and more fearsome. If he'd taken to buying fancy planes and technological equipment, he'd never told her. What would that asshole consider useful? Mal snapped. She bit back. Not airplanes with bedrooms. Mal's arrogance made it easy to keep what she knew to herself. Olivia shot her a sympathetic glance as she pulled Mal aside. Once Mal's focus was centered on his mate, he forgot Ellen's very existence. She watched, fascinated by the change in the pair. The power of their bond was evident. Like Finn and Jessa. If all chose so well, their pack would remain strong and true as long as Cyrus didn't get to them. A remembered ache tugged at her chest. She'd glimpsed some of the other's arsenal, knew the time and energy Cyrus exerted to create truly dreadful weapons, weapons he would gladly use on Finn's pack. What are you thinking about? Hollis sat in the chair opposite her, his elbows resting on his knees. 
What would he say if she told him the truth? She worried over Finn and his pack. Cyrus's latest creation, larger and more accurate silver-coated bullet. She'd had to help dig it out, a not-so-easy feat. Cyrus had her document its effects, tracking the patient and the wound. The tissue damage was so extensive it was hard to stitch. And now Cyrus was developing a syringe-like bullet, one that would inject a lethal dose of liquefied silver and cyanide directly into the bloodstream. There would be no coming back from that. If he'd figured out to make the plunger release work, the rounds could be in use now. But if that were the case, Byron would have used them on Brown and Tess. Thankfully, he hadn't. Telling Hollis or Finn about Cyrus's plans, his weapons and reinforcement and targets, would change the pack. Finn's pack wanted revenge, but they weren't consumed by it. They put family and pack first, lived day in and day out as a strong and supportive pack. Knowing the details and lengths Cyrus was willing to go to destroy the family they'd created would tarnish what they had, but it would also help them prepare. They would need that, and considering the way they'd treated her the last few months, she owed them the truth. Melon. His hand stroked her forearm. His touch jolted her back to the present and made her insides quiver. I didn't give you permission to touch me, she muttered, curling farther into herself. He sat forward, resting his elbows on his knees. You're still angry with me about last night? She glared at him, staring pointedly at his cheek. There is no mark. I'll hit harder next time. He ran his hand across his jaw. I'd like to avoid it next time. Her gaze lingered on his hand. Big hands. Hands that cradled her breast and drove her to distraction. She pressed her lips together. You won't tell me what you're thinking because you worry I'll tell them? He glanced at Mal and Olivia, wrapped up in whispering on the other end of the cabin. That's why you won't talk to me? She couldn't talk to him because his proximity scrambled her thoughts into incoherent jumbles. I don't talk to you because I don't want to. She didn't look at him. You irritate me, greatly. He had laughed. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. She smiled, but still didn't look at him. I know. I remember the feel of your irritation against my stomach last night. It was quite impressive. His sharp intake of breath had her glancing his way. His eyes were pressed shut, the muscle in his jaw working. Her fingers itched to stroke that jaw. Maybe that's what I was thinking about, she continued, enjoying his struggle. What would have happened if you'd finished what you started? You've strong hands. I like that they fit me here. She cupped her own breast, watching his reaction. His eyes popped open, fixating on her face, her hand. His jaw clenched tightly. Her body warmed, aching for him. And this, she whispered, brushing her thumb against her nipple. I didn't want you to stop. Fuck, he hissed, his hands fisting against his thighs. Exactly. She slid to the edge of her seat, easily within his reach. Why are you doing this? He forced the words out, pushing out of his seat. He paced, running a hand through his copper hair. His gaze darted around the cabin. Apparently Mal and Olivia had decided to make use of the bedroom. They were alone. His green eyes regarded her warily. I thought I'd made it perfectly clear, she admitted. He glanced at the floor, then the ceiling. You like tormenting me. I'm simply offering you what we both want. She scooted back in her chair and crossed her legs, the throb between her legs bordering on pain. Are you afraid to be alone with me? He didn't answer. She sighed. You won't talk to me, but you expect me to talk to you? His brows rose. Pick a different topic, and I'll talk. It's one way to pass the time. Question for question? She pointed at the chair. She had things his pack needed to know, but she was curious to know what he'd ask. But you first. His gaze bounced from her to the chair. From the bulge in his pants, his wolf was still battling for control. Oh, how she wished the beast would win. But the set of his jaw, his thinning lips and furrowed brow told her that wasn't going to happen. I can behave, 
she grinned. Then you can go first, he sat wary and stiff. Chapter 11 It took focus to shut down the response she'd stirred. Again. But he did it. If there was a chance she'd share information about the others, he had to jump on it. Not her. She studied him as if considering her options. When she finally spoke, he was surprised by her train of thought. Besides trying to cure this so-called infection, what things do you do at your pharmaceutical company? Talking work was easy. He sat, instantly more relaxed. Generic vaccines that we can provide to countries in need and to those without insurance. Trials for cancer. That's what this trip is about. We've done some stem cell testing that looks promising. Minor tweaks might yield greater results. I want to be there for that. Really? She asked, leaning forward. He grinned. You don't believe me? She shrugged, smiling. It's never occurred to me that you'd be preoccupied with something other than curing what we are. In the months she'd been with the pack, he'd rarely left the refuge. His overnight trips, late-night conference calls, teleconferencing, and data debriefs had gone unnoticed. Still, it bothered him that she thought this world was his whole world. While the infection affects my life, it doesn't define who I am. I want my work to do that. Work? Not family? she asked, her gaze fixed on him. My turn, he sat back rubbing his chin considering his options. If he opened too strong, she'd shut down. His expression must have revealed his internal struggling, because she laughed. Laughter transformed everything, and her smile was magic, if he believed in such things. That was her department. What precautions should we be taking against the others? Her nod was slight. Finn has impressive security. I would worry most about Cyrus learning things like location and the members of your pack. If he knows that, he will find a way to infiltrate and eliminate, she paused. While you research your cure, he develops new weapons. He hadn't expected her to offer beyond what he was asking. What sort of weapons? A hard, cold knot formed in his throat. She shook her head. How close are you to testing your infection cure? He cleared his throat, impatient for answers of his own, but knowing they were entering dangerous territory. Besides, he'd signed an NDA on this research. All RPR scientists had. Still, he had to answer her. Soon, her brows rose. That is not an answer. Are we done then? He shook his head. I've begun testing already. Her eyes went round. You? On what? Blood. DNA samples, some of the bone fragments, he broke off. You don't want to tell me this? She shifted in the chair, drawing her knees to her chest and wrapping her arms around them, almost as if she were pulling into herself. Because you don't trust me? What weapons? He repeated his earlier question and avoided answering hers. He hadn't been prepared for her answer, but why was he surprised? At every turn, Cyrus had proven again and again that he was a monster. What she told him turned his blood cold. Injecting silver and cyanide into the bloodstream? Cyrus didn't just want to wipe out their pack. He wanted to torture them. May I see the bone? There was almost a reverence to her voice. He nodded. Why? She rested her chin on her knees. I have no memory of where I came from, or who my pack was. I know it's unlikely this bone will change that, but still, it is a part of our species, which makes it a part of my history, too. Her gaze locked with his. Is it wrong to want to know who I am? No, not at all. He couldn't imagine it. His upbringing was nothing out of the ordinary, but it stitched together who he was. If you share what you do remember, we might be able to find some clues. It's my turn to ask why, she whispered. Why does he want to help me? Why wouldn't I? His irritation returned. No matter what you think, we're not enemies. You've become part of the pack. One more reluctant member. But there was more to it than that. Whether she was significant to the pack or not, she was to him. Each day, another thread seemed to tie them together. It was unnerving as hell. 
You know, packs don't work that way, Hollis. I'm simply a guest who's stayed too long, she paused, chewing her lower lip. Is it my turn? Her quick dismissal stung. While he was trying to make sense of the hold she had on him, she seemed completely unaffected by him, save attraction. She wanted his body, but not him. His thirst for knowledge took a nosedive. I'm not sure. Then it's my turn, she smiled. If you want me in your pack, why not take me to bed? His almost abated erection stirred. Damn her. He shook his head, his frustration bubbling up. Now that she'd figured out she was his weakness, she'd be more exhausting than ever. She nudged his knee with her bare toes. Don't go mute now. I told you to pick a different topic. He glared at her. From the sultry rasp of her voice to the open invitation in her eyes, she was playing with fire. Surely she knew that. You wear anger well. Her foot slid into his lap. He stared down at her foot. Even covered in tiny scars, her skin was silk under his fingers. When she flexed, the bones of her ankle and foot seemed fragile. But a fragile person wouldn't have survived the abuse she'd experienced. She knew what pain was. Suffered God knows what. An uneven scar ran along the outside of her calf. His thumb smoothed the raised white line. Who did this to you? She would have snatched her foot away if he hadn't held it in his lap. It's my turn. Tell me. The words tore from his chest, broken and raw and furious. Let go. Gone was the playful teasing. In its place was brittle fury. Cyrus, he pushed. Byron, who? She tried to pull away again, but he held tight. Let me go, Hollis, her voice wavered. You wanted to play this game. Answer me. He knew he should stop. There was panic in her eyes and pain. But the roar of blood in his ears and a veil of red clouded his vision. All that mattered was her answer. He had to know, had to act. Tell me, Ellen, so I can kill him. Ellen froze, her gaze locking with his. Her forehead creased. A deep, unsteady breath spilled into the quiet of the cabin. Would you? She whispered. He let go of her ankle then, shame burning his palm and pressing in on his chest. What the hell was wrong with him? He didn't want to restrain her or put pain or fear in her eyes. He would have pushed out of the chair if she hadn't climbed into his lap. Her head fit against his shoulder, the short wisps of her silken black hair brushing his chin. She pressed as close as possible, twisting until the beat of her heart thudded against his chest, against his own heart. The tip of her nose brushed his throat as she sighed. His arms wrapped around her. This was right. It soothed him to hold her. And scared the shit out of him. You make me lose control, he murmured against her temple. You can lose control with me, she whispered, burying her face against the side of his neck. Ellen stared around the lab, shock and awe rendering her speechless. If Finn and Hollis used their money on things like weapons and defense instead of planes and vaccines, the others wouldn't stand a chance. How could Cyrus compete with such resources? You could defeat them, she said. Hollis glanced up from the chart he was reading aloud to her. What? Look around you. Think of the weapons you could create, the men you could hire to hunt them. Your pack would be unstoppable. She stared at him, saw the confusion on his face, and tried again. I understand you do important work here. She took the chart from him, scanning over the pages and pages of charts and numbers that made her head spin. I would never ask you to give that up, but defeat the others and you can come back to it, Hollis. Once they are gone, there is nothing to stop you from doing what you want. She sighed, shaking her head. You disappoint me. He sat on the stool at her side, taking the file from her hand. Because I'd rather cure... You think they will leave you alone when this is cured? That he'll care you're no longer wolves? She frowned. You're not a stupid man, Hollis. Think. He frowned back at her. What threat would we be to him then? You'd know he existed, that this world existed. 
and you'd have beaten him by surviving and escaping. She touched his cheek. Her wolf loved touching him. He'll never let you live. Once you're cured, you'll be that much easier to kill. Didn't he understand? They could stop this. Once he is gone, your lives, as wolves, would be forever changed. There would be nothing to run from, Hollis. You and your pack would be safe. This cure won't save your pack. Only killing Cyrus can do that. His hand covered hers. Those green, green eyes searched hers until her body thrummed with need. Dr. Robbins. A woman in a white lab coat came in, carrying a stack of files and papers. You wanted the latest results? She paused, watching Ellen as she pulled away from Hollis's touch. The way the woman looked at Hollis made her wolf bristle. And that the human dared to look her up and down? Her wolf longed to put the woman in her place. Her hands fisted at her side as she stared at the woman, but Hollis clasped her wrist, his tone calm as he murmured, Thank you, Kim. You can leave them on my desk. Kim glanced between them with a nod, then left them. Kim should learn her place, she snapped. She's my administrative assistant, Hollis explained. That is her place. Here, in the lab. I don't like her, she pushed, tugging her arm from his. Hollis's chuckle surprised her. <laughs> She's very capable. His casual declaration made her temper flare. How nice for you. Why was she reacting this way? The woman was weak, vulnerable, and unaware of their world. Hollis didn't look at Kim the way he looked at her. He didn't burn for her. But perhaps Hollis wanted that. Someone who wasn't her. If he did cure them, he could live a normal human life with someone capable and pretty, like Kim. Perhaps I should go to the hotel while you finish your work here. She wrapped her arms around her waist. Is that what you want? He asked, sliding off the stool and standing before her. All of these resources available to you, and you'd rather sit at my place? Hotel. You live in a hotel. She'd never heard of such a thing. A hotel was a luxury, not a lifestyle. I don't understand you at all. It's convenient for my hectic lifestyle. His gaze was fixed on her. You don't want to stay? I never wanted to come, she reminded him, hearing the petulance in her voice and hating it. How could she explain how out of her element she felt? Vulnerability was a weakness she refused to entertain. This world is not mine. He studied her. You wanted to see the bone. She stared at him. The bone? The bone? It's here? He pulled a key card from his pocket and led her to a door in the far wall of the lab. Through here, he said, inserting the key card, then punching in the code to open the door. All of my unconventional research is kept in the vault. Unconventional? she asked, following him through the door. She stopped inside, the hum of energy that greeted her unexpected. Things no one else has access to. I've been collecting items since we were changed, he said, flipping on the muted overhead lighting. Some of the artifacts are quite old. The ground seemed to sway under her feet. A low vibration began on the soles of her feet, shimmied up her legs, past her knees, and settled into her torso. She pressed herself against the wall at her back, fighting back the panic that sank deep into her stomach. Closing her eyes didn't help as much as she'd like, but the room was no longer spinning. The sound was still there, a noise that made her head ache and her teeth chatter. Hollis, her voice shook. Hollis's hands gripped her upper arms, warm, steady, keeping her upright when she would have easily slid to the floor. She stepped forward, sliding her arms around him and allowing his heat to warm her through. Talk to me, he murmured against her temple. Noise. Dizzy, she swallowed. Too much. He opened the door and dragged her back out. Sit, he said, gently pushing her down into a large leather office chair. I'll get you some water. She rested her head on the chair back and waited, breathing easier as the sensations slowly ebbed. Sweat dripped down her back, pearled on her upper lip, and made her palms clammy. Here, he said, placing a tall glass in front of her. She drank it all down, taking the wet paper towels he offered to cool her heated skin. What was that? 
He pulled a chair close to hers, then sat facing her. What should she tell him? Whatever you tell me stays between us, he said, taking her hand. Then is your alpha, her voice wobbled. He smoothed the plastered strands of hair from her face. He's never used that against me, never demanded I tell him something. There's no reason that would change now. He leaned forward, tilting her face so he could examine her. Your eyes are dilated, you're pale. Accelerated heartbeat and respirations. You were like this before, in the clearing. Not like this, she argued. I've never experienced anything like this. You see things? He asked softly. She nodded. Through touch? He asked. Yes, normally. But I didn't touch anything just then, she argued, the panic crushing in on her. Even her wolf was unsettled. I couldn't see or hear beyond the noise. The room was moving. What noise? What did you hear? He asked. Voices? Sounds? A crowded room. She gripped her head in her hands, pressing. It hurt. How does it normally work? He asked. I touch them, read them, their thoughts and memories, experiences and conversations. She looked at him, almost nervous. Only Cyrus knew. It was one of the reasons she was still alive. How would her revelation impact Hollis? People only, he asked. Never an object? She shook her head. Objects, yes. Personal items, handmade or, or a journal. An object that has captured the essence of a person. A book, a knife, important to a person or ritual. Magical items. I've dreamed of others. A necklace once. It was important to me. He sat back, still studying her. The items in that room? They're speaking to you? She stared at him, far too unsettled for her liking. That's never happened before. I have to touch and concentrate. This, this was too much. Her stomach turned, a powerful thud setting in at the base of her skull. What would she find in that room? Did she want to know? I, I want to leave. You could help me understand things I've been researching for years, he murmured. Things beyond science. Things that could help the pack. The pack or your cure? She sat back in her chair, mimicking his posture. He blew out a slow breath. One doesn't forego the other. I won't help you eradicate what I am. Exhaustion made arguing pointless. I can't go back in that room. I could bring items to you, one at a time, he asked. You want to know what happened just now, what it means. Do I? He nodded and pushed out of his chair. He returned seconds later, her water glass refilled. Tell me about the necklace. Who did it belong to? She took a sip, her gaze falling from his. My pack. The women of my pack. It was a record of our lineage, a badge of pride, really, she smiled. A bead for each child birthed. We were a mighty pack. She ran her fingers along the invisible necklace, remembering the weight and texture of each stone. Faces, names, fragments of time lost to me now. Smiling children, tiny babies, her baby. Her heart twisted sharply. The necklace and the memories. So faint now. She would never forget her daughter. Never. What happened to your pack, he asked. That's when this happened. She pressed a hand against her scar. I can't know for sure, but Cyrus was there. Her finger traced the rim of a cup. He's taken everything that mattered for me. Everything. She welcomed the fury, preferring the familiar heat. Whatever was in that room was powerful, drowning her in unease. The glass in her hands trembled. Hollis took the cup from her and placed it on the desk. He cradled her hands in his, staring at them with such intensity. Ellen held her breath. I have questions I want to ask you, he murmured. So many things I want to know. His green gaze met hers. But I don't want to cause you pain. She swallowed back the hostile retort that instantly sprang to her lips. It was a survival skill. 
deflect and minimize. But this was Hollis. His concern was sincere. And knowing that, seeing that, had a powerful effect on her. Her hands itched to touch him, to read his thoughts for more. He was so like her, so guarded and wary. Opening up wasn't easy for either of them. Still, she needed to try. Her wolf needed it. I'm used to pain, Hollis. It's kept me alive for so long I wouldn't know how to exist without it. His brow furrowed. That's not living. His hands tightened around hers. You've seen things, know things, I never will. Dark things, evil things. He cleared his throat. That is why I refuse to accept this world. Help me to understand why preserving this life is so important to you. There was an edge to his words, desperation, anger, the promise of so much more. The longer his green gaze locked with hers, the harder it was to breathe. Why, Hollis? What difference does it make to you? Chapter 12 He forced the words out. Maybe you're right, he ground out, about a wolf. He cleared his throat. Having a wolf. It was the only way to explain what was happening to him. Too many times his control had slipped away from him. With her. This was the only thing that made sense. That what was happening between them made sense, and it scared the shit out of him. She searched his face. And you want to understand him? That was part of it. A small part of it. But it was the easiest place to start. It would be better to keep this as straightforward as possible. For both of them. Yes, he ground out. Her gaze swept the laboratory. Before you try to wipe him out, she whispered. So you can take notes, complete spreadsheets, and draw your conclusions prior to cutting out half of what you are? You've been so careful to keep him locked up inside. Now you want me to help you draw him out? Why? Frustration rose up. What choice do I have? Do I want to be a fucking monster? Hell no, none of us do. He looked at her, holding nothing back. But the antidote development is going nowhere. If I can't cure us, the only other option I have is protecting them. She stared at him, silent for a long time. You could help me. Help you? Is that why you brought me here? To test your antigen on me? To cure me? Her words were flat. If it kills me, at least I'd die for something you believe in. She frowned up at him. Versus something worth dying for. You can't believe that. The vein in his head throbbed, tightening. You don't believe that? No? She asked. You are too important to me. What the fuck did that mean? He wasn't sure. And the look on her face told him she wasn't happy with his response either. Her brows rose. Because I have answers you want? She whispered, pulling her hands from him. Yes. You know things I don't. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that doesn't matter. It does. He cleared his throat. It's more. And you know it. You feel it. I'm supposed to be happy about the connection that's forming between us? That having a weakness is okay? He countered, refusing to give in to her. This was ridiculous. He would keep on fighting for both their sakes, even if she didn't approve. I am not your weakness, her eyes narrowed. You fight what you are. You deny your instincts and your power. That is your weakness. What is between us would make both of us stronger. Her words rolled over him, tempting him. She had no idea how she made him feel. She saw him as she wanted him to be. A wolf. Damn her, but she made him want it. All of it. The mate, the wolf, the pack her at his side? It was right. Strong and vital. He pushed out of his chair, furious with himself. And her. It's that easy? I get into this and everything will make sense? You believe that? She was on her feet, eyes flaming and hands fisted tightly. You stupid man. Give in? My mate would see me as a prize, not a burden to be endured. God but her fury was glorious. 
His gaze lingered on the scar, bracketing her left eye, tattooed with a crescent moon, the only scar on her face. He wanted to trace the scar, kiss the corner of her eye, slide his fingers through her short, silky locks, and let her scent drown him. It was all he wanted. Now. You insult me, then stand silently staring? Her anger only fueled his hunger. That was not my intent, he managed, stepping closer. You push and push. She braced herself against his chest. Because you are a fool. His hands gripped her wrists, the thrum of her pulse beneath his fingertips, her scent wrapping around him. I am, he ground out, before crushing her against him. He released her wrists to clutch her hips. There was nothing hesitant about him. The need to have her wound about him was all that mattered. You think I'd have you now? She raged, wriggling against him. You cannot have me. She pushed out of his hold. You don't deserve me. He released her, instantly stepping back. She was right. He didn't deserve her. There had been panic in her eyes, fear, and it unleashed a tidal wave of self-loathing. Whatever sensations she experienced with him, fear wouldn't be one of them. I want to leave. I'll call Mal, he managed, feeling like an ass. They'd formed some sort of truce on the flight there, one he'd shattered in the span on five minutes. She rattled him, deeply, stirring shit that he wasn't prepared for. The need to touch her, the blinding sense of ownership. What the fuck was that about? He didn't know how or why she was tied to all of this. Items that spoke to her, items he'd collected, undeniably drawn to over the years. Somehow he'd known they were important. It was getting harder to dismiss her whole fate theory as a pile of shit when everything seemed to indicate she was right. They were, in some weird cosmic way, together for a purpose. Could he buy into that? Accept that she was essential to his wolf and to him? He cleared his throat. I've got some work to do here before I can leave. She nodded, tearing her gaze from his and turning her attention to the specimens that lined every shelf and counter space in the lab. He texted Mal, then sat at his desk, straightening the piles of paper with unsteady hands. The numbers and notations on the page were blurred, his attempts to focus failing. What would she do if she knew what he was thinking? That she'd broken through his resistance and made him feel something for her? Tomorrow, she said, coming to stand by his desk, one item at a time. He drew in a deep breath, her scent sweet torture before looking up at her. It's your choice, Ellen. It's not my place to push. Tomorrow, she repeated, her eyes searching his. He nodded, his throat tight. In time, perhaps I can filter through all the noise, but not yet. Her gaze was fixed on the door, thoughtful. You're not the only one with questions. Because she had no memory of her life before her head trauma. If he was curious about her past... He could only imagine how she felt. His drive to cure the pack paled beside her need for vengeance, but vengeance was dangerous, especially when it required going against someone like Cyrus. She knew more than anyone what he was capable of, but she was too blinded by fury to recognize her efforts alone couldn't defeat him. She was strong. She'd survived so much, but this time she didn't need to face him alone. His hands fisted against his legs. Let me help you. She glared at him. Us, he corrected. Us, she asked. Finn's pack? She shook her head. I have nothing to lose. They have everything. He stood slowly, taking pains to appear calm and rational. Your life isn't nothing, Ellen. I'm not sure one person, one wolf, can stop Cyrus or the evil of his pack. Cyrus is the evil. His pack is loyal and they follow their alpha. But when he is gone, they will look to and follow another. It might take time, but I believe Finn will be that leader. She spoke with such certainty he almost believed her. We are guardians, Hollis, protectors. We have the ability to do great things. Cyrus's corruption has affected his wolves, making them weak. 
When he is gone, the wolves will recover. He studied her, wanting to believe her. Was it really that easy? Kill him and remove the threat? Since Cyrus had learned of their existence, he'd been relentless in his torment. She walked away from him, staring around the lab again, shifting from foot to foot. Her gaze wandered to the door of the vault, and she shivered. Is Mal coming? A quick glance at his phone told him they were on the way. He's coming. Meaning she would be leaving, and he could concentrate on the work he'd come here for in the first place. So why wasn't he relieved? She nodded and paced the length of the lab several times. There's only one window, she frowned at him. It makes me sad. He glanced around the sterile white walls, high ceilings, and fluorescent lights. It's a lab. It's cold, she shook her head. I'll wait outside. He let her out, acknowledging co-workers with a nod, a quick word, or handshake. Ellen hung back, unwilling to engage in small talk or polite introductions. She seemed more agitated and uncertain than usual, her posture defensive and her expression forbidding. When they stood on steps leading to the parking lot, he looked at her. Words failed him, so they stood silently, considering the asphalt parking lot and ocean of employee cars. The black SUV they were using turned into the parking lot and down the main drive. Perhaps you're right. Maybe fate doesn't exist. Maybe the life we were meant to live together is pure fiction and your cure will save your pack. Maybe Cyrus will leave you all alone so you can live, happy and uncomplicated and human. She spoke softly, eyes trained on the SUV as it headed their way. If you need to believe that your path is the only way, I won't stand in your way. But my path is set, and neither you nor Finn will stop me from doing what must be done. Her gaze met his briefly before she climbed into the SUV. It's so hot. Ellen downed the rest of her sticky, sweet, melted drink and fanned herself with her napkin. Even with the sun long gone and a light breeze blowing, sweat trickled down her back and between her breasts. <laughs> it's Texas, Mal answered, laughing. You've been stuck on the refuge too long. Montana's weather is cooler. And less crowded. She stared around the festive hotel courtyard, her senses on high alert. Anders had assured Mal and Olivia there had been no others sighted in Texas for weeks, but she couldn't relax. She signaled for another margarita and turned away from Mal and Olivia, who were wrapped up in each other, as mates should be. She didn't want to think about Hollis, still working in the big, cold building with his name on it. She didn't want to think about his research, or his need to erase what they were, so he could classify and category things into neat little boxes. But how could she ignore the truth? Even her wolf was considering defeat. Mate or not, he'd never give in to her or the future they could have together. It hurt. She hurt. From Hollis and the vault's unfiltered emotions, which had literally knocked her off her feet. She shuddered, her ears and head aching vaguely. Whatever was in that room contained powerful magic. Hollis might not understand it, but he was right to keep the room locked up. But now that she knew of its existence, now that she'd had time to accept what was inside, she hungered to explore it. Voices, people familiar and unknown, places long forgotten. She'd been too blindsided to make sense when it was happening. But now, with her mind clear, she was able to sort through some of what had reached her in the seconds she'd been in that room. Ellen? Olivia interrupted her thoughts. Was Hollis's lab all you thought it would be? It was big, white, and cold. She stirred her margarita with a funny little green plastic stick topped with a parrot. I was not impressed. Mal laughed. <laughs> Don't tell him that. No man wants to hear he left his woman unimpressed. I am not his woman, she growled back. Mal shot her a curious look. Here I thought you were going to bring the wolf out of him. That is his choice. Her irritation increased, so she downed the entirety of her margarita. One I will play no part in. You look so pretty, Olivia said. Ellen scowled at her. If you say so. Olivia had insisted she'd feel better if she pampered herself and showed Hollis what he was missing. Which had meant an endless afternoon of shopping. 
Olivia had loaded her down with underwear and bras, things Ellen avoided wearing as much as possible. After a few glasses of wine, she'd let Olivia drag her to the salon. Her hair was trimmed and styled, and her face had been painted. Never in her life had she felt so ridiculous. And yet there was no denying the responses of the men present. She couldn't decide if she liked it or not, to have so many eyes fixed on her. Ellen, Olivia whispered, looks like someone's going to be brave. You can't kill anyone here, Mal reminded her. Dance, a man asked. A very tall, fit, handsome man. He was smiling down at her, the glint in his eye, telling her what he was really after. The dance was just the beginning. Ellen slammed her glass down and stood. A dance, only. He grinned and took her hand. His touch was unsettling. Her wolf didn't like it. At all. Not that her wolf was in charge. No, if she were, she'd be pining for Hollis, wondering where he was now. Was he with Kim? Working late? Poring over artifacts in the hopes he could cure them and save the world? Stupid foolish man. You're hot, the man said. Seriously hot. It's hot outside, she stared at him. He laughed. <laughs> Fine, right, you're gorgeous. She smiled. That is a compliment. Thank you. The music pulsed and the strands of brightly colored lights weaved back and forth over the courtyard, swayed in time. She closed her eyes, giving in to the rhythm and the need to move. Today had been a test. The airplane, no shifting, the lab, and now this. People, bras, dancing. And a strange man's hands on her body. Strong hands, sliding along her back. The scrap of material that made up Olivia's dress choice left little to the imagination. She'd been shy of her scars, but no longer cared. He clearly didn't mind. No, the pure appreciation on his face made her smile. What's your name? he asked. Ellen, you? Dave. His eyes slid down her neck to her breasts. Breasts that looked undeniably perky in the black lace bra Olivia had insisted she buy. Damn, he ground out. She shook her head. From his scent, he wanted to take her to bed. And while the drinks and music had taken the edge off her temper, she knew better than to think this Dave could ever satisfy her. Not that her wolf would give him the chance. She was pushing to get out, to scare poor Dave far, far away. But she wasn't going to be ruled by her wolf tonight. Or her sad attachment to a man who didn't want them. Dave wanted her. The lust in his eyes was promising and exhilarating. There was no reason she couldn't enjoy his company a little while longer. Chapter 13 Hollis rolled the shirt sleeves of his white Oxford to his elbows. He was tired. And pissed. He had expected to eat at the hotel and work things out with Ellen. They needed to talk. To be rational. And to not let their emotions get in the way. Instead, he'd walked into his suite to find a note from Mal telling him where they were. What he had to say was for Ellen alone. Without audiences, or Mal's I-told-you-so grin. He'd spent the afternoon reconciling trial data and developing a testing strategy going forward. But he'd been too distracted to trust himself, so he rechecked his work and then handed it off to Kim for a final review. If he hadn't trusted his team, this would be harder. As it was, he gave up and left it in their capable hands. If they needed him, they'd call. What mattered now was this. Ellen. He didn't know what came next or how the fuck it would play out, but he couldn't let her go. Period. If she needed Cyrus's head on a fucking platter, he'd figure it out. But right now, Cyrus, the others, the pack, and the cure could all wait. He moved through the lobby and out the back doors to the courtyard. Music greeted him. Music, people, and the smell of beer. This was the last thing he wanted right now. Pushing through the crowd, he spied Mal and Olivia at a far table. They leaned close, heads together, smiling and whispering. He frowned, sweeping the crowd for Ellen. It would be all too easy to slip away from a place like this. God knows Olivia and Mal weren't paying any attention to anything but each other. 
He stalked across the courtyard and scowled down at Mal. Where is she? He snapped. If you've lost her, Finn will lose it. Mal sat back in his chair. Finn will lose it? He shook his head. I'm not playing with you, Mal. He'd never wanted to punch his friend before, but now it took everything he had to hold back. She's fine, Olivia sounded off. She's dancing, she pointed. Hollis spun, searching the crowd. Ellen was in a dress, her graceful limbs swaying to the beat of the music. Eyes closed, head back. She was lost. Beautiful. So fucking beautiful, he ached. But when the son of a bitch dancing behind her put his hands on her hips, Hollis saw red. Easy, Mal whispered. She's just dancing. The words were barely audible, muffled beneath the roar of his blood. The roar of something raw and angry and primal. Jesus, Hollis, Mal stood, his hand clamping on his shoulder. Keep it together, no scenes. Hollis knocked Mal's hand from his shoulder and headed straight for her. If the man didn't stop touching her soon, he didn't know what would happen. Dude, the man said, we're dancing. Hollis didn't bother looking at the man. He stared at Ellen, his control slipping away. Words rose up and lodged in his throat. Angry words, pleading words. But nothing was enough. Nothing was right. Ellen's eyes popped open wide as she stared at him. Hollis? She can dance with you next, the asshole with his hand still on Ellen's hip mouthed off. Hollis didn't try to hide his rage. It was impossible. All he could do was stare at the man and imagine how easy it would be to rip his arm off and remove his hand from Ellen. A low growl came from the back of his throat. She was his. The man stepped back, no longer touching her. Her eyes locked with his, then fell to his mouth, a hard shudder racking her body. Hollis grabbed her hand and tugged her behind him. Through the crowd, past the lobby and into the nearly full elevator. She stared up at him, flushed cheeks and breathing hard, her hands gripping his shirt. He stooped, running his nose along her neck. Her scent, arousal and sweat, made him groan against her throat. Her hand slid up, grasped his neck, and pulled his head to hers. It was a soft kiss, clinging just long enough to snip one of the few remaining threads of his control. He ignored the cleared throats and whispers of the others in the elevator. Her fingers twined in his hair, tugging until his gaze met hers. Her hunger gripped him by the throat and made breathing impossible. They reached their floor and she slipped out first, smiling at him over her shoulder. He followed, struggling not to chase after her. Instead, he took his time, studying the sweep of her ass in that tiny little green dress long legs, an almost bare back, and the strap of a black lace bra. She leaned against the doorframe, waiting as he fumbled with the key card in the slot. Her hand covered his, taking the card and placing his hand against her stomach. She lingered, waiting for him to move into her before opening the door, putting space between them again. The door shut behind them, sealing them in his suite. In silence. He stared at her, listening to the rapid thrum of her heart and the quiver of her breath. She was his. There was no doubt or hesitation. It was a fact, as natural as breathing. He walked down the hall, unbuttoning his shirt and then tugging it from the waistband of his pants. She followed, watching him, staring at his chest as he carefully closed the bedroom door. She sat on the edge of the bed, her hands fisting in the comforter, all fire and anticipation. He stared at her, struck by how incredible she was. Woman, undeniably. Fierce and sexy as hell. And his. He closed the distance between them, running his fingers up the column of her throat and along the curve of her cheek. She stared up at him, breathing heavy, but not touching him. When his thumb swept across her lower lip, she sucked the tip into her mouth, and something inside flared and caught fire. 
he bore her back onto the bed, impatient to touch every inch of her. The muscle of her calves, the bend of her knee, and the silk of her thighs. Her breathing hitched as his fingers slid higher, tracing the lacy edge of her panties. Still, she didn't look away. He didn't want her to. He edged the lace aside and traced the seam of her body with hungry fingers. Her legs parted, and she reached out for him. She wanted him, ached for him, the way he ached for her. His thumb flicked her tightened up once, twice, eliciting the sweetest moan from her lips. He slid one finger inside of her, soaking in her every reaction. The feel of her clamping down on his finger, the shudder in her thighs, the glazed passion in her eyes. She gripped his arm, holding his hand between her legs, and stared up at him, panting. Damn it, he ground out. One tug tore her panties free. His hands slid the fabric of her dress up, revealing her abdomen and the prize between her legs. Scars crisscrossed every inch of her. Faint, flat, white, so many. Where had he been when this happened to her? Why hadn't he been there to protect her? He'd kill Cyrus for this, no matter what. Ownership rose up. She was his now, and no one would ever lay a hand on her again. Ever. His hand stroked across her stomach and up her side. Sensation was all that mattered. And pleasure. Her pleasure. Whatever her past, her future was his. He'd make damn sure he'd put her first, starting now. He kissed along the blade of her hip, ran his nose along the crease of her thigh, and replaced his thumb with his tongue. Honey on his tongue, wet and ready for him. Teeth and lips and mouth, he worshipped her until her hands fisted in his hair and her cry echoed off the walls of his hotel room. He stood, staring down at the image she made. Dress tossed around her waist, naked and exposed and sexy as hell. He traced a hand along her abdomen, gratified by the shudder his touch caused. She rolled over, reaching up for the tab of her zipper. He bent, pressing open-mouthed kisses to her bare back as he slowly pulled her zipper down. His hands stroked the swell of her ass, the muscles of her thighs. Lips, then tongue, traced the valley between her shoulders and nuzzled the nape of her neck. The taste of sweat... Salt and Ellen had his dick pulsing against the seam of his pants. She turned, reaching back to grip his neck. He freed her bra strap, his hands cupping her breasts from behind. Fuck, he growled, the feel of her in his hands too much. He bit her shoulder, pressing his straining erection against the curve of her soft ass. She was naked. His pants were definitely in the way but letting go of her held no appeal. She rolled over and pushed him back onto the bed. His pants were gone in a matter of minutes, and Ellen was smiling down at him. She put his hands on her breasts, rolling the tips between her own fingers until he was groaning. Her hand encircled his aching erection, her fingers tracing the length of him, pulling a broken moan from his chest. Every stroke had him stiffening, arching into her hand, and when her lips sucked the head of his throbbing dick into the heat of her mouth, Hollis roared. She smiled up at him, her hands and mouth leading him too close to his own release. Ellen, he whispered, reaching for her. She straddled him, her fingers offering one last stroke before she slid ever so slowly onto his rock-hard dick. His hands tightened on her, kneading the soft skin of her breasts, as he was enveloped deep inside of her. So tight, so hot, gloving him to the root. She stilled then, balancing herself with one hand on his chest. She moaned, then whispered his name, broken and frantic and desperate. He stroked the hair from her face so he could watch her, to see everything. Their gazes locked, her breath hitched, and a powerful shudder racked her body, and his. 
Alan, he whispered, pressing his hand against her cheek. She rocks gently, her eyes closing when he was buried deep. The words tore from him before he knew what he was saying. Say it, he growled, his fingers biting into her hips. She stared down at him, her eyes blazing into his. I'm yours. Her nails scoured along his chest. And you are mine. He thrust up, his hands holding her tightly against him. He loved the groan she made, loved the way she arched forward so he could suck her nipple into his mouth. Loved the way her body tightened around him, hungry for him. Mine. He didn't say it, but she knew. She moved then, thrusting slowly, deeply, seating herself on him again and again. His hands slid along her sides, cupping her breasts, working her nipples, before gripping her hips once more. He was driven, grinding her against him, binding her close, them close. He wanted her to fall apart, to scream his name. He needed it, now. He reached between them, one finger stroking and working her over until she cried out. Rough and raw, her nails bit into his chest and sent his release crashing into him. He came hard, powering into her, arching stiffly until the spasms began to fade. She fell to his side, gasping. He pulled her against him, the newness of their connection demanding no space between them. She didn't argue. Her head rested on his chest, her fingers stroking along his collarbone as she lay, soft and pliant against him. He lay still, his heart thundering and his mind spinning. This was not what he'd expected. The hunger was stronger now. So was the connection. He knew, without doubt, that she was irrevocably tied to him now. It was undeniable, and disconcerting as hell. Focus, calm. The beat of his heart echoed hers. Their breathing synced. The air grew charged, almost kinetic. Her hand ran over his chest, her nails toying with the sparse hair that covered his chest and raking his nipple. His hand captured hers, instantly hard by her touch. Those bewitching eyes of hers met his, on fire, for him. How could she do that? Turn him on with a look. He lifted his head and kissed her, hoping to shut down his brain before the reality of what had happened sank in. There was no going back, for either of them. Overthinking it, rationalizing it, arguing about it, wouldn't change a thing. There was no denying it. This proud warrior woman was now his mate, for all time. A tidal wave of thoughts, emotions, and feelings crashed into him, but one thing stood out. For the first time, maybe ever, he felt whole and strong. The look on her face made him fearless in a way he'd never known. Fearless, strong, predatory. She did that to him. Her wolf did that to him. Whatever shit came their way, they'd handle it, together. With a sigh, she melted against him, resting her head on his chest and threading her fingers with his. He closed his eyes, savoring the touch, this new, fragile intimacy. Images began to seep in, the sort of images that threatened the newfound warmth he'd found in her arms. Vibrant and sharp, snippets of conversations, sense and sensations. The bond was sealed in several ways. Mating, something they'd repeat shortly. Sharing memories. Life-changing, important, those that formed who they were and shaped their wolves. Finally, a shared mark. Ellen was a born wolf. She had no origination bite. The twinge of regret that stirred was quickly snuffed out when he realized she would bear his. One more scar. One more wound. His fault this time. Would she mind? The room, the bed, and the world around them faded, and he was living her memories. The more he saw, the closer he came to falling apart. He'd understood the concept, but this, 
the reality of what that meant? Fuck no. His heart was ripped open. There was no way to stop it, to buffer the brutality or make it easier to bear. There were no words to express the grief and suffering. She had a baby, a daughter. Ellen's whole world. Isabel. He felt her in his arms, knew her scent, and fought to keep her from Byron. He couldn't, of course. These were memories. And Ellen's screams when the lifeless body was returned to her broke something inside of him. Her mate, William, strong, a warrior, a proud man, easily baited into a fight. He'd refused to beg for her, refused to beg for Isabel. She'd been forced to watch as he'd been tortured, skinned as a wolf, and had his head chopped off. His hide still hung on Cyrus's wall, baiting Ellen, reminding her of William's last words. Avenge me. Avenge our daughter. He'd left her to bear that? Left her alone to face the monsters? Jesus Christ, he ground out, on sensory overload. He was there, trapped inside, drowning in the shitstorm of Ellen's past. It kept going. The feel of a bite, the slice of a blade. Beatings, being used by the pack. Byron, Cyrus, so much Cyrus. He treated her differently? Why? Biting her, covered in her blood, drinking it? His fucking smile. Rage kicked in. His rage. Hers. Her need for revenge was almost secondary to death. Almost. Death would be giving up. And she was a fighter. Now he knew where her scars came from. He'd never fucking forget, no matter how badly he wanted to. Cyrus. That smile. Motherfucker. Fury consumed him. He stared blindly at the ceiling overhead, fighting back nausea and hate. Lungs aching, fighting for air, fighting against the pressure on his chest. Heart twisting sharply, clamping down so tight he saw stars. Skin tingling, tightening, stretching until he knew it would split. The snap of bones. The tearing of muscle. His body seized, twisting, snapping and forcing a groan from deep inside. She lay sprawled across his chest, fulfilled and sleepy. Her wolf had chosen well. When bits and pieces of Hollis's life reached her, she welcomed them, getting lost in what she assumed it meant to be a human. The images swept her away. His life had been so different from hers. Not necessarily easier, just different. He'd had parents who adored him, but that hadn't made the bullying he'd endured any easier. Or eased the pain he still felt at losing his big brother, Sean, when his helicopter was shot down in Afghanistan. It had hit Hollis hard, prompting him to take a midterm trip with Finn and a few college buddies. That trip changed their lives forever. That trip was when Finn found the bone. The attack through Hollis's eyes was horrific. Finn was his best friend, the only person who'd accepted Hollis just as he was. To be attacked by him, to see Finn crazed, shifting, hunting down his friends through Hollis's eyes was nightmarish. Horrible. Hollis, Ellen whispered, tilting back to see him, needing to offer whatever comfort she could. One look told her he was gone. His body was here, but his mind not. Clouded eyes, clenched jaw, Harsh breathing. Something was wrong. His muscles began to spasm. Neck taut, corded, and strained. Head pressed back and jaw locked tight. Very wrong. Even his breath irregular and harsh. Hollis, she pleaded, shaking him. Her palms rested on his chest, invading his mind for answers. What was happening to him? What she saw. No. No. He knew. The realization slammed into her, enraging her, and stealing the calm of their mating. He knew. Her secrets. 
Her shame. Her past would haunt him forever. Nothing she did or said could erase it from his mind. A chill stole over her as his hands slid from her, grabbing fistfuls of the comforter as his body seized, the muscles clenching and tightening. Whatever they'd shared was tainted now. Her wolf slunk away, curling in on herself and leaving her to cope on her own. Fuck you too, she growled, sliding from the bed. He needs us. Stop being a coward. A strangled sound tore from his throat. The change? Even if it wasn't natural for their kind, could he survive it? There was nothing natural about the odd jut of his chin or how his eyes rolled back in his head. Alice, she ran a hand over his chest, refusing to give in to the panic of her wolf. The rasp of his breath was thick, choked. Damn it. The muscles of his chest continued to tense and roll beneath her touch. Listen to me, her voice was steady. Her shame, memories, and past didn't matter now. Not now. Only he did. His heart shuddered. Irregular. Rapid pulse. Too rapid. It's not real. None of it is real, she spoke softly. Can you hear me? His head turned toward her, but his body wasn't responding. Breathe. Softer. Almost a whisper. Tearing his hand free from the comforter, she pressed his hand against her chest. My heart. She leaned closer, running her nose along his temple. My scent. Her eyes were burning as she kissed his lips. You're here. Safe. With me. A ragged breath in. Deep. Then out. In. His eyelids fluttered, and then his body slumped against the mattress. Good, she murmured squeezing his hand. Slow. Be easy. She perched on the edge of the bed, hoping. It took time, but slowly, the hammering pulse in his throat grew steadier. His hand clasped her wrist, tightly. I'm here. Startled by the ferocity of his grip, and freaking the fuck out. But there. How did this work? This connection was unlike anything she'd had with William. They'd never shared memories that she remembered. Could he read her now that they were mated? Was it based on touch? If so, it would be best for him not to touch her. Not when her wolf was frantic, pacing, whimpering, fearful of losing him. He needed strength, not cowardice. Not that she was feeling strong at the moment. His gaze cleared, fixing on her, but his breathing remained unsteady, and the weight of his gaze was crushing. She eased her hand from his hold and stood, at a loss for what came next. The longer he lay there, staring at her, the more anxious she became. While his breathing steadied and his pulse returned to a non-life-threatening rate, she was fighting the urge to run, far, far away. I'm sorry. The words were raw. Sorry? She stiffened, glancing at him before pacing to the balcony. I do not want your pity. Her voice cracked, exposing the chasm of grief she grappled with daily. Silence stretched on, making her shift from foot to foot. He was watching her. She could feel it. But she couldn't face him. Not yet. Not unless she wanted him to see just how pitiful she truly was. Ellen, he growled. Stand tall, arms crossed, chin up. Ellen firmer, commanding, oddly desperate. It was a mistake, but she faced him anyway. The warring anger, sadness, frustration, and confusion lining his face didn't help. Deep inside, he fought a new battle, because of her. The muscle in his cheek jumped as he reached for her. Come here. It wasn't a request. Her wolf perked up instantly, refusing to deny him. Still standing by the bed, she hesitated. She waited. What he'd experienced was similar to her reading, only he'd experienced things no one should go through. All at once, with no warning. It was no wonder he'd reacted so strongly. Fear rolled over her. If she and William could choose to become mates, 
could Hollis choose to end their bond? Would she blame him if he did? How could he stay with her now? I... The muscles of his throat worked. I never... No. Her arms tightened around her waist. Why would you? And how could he bear to look at her now that he knew? A roar tore from his chest, primal, pure frustration and rage. This was not the way to answer the questions you've been waiting to ask, she whispered. But I couldn't, she broke off. Some things are best unsaid. You see that now. His eyes closed. I see a lot of things. A hard laugh followed. <laughs> like I'm a fucking asshole. I shouldn't have pushed you. It doesn't matter. It was hard not to reach for him. His touch had been the first to comfort her in so long. Right now, she wanted comforting. I can't erase what you've seen or make it easier to bear. Don't, Hollis sat up, his green eyes boring into hers. Make it easier for me to bear? He broke off, swinging his legs over the edge of the bed. Careful, she murmured, the image of him contorted and twitching all too fresh. He stood scowling. You don't have to be strong. Not with me. He didn't know what he was saying. Being weak wasn't an option. Being strong, angry, was her only option since she'd lost Isabel. Cyrus. Byron. The others. Weakness would have made the target on her back that much bigger. But words were impossible. A shake of the head was all she could manage. The muscle in his jaw clenched as he reached for her. His hands, warm on the back of her shoulders, pulling her closer. I've got you, Ellen, he whispered. Let go. Here. Now, in Hollis's arms, there was no target. I can't, she whispered, throat tight, painfully tight. You saw it. Felt it. What I've done. You. You fucking survived. The word was a rasp. He tilted her head back, his gaze blazing into hers. Cyrus. He tensed, his face flushing red and his breath kicking up. But his eyes. His wolf was looking back at her, pushing to come out. He doesn't deserve to live. His arms tightened, a low rumbling coming from deep in his chest. He was struggling for control, struggling against his wolf. A wolf that was ready to defend and protect her. If she needed protecting, which she didn't. His words were a growl. Seeing you in harm's way is more than I can take. So was watching you battle your wolf, she challenged. He shook his head. We're not going there. Not now. Fine. I'm not in harm's way. Not this time. Surely now he'd understand. Killing Cyrus was a vow she must honor. If I can get close enough, I can fulfill my promise. To William. I know. His nod was tight. I know. And I will help you. His hand gripped her chin. She shook her head. It was my promise. As much as I want to tear him to pieces for what he's done to you, I won't take that from you. His gaze pierced hers before he released her. Let me help you. Whatever you need. He meant it. Naked and glorious, his hands hot on her skin, the ferocity of his words, his gaze, chased away any lingering guilt or shame she and her wolf were grappling with. She wasn't alone anymore. If she hunted, she'd have a partner. He brushed the hair from her temple and leaned forward to breathe her in. The simple action that revealed so much. What do you need? Her wolf responded. His scent, his touch, his taste. Her wolf had very definite ideas about what they needed, and this time she agreed. Now? You, she whispered, tilting her head back for his mouth. She welcomed the crush of his lips on her, the taste of his skin, and urgency in his kiss. His fingers traced the outer swell of her breast, cradling the full weight in his palm 
as his thumb teased the tip into a hardened peak. She arched back in offering. He growled as his mouth captured her nipple. Hot and wet, his mouth devoured the sensitive skin. It was heaven. One breast, then the next. He licked and sucked until she was panting in his hold. He guided her back onto the bed, the magic of his mouth never leaving her body. On and on, he sucked and nipped until her body arched and swayed into him. She was just as hungry. The hard ridges of his chest and abdomen, the balls of his shoulder. Each rise and valley needed touching, kissing, exploring. The dip of his hips and swell of his ass. Her nails raked just enough to have him arching against her. The long, thick evidence of his arousal pressed against her belly. She parted for him. He slid deep, tearing a moan from them both. Mine, he whispered, as he bent forward to kiss her. Her laugh was cut short by the strength of his thrust. Over and over he drove into her, claiming her as his. The feel of him, big and thick and heavy, drove her into a frenzy. He lingered just long enough to tease her, nudging the bundle of nerves, coaxing her release, then sliding back. Bliss and the sweetest torture. He could do this for hours. She hoped he would. Her hands stroked the length of his back, marveling at the power of his body. Without the crisp shirts and starched slacks, he was primal perfection. All hers. Look at me, he ground out. She couldn't look away. Nostrils flared, jaw clenched, each breath more ragged than the last. He was holding back, driving her crazy, for her pleasure. She was close, so close. The friction and pressure, the heat in his gaze, the brush of his thumb and forefingers against her rock-hard nipple. She moaned, her fingers and nails biting into the curve of his ass. His lips brushed hers, his tongue sweeping the seam of her lips, and she was spinning and falling toward her release. Her body bowed, stiffening, clenching around him as wave after wave of undiluted pleasure washed over every nerve. He smiled, his hands brushing her hair from her forehead as he powered into her. Faster and harder, his teeth grazed her nipple, sucked the curve of her neck, while his hands lifted her hips. She moaned, his grip tilting her up, taking him deeper. She was coming again, so hard and fast she cried out over and over. Her lungs ached, and her body throbbed, and his rhythm never slowed. A growl ripped from his throat, low and raw. She shuddered with the power of it. He stiffened, holding her in place as his frame shook with his climax. Watching him come was liberating. Because he was her mate. Her wolf had craved him like no other. Now, even satisfied, the craving lingered. His gaze held hers, searching, piercing, before his body left hers. The absence of him was acute. Her wolf didn't like it demanding she roll into his side, demanding she place her hand on his chest, over his heart. She didn't. She and the wolf were partners, and right now, she, not the wolf, wasn't sure what to make of this man. Hollis was a man bent on denying his wolf, a man who would choose to eradicate their species from the planet. This is the man her wolf chose? Her gaze wandered, exploring the hard curves and planes of his incredible body. It, he, was an incredible specimen of pure masculinity. From the slight sheen of sweat that covered his chest to his tantalizing scent assaulting her senses, he held a power over her. Because he was her mate. His hair fell forward onto his forehead as he lay at her side. He lay facing her, one large hand gripping her shoulder and pulling her on to her side, to face him. This new Hollis was far more assertive, more aggressive. Part of her, the wolf especially, welcomed his strength and domination. But the other part, the one who had been alone and guarded for so long, bristled from his familiarity and confidence. You look pissed, one copper brow rose. 
Do I? Was she? Ready to rip my throat out? The corner of his mouth cocked up, making her insides clench delightfully. She would never hurt him. No. Since the idiot refused to connect with his wolf, she'd have to protect him. I have no plans to rip out your throat, she murmured, her gaze fixing on the column of his neck. His pulse beat steadily. She wanted to kiss the thrum under the skin, to taste his skin. It was maddening. I'll make no promises about biting. His jaw muscle leaped, his thumb tracing along her lower lip. If that was supposed to scare me, it doesn't. He slid his arm around her waist, pulling her against him so that his throbbing erection was pressed against her stomach. She stared up at him, startled. Already? The very hard, pulsing promise of further orgasms said yes. It's your wolf wanting to forge a solid bond, she whispered, her body ready, hungry. His eyes darkened and his hand gripped her thigh, hooking her leg around his hip. Forging a bond? He stared down at her, smiling. I'll forge all fucking night long. Her laugh broke off at the stroke of him, sliding deep inside her. Chapter 14 Cold water sluiced over his body, chilling his skin but not the heat in his blood. The shower jets pounded down on his back and chest, massaging his fatigued muscles with tiny ice-like needles of water. It was bracing, exactly what he needed. Her memories kept playing out in his brain, cycling through countless atrocities, images and sounds and pain. The only time it stopped was when she touched him. Being lost in her, buried in the mind-numbing tightness of her body, stopped all thought. But she was exhausted, and he wasn't a totally selfish ass, so he'd hoped a cold shower would snap him out of whatever the fuck this was. He had a mate? If he didn't feel it, no, know it, he'd laugh. But he did. Damn it. He did. And if he had a mate, he had a wolf. Fuck, he growled, tilting his face back under the water. Everything he was working for seemed empty now. After the attack, he'd clung to the belief that this was fixable. Now, he just didn't know. And Ellen? There wasn't a more complicated woman in existence. She was stubborn. Smart, yes, and undeniably sexy. But something inside of him had claimed her as his. Theirs. And there was nothing he could do about it. Nothing. It was done. Now he was forever tied to a woman who would hate him if he continued to pursue his work. He couldn't cure Ellen from being Ellen. He didn't want to. Did he? Fuck. He ground out again, resting his head against the tiles. What was he hoping? He'd take her to bed and suddenly her goals and wants would change? He might be having some sort of life-altering upheaval, but that didn't mean she was. No. Ellen's goals were the same. Maybe, deep down, he'd hoped she'd pick him over vengeance. But that was before. Now he understood. He'd seen what she'd been through. Fucking felt it. His skin twitched, seeking escape from a touch that wasn't there. Now he understood why her drive was so complete. She'd been to hell and back. If anyone had a right to vengeance, it was her. And damn it all, He'd make sure she had it. And his work? He blinked the water away. Did it matter? As unfamiliar as the urge to hunt was, he recognized it. How could he rest until the motherfucking bastard was annihilated? He couldn't. He wouldn't. She needed peace. They all needed peace. Deserved it. Pete had been so lost in his head, he didn't hear her until her hands were on his back. It's freezing, she stepped back, then squealed as the rear jets blasted her. He adjusted the temperature. I didn't hear you. Do you normally take Arctic showers? She asked, tentatively testing the water temperature. With a sigh, she stepped under the water. God, she was incredible. 
Water streamed over her body, dipping into her belly button, dripping from her nipples, coursing between her full breasts. He couldn't get enough of her. No, she asked, watching him. Yes? No, he rasped. But I can't seem to stop touching you. And since you wouldn't promise not to rip my throat out, I thought I'd give this a try. She stopped washing her hair, her eyes going wide. I'm your mate. You can touch me whenever you want to. Don't make promises you can't keep. I never do. Her chin lifted, just enough. I know. There was plenty of things they didn't know about each other, but her character wasn't in question. I saw a woman in your head. There was an edge to her voice. A very interesting, slightly amusing edge. But he knew better than to smile. She had long blonde hair, she continued. Green eyes. What about her? He poured shampoo into his hand and lathered up his hair. Hollis? Her tone alerted him. He took his time rinsing his hair, then looked at her. Ellen? She was gorgeous when she was angry. And she was angry. Who is she? She would have left the shower if he hadn't caught her and pulled her against him. The fire in her eyes was glorious and ridiculous, but it didn't stop him from smiling. Are you laughing at me? She hissed, her cheeks an alarming shade of red. Are you telling me you're jealous of my cousin? He asked. She frowned, relaxing against him. Abigail. She's a school teacher in Wisconsin. We were close when we were little, the same age. Her husband is an engineer. They have two kids. I get a Christmas card every year. What else would you like to know? His fingers skimmed along her spine. She pinched him hard. Ow! He arched away from her. What did I do? You're teasing me, she returned, less irritated but still hostile. I didn't think you'd give a crap about my cousin. In Wisconsin, he smiled at her. I'm still coming to terms with the fact that you were in my head. Her gaze fell from his, and his arms tightened around her. This childhood was fairly commonplace. No skeletons in the family closet. Until Finn's infection, life had been uneventful. Almost boring. He couldn't remember what boring meant. Her forehead rested against his chest. Your parents look kind. They are, he continued to stroke her back. And your brother? I'm sorry about your brother. She looked at him. He was important to you? He was. His smile was sad. He was a good brother. She cradled his face in her hands, her gaze growing thoughtful, intense, guarded. Stop overanalyzing this, he whispered. This? Coming from you? Her smile was hesitant. The irony isn't lost on me, he mumbled, watching the tip of her tongue slide along her full lower lip. Her even white teeth sank into the soft skin and she smiled. Distract me, she whispered. The urge to push her against the wall, sink his teeth into her lower lip and thrust hard into her. His lungs emptied and his body hardened, ready and willing, and it scared the shit out of him. He wasn't wired this way. He wasn't Mal. This whole wolf thing wouldn't dictate what he would or wouldn't do, even if he really wanted to do it. No more sex, he finished gruffly. Her mismatched eyes widened and her full lips pulled down. She was pouting? How could he refuse her? You're not enjoying yourself? She asked, her hands sliding over the curves of his ass to grip him hard. And just like that, he was rock hard and pressing against her stomach. She noticed. How could she not? Her sweet, excited smile had his resistance weakening. His hands ran up her sides to cup her full breasts. Her nipples hardened in invitation. I am. There's so much to enjoy. She arched into his touch, reaching down to slide her fingers along his dick. You're massive. And mine to enjoy. He liked hearing her say that, calling him hers, which was a fucking surprise. His brows rose. And you like it? I do, she agreed, sliding her fingers along his shaft, gripping him and stroking him firmly. 
Her thumb traced the vein along the underside of his erection, then circled the crown. He jerked in her hand. Very, very much. She shimmied down his body and knelt on the heated tile floor. Before he had time to react, her lips surrounded him. Her eyes met his while she took him deep into the wet heat of her mouth. His hands braced himself against the shower walls, his legs tightened and clenched. She gripped him in one hand, allowing herself to pump him into her mouth with ease. Oh, fuck, he ground out, his head falling back against the wall. She growled, raking her nails down his thigh. Ellen, he bit out. Damn it. His hand cradled the back of her head. Her silky hair against his palm, the lick of her tongue around his shaft, the vibration of her growl along his dick. He groaned and stared down at her. Fuck, he said again. There was nothing as erotic as seeing him disappear between her lips. Her eyes were closed now, the light scrape of her teeth and the tightening of her grip on his erection making him throb and pulse in her mouth. He couldn't wait, or stop. Her eyes fluttered open as he came, watching as he arched into her, a broken groan tearing from his chest. He slumped against the wall, panting and weak, while Ellen stood, smiling victoriously in front of him. Clean yet? she asked, yawning and stretching like a cat, a very pleased with herself cat. Sleepy? he asked, slightly breathless. She nodded. Good. He was too. With any luck, he'd sleep out of pure exhaustion. He turned off the water, wrapped her in a towel, and led the way out of the shower stall. Five minutes later, they were crawling into his bed. Sleep, for now. She rolled onto her side and burrowed under the covers, but reached back for his hand. With a sigh, she placed it on her hip and relaxed. Hollis flipped off the bedside lamp and lay still. He concentrated on the beating of her heart the way her respirations grew longer and deeper, and the slight twitch she made as she slept. Peacefully. She was his responsibility now, whether she saw it that way or not. Whatever life had thrown at her, she'd survived. And now he'd make it damn sure nothing happened to her. The glimpse into her past had jump-started a primal instinct. Now the urge to protect ruled everything else. He stared down at Ellen, feasting on her as she slept. Here was his reason to fight. He owed it to her to acknowledge the wolf he'd caged inside himself. Ellen's past had brought the wolf raging to the surface. It had demanded justice, demanded violence. Hollis feared the beast would tear his way out of his body if his heart was strong enough. The wolf had retreated, and his body seized from the flood of endorphins. Then, nothing He'd need his wolf's help to beat Cyrus. Shifting might be impossible, but they'd find a way to make it work, for Ellen's sake. Now the wolf lurked in his mind, remaining silent after being so long ignored. She rolled over, her hand searching across the mattress for him. He smiled, lifting her hand and placing it on his stomach. With a sigh, she drifted back to sleep. He could still feel her on his fingers, Taste her on his tongue. All he wanted was to claim her. Rational thought and planning had taken a back seat to raw hunger and need. Losing control was new. She made it easy. He ran his hand down her back, watching the smile that creased her face. Even in sleep, she responded to him. That was all it took to make him throb with need again. He couldn't help it. Being buried inside of her was heaven. Nothing compared. Nothing. Nothing compared to the hell her memories had put him through either. He couldn't erase the image of Isabel from his mind. He'd held her, smelled her, known her, loved her as Ellen had. And when Ellen lost her, he'd shared her grief. It couldn't compare to what her mate had endured. He knew that, but it had damn near crippled him. William. Hollis didn't want to think about William. The man had left her to defend their child. He'd come back on the end of a chain to see Ellen, bleeding and injured, screaming over their lifeless daughter. He'd given her no words of comfort, 
asked for no forgiveness. No, the bastard had told her to avenge him. William had been proud and selfish, and Ellen had paid the price. What's the matter, she whispered, her face shadowed by the dark. Sorry, I woke you. Her fingers threaded with his. He shook his head, a hard knot of anger lodged in his throat. But one look told him she wouldn't let him off that easy. Thinking, your mate, William. She flinched and burrowed into his side. He was, no longer. You are very different men. William and I agreed to mate. Our wolves chose each other, unable to resist. His brows rose. Agreed? That's different than this. Us? She nodded. It is. You and I were fated, pulled together no matter how hard we resisted. Her hand pressed against his cheek. Our bond is natural and final. Maybe we should have resisted harder, he teased, kissing her palm. It would have made no difference. So you and William weren't like this, he asked, oddly pleased. No. In time we grew together, but our bond was formed to align the packs. Her breath hitched, and she paused before asking, Do you want to know this? Yes. Did he? Not that what he wanted mattered. Here in the dark, tangled up in her, might make it easier. What I remember is chopped up. You saw most of it. She rested her head on his chest. I have no way of knowing what, if any, of the images before William's death are real. He traced his fingers through her hair, running a finger along her scar. Do they change? What you see, I mean. Very little, she murmured, running a finger down his chest. I've often wondered if my wolf keeps things from me. She's very protective. But did that mean her wolf was hiding something worse than what he'd seen? She should protect you. Wolves do that, don't they? You tell me, her voice was low. You can't deny yours exists now, can you? I saw him. In your eyes. Pushing to get out. He shook his head. He knew very little about the wolf inside of him, except... He's protective of you. As he should be. Assure him I can take care of myself. But there was no bite to her words. But her words had him and his wolf, bracing for an argument. As brave and strong as she was, protecting her was non-negotiable. He knew that now. Neither of us doubt you can, but now you'll never have to. She burrowed closer, her hand splaying wide on his chest. I like that. Us. You've already accepted him. Her palm was warm. Why the image of her burned palms cropped up now was a mystery. But she was touching him, and he needed to know. Can you read me now? As close as he wanted them to be, it was unnerving to think of her getting into his head without his knowledge. She stiffened in his hold. Do you think I would do that to you? Without your consent? No, he whispered. Consent was important to her. And from what her hellish memories had revealed, consent had rarely played a role in her life with Cyrus and the others. His mind raced trucking through the sensory stimulus, broken conversations, and inescapable torment she'd suffered. One image, Cyrus, blood dripping from his mouth, smiling down at her. She'd hated him then, hated herself for the power she was giving him. What is it, she asked, her fingers gently grasping his chin and forcing him to see her. Your mind is wandering. There were times he wished he wasn't a scientist. Maybe then he could turn off the constant questions and the curiosity, the need for answers and truth, even when it wasn't what he wanted. But her reaction was unshakable. His wolf was prowling around, raging, for reasons Hollis didn't fully understand. Hollis, she whispered, tell me. Cyrus, he cleared his throat, hating the way her gaze fell from his. He... He did something to you. He did a great many things, she stiffened. I was of use to them, you see. First as a healer for the pack, 
then a potential mate when his pack began to weaken. I'd birthed a child. I could do it again, but I didn't. I couldn't, so he punished me. When he tired of that, he lent me to Byron, but he could never truly let me go or kill me. He needed my blood, her voice faltered, cracking. Coldness seeped into his blood, his bones. What do you mean? He turned on the lamp then, needing to see her. She blinked, shielding her face, blinking rapidly. Why did he need your blood? He pushed now. My blood makes him stronger. She couldn't look at him. That's why he wants Finn's children. They were born wolves. Their blood is pure, like mine. Jesus Christ, he ground out. What are you telling me? He ingested your blood? In the beginning, later with an IV. She slipped from the bed and walked to the window. I was collared, or I could have fought him. Silver, it burns. Her hand crept up, stroking her neck. He kept me weak. If I'd been stronger, I would have stopped him. He was up then, barely controlling his fury and spinning her to face him. You would have died. He tilted her head back, forcing her to look at him. You said we were fated. That means you survived for me. His forehead rested against hers. You can stop him now. Let me help you. She stared into his eyes for so long he worried he'd said something wrong. He was new to this, all of it. Talking, sharing, and feeling. And he suspected he was failing. Epically. Her hands slid up to cradle his face. You believe me? It was a whisper. Believe? A little? In magic? How could he not? It stood there, before him, and lived inside of him. Yes. Good. It's easier to fight for something you believe in. He'd never thought of himself as a fighter. Until now. But she was right. As hard as it was to know what he knew, it explained why she was so single-minded. If Ellen was taken from him... It was hard to breathe, to think, or pay attention to what she was saying. His wolf was up and pacing again, the drive to take Cyrus down now overruling everything else. Except the feel of her as she pressed herself closer to him. Soft, warm, inviting. His. Her mismatched eyes were studying him. He can never get his hands on the children. Ever. He nodded. Until Cyrus was dead, the pack needed to be on alert. He wasn't sure he could handle the answer, but knowing just how patient Cyrus could be was relevant. When did this happen, Ellen? How old would Isabel be? She stared at his chest. According to their death certificates, she died with her father in the San Francisco earthquake. April 18th, 1906. So many died that day. Cyrus must have been waiting for the perfect time. The chaos and devastation left behind ensured and no one would find mass casualties unusual. She stared up at him. My pack, I think, though I cannot be sure. All of them, William and Isabel too, were staying in a hotel that collapsed, killing all inside. His arms snaked around her then, holding her close. Holy fuck. The implications of what she said weren't lost on him. While his brain ticked off a list of questions that included how long she'd been alive and how her blood strengthened Cyrus, a less rational part of him wanted action. Violence against the motherfucker who'd done so much to her. 1906? She'd been Cyrus's captive ever since. A vice clamped down on his heart before it thundered wildly, endorphins and adrenaline kicking it into overdrive but her reaction to the vault made sense. Half of the artifacts he'd collected came from the remains of a purported witch's coven that was destroyed in the San Francisco quake. He'd almost passed the wooden chest up. Almost. But something about it had held his attention until he'd carried it out. Now everything clicked into place. The beaded necklace. He knew with absolute certainty that it was the one she'd mentioned. Her pack's story her forgotten history. 
what he'd found was for her. It was hard to wrap his head around what was happening. He didn't need more evidence of her magic, more proof that she was right about everything. Denying it? Impossible. They were fated to be together. A new thrum, hot and wild, flooded his blood. This time he didn't ignore what it was. No, who it was. It was his wolf, and it was time the two of them came to an understanding. She woke to a new world, a far more complicated world than the one in which she'd fallen asleep. And the man beside her? Pleasure wasn't something she remembered well. Her wolf did. She was the one that put them in this position. In bed. Naked. Thoroughly satisfied. And made it for life. Everything about him appealed to her. No, not appealed. That wasn't enough. He called to her, demanded a response. One her wolf was all too happy to give him. Surrender and domination. She wasn't sure which was which when she was with him. Did it matter? It was an alarming thought. Still, it was the truth. A terrifying truth. He turned his head, his hair falling onto his forehead. Thick copper lashes rested on his cheek. Lips parted. Body relaxed. He slept deeply, his breathing deep and even. Too tempting to resist. Her wolf refused to resist, which made her frown. Her wolf was happy. Was she? This brilliant, stubborn man was now inextricably bound to her, forever. They had no common ground, no shared beliefs, except the overwhelming urge to explore and pleasure him, to touch him, to be with him, and now to hunt Cyrus. But would he still feel that way when he woke? When his wolf was caged and he was buttoned into his starched shirts and white lab coat? How would this work? Her wolf dismissed her worries and settled in, staring at him in delight. Stupid animal. Before she knew it, one finger ran along his jaw. The scrape of stubble against her fingertips tickling her heightened nerves. Her wolf wanted more. According to her wolf, there was far too much space between them. I won't climb on top of him while he's sleeping, she argued silently. But what happened when he woke up? Knowing him, there would be no shy smiles and tender glances. And why should there be? Being mated had little to do with emotion and everything to do with instinct. Instinct was something he didn't understand. Not yet. Not as long as he continued to fight who and what he was. Her wolf had every confidence they would draw him out. Last night had been promising, but Hollis was a stubborn idiot. Even if he stopped denying his wolf's existence, he wouldn't wake up smiling and happy about it. And now she was stuck with him. If only she could share her wolf's delight. To her, there was nothing delightful about this, except for the sex. She slipped from the bed, tugging on his boxers and then one of her tank tops as she walked to the balcony. Outside, the moon was a sliver in the night sky. Not that it had ever been truly dark. There were too many lights here for that, too many lights for the stars to shine and for the wolf to feel at ease. Fresh air, that's what she needed. But standing on the concrete balcony, peering down at the crowds below, didn't do much to smooth her nerves. Who lives like this? Surrounded by concrete and noise, traffic and chaos. A barrage of sense and sound. Complete sensory overload. The perfect setting for an attack. The air was thick and humid, but that didn't stop a shudder from running along her spine. How could he feel at home here? It was no wonder his wolf was so wary. This place, this life, there was nothing natural about it. She sat in one of the wicker chairs, drew her knees up, and closed her eyes to concentrate. As hellish as her time with Cyrus had been, he'd taught her many things. One of them was to sift through the garbage, to hone her senses until she found what was important and what it meant. Here, now, sitting high above the streets with potential threat, it took time for her wolf to do its job. Beyond drunken foolishness and mayhem, 
there was nothing to fear from the people celebrating whatever the fuck fiesta was. There was no ripple in the air that warned of the others, no scent of Cyrus. A scent she knew all too well. Her mind drifted to places it shouldn't, pulling up things best locked deep inside. His touch, the slice of a blade, deep enough to bleed but too light for lasting damage. His smile, pure menace. A promise of what he was capable of. His smile was a warning, one that turned her blood cold even now. And his eyes? Colorless, soulless. He was evil. As much as she longed to shy away from her memories, she couldn't. Remembering him, the tiny clues she'd learned over the years, would be important when she faced him. She would face him. She would defeat him. Or die trying. The shrill ring of the phone set the hair on the back of her neck straight up and her heart thundering. The sky was lightning, streaking pink and gold. How long had she sat here, her mind adrift? The phone rang again, but she was rooted in place, attempting to lock all thoughts of the others and Cyrus away before Hollis found her. Yes, his voice, thick with sleep. Food? Twenty minutes. Just the sound of his voice had her insides clenching with pure hunger. Wait. Noise. He was up, moving around. Call you back. More noise. The slam of a door against a wall. Ellen? She crossed the balcony, catching sight of her maid in all his naked glory. He was incredible. Muscle and sinew, moving with a predatory grace that demanded respect. Fuck, he growled, spinning, searching the bathroom. Ellen? Green eyes narrowed, body tense. He was hunting. Agitated. For what? One hand ran over his face and through his hair. For a split second, he sagged heavily against the bathroom counter. The rhythm of his pulse was increasing. He pushed off the counter and stalked back into the bedroom, his gaze sweeping the room, frantic. Fuck, he whispered, striding from the room. He was looking for her, frantic over her. An odd tightness rolled up her stomach and into her chest. The weight of it grew warmer, sweeter with each passing second. She'd just stepped into the bedroom when he returned. His wild gaze landed on her, hands fisted. Breathing labored. She saw so much before he pressed his eyes shut and closed the distance between them. Where were you? he asked, gripping her shoulders so tightly she winced. Damn it. He glanced at his hands on her shoulders and frowned. He cared. Not just his wolf. Hollis. The man. You left. His words were raw. And just like that... It was impossible to breathe, or stop herself from touching him. The scrape of his stubble on her palms was oddly comforting. I didn't, she stared up at him, willing him to hear her. He turned into her touch and buried his nose against her palm. The warm tug in her chest was too much for her, too real, too dangerous. Mal, she cleared her throat. He called? He nodded, stepping back. Hungry? His gaze fell from hers. Ravenous, she answered, hurrying into the bathroom, in need of space. She frowned at her reflection. What did you make us do? But her wolf was too excited to worry over the reality of their new situation. In the mirror, she caught sight of him, standing, stretching, all rippling muscles. She kicked the door shut and turned on the water. Ten minutes later, they were staring at each other in the elevator. He seemed to be on the verge of saying something but holding back, and he wouldn't stop looking at her, a look she couldn't decipher. Was he happy? Irritated? Confused? Or craving her body the way she was craving his? She was. Desperately. His quick shower had left his hair wet, the scent of it reminding her of all the delectable things he'd done to her body. The nub between her legs pulsed, hot and demanding. Could he smell her arousal? 
His expression was so closed and rigid, she couldn't tell what he was thinking. Maybe that was for the best. The elevator doors opened, but his eyes never left her, even when he gestured for her to go first. The entire walk from the elevator to the hotel restaurant, he watched her. His wolf watched her, the blazing ownership in his vibrant green eyes making food the last thing on her mind. Chapter 15 Staring didn't help. Not that he could stop. No matter how hard he tried, his gaze returned to her, homing in on her, for reassurance. And damn it, after this morning, he needed reassurance. Waking up, finding her gone, he was still recovering. Panic didn't quite explain it. Neither did fear. It was bigger than that. Stronger, more desperate, and it wasn't going away. Even though she was right there, across the table from him, devouring pancakes like her life depended on it, not in the least worried about whether or not he'd disappear on her. What the fuck was he supposed to think? She'd made it clear she wanted to leave. Was he supposed to think their bond changed that? Did it? He didn't know how any of this worked. You're embarrassing yourself, man, Mal whispered, nudging him in the side. Fuck you, he growled. Wow. Mal sat back in his chair and shook his head. <laughs> I thought you'd be in a better mood now. He glared at Mal. We thought we'd tour the Alamo. Olivia jumped in, hooking her arm through Mal and giving him a firm tug. We did? Great. There was no denying Mal's sarcasm. We'll pass, Hollis said, his gaze drifting back to Ellen. She kept chewing, sparing him a quick glance before taking another bite of pancakes drenched in blueberry syrup. A drop clung to the corner of her mouth, blue and sticky, on her skin. Beneath the table, he was hard as a rock. This was going to be a problem, especially since all he could think about was licking it away, slowly and thoroughly. What about a riverboat ride? Olivia asked. You lost him, Mal answered. I appreciate the offer. He did his best to smile at Olivia. He really did. But the syrup on Ellen's mouth and the way her tongue traced her lower lip. <laughs> You're full of shit, Mal laughed. Mal, Olivia sighed. Be nice. It's a lot to get used to. Meaning it would get easier? Thank God. You're used to this? Mal chuckled, capturing Olivia's hand in his. So no easier. Fucking terrific. You shared memories? Ellen asked, pausing between bites. It was still troubling her. Understandable, considering she wasn't one to share anything with anyone. To have her past poured out for him, into him, had to be one big, jagged, nasty pill to swallow. Mal studied her. Then Hollis. Yeah, all that shit. The shared wound, the mental bonding, all that. Ellen stabbed at her pancakes, but didn't eat anything else. It was expected then, she asked, the accusation in her tone unmistakable. Silence stretched out. He stared at her, sifting through a variety of responses and knowing there wasn't a single one that would diffuse her reaction. She was pissed. At him. Had he known what would happen? Yes, he knew. He'd asked Jessa and Olivia, Mal and Finn, hundreds of questions for scientific research. But in practice, had he been thinking about anything other than getting that fucking asshole's hands off of her? No, not until he'd touched her. After that, there'd been no thought or choice about any of it. If he had a choice in any of this, would he have lost his fucking mind when he woke up alone? Fuck no. But it didn't matter. He had. He still was. So much so that he couldn't take his eyes off of her. She glared right back. You didn't tell her? Olivia asked. Big mistake. He knew that now. For both of them. I... I wasn't thinking... With your head? No shit, Mal shook his head. No wonder she's pissed at you. 
It wouldn't have changed things, Ellen said, her gaze falling from his. What the hell did that mean? It hurt to breathe. From the fire in her eyes and the angle of her jaw, she meant it. No, she couldn't. She kept pushing the faded bullshit, the magic. But lashing out was her way of protecting herself from hurt or punishment. It hurt like hell, her words, slicing deep and leaving him gasping, even though he understood why she said it. The damage Cyrus had done to her extended far beyond the scars on her skin. Fucking bastard. A vision of him and his colorless eyes filled his mind. The glass he was holding shattered, sending orange juice across the table and embedding shards into his fingers and palm. Jesus, Mal growled, pushing back from the table. You need to learn how to control your wolf. Fuck you, he bit out, ignoring the truth in his words. Control? It didn't apply to Ellen. And Cyrus? No fucking way. Are you okay? Olivia was already pulling out the glass and wiping at the blood. That one looks deep. I'm fine. He barely glanced at his hand, the taunt of her words and the remembered sneer on Cyrus's face too much to shake. And he was shaking, his body, his muscles tightening in a wave-like ripple. Shifting in the middle of a hotel restaurant isn't fine. Mal placed a hand on his forearm, his hold bruising. Part of him wanted to shake off Mal's hold and fight him. Fight Mal? No, just fight. His blood was throbbing with rage, hot and alive and making his ears ring. The ripples were stronger now, and a tugging ache settled in his joints. A cold sweat covered his back, making his shirt stick and his skin prickle with awareness. Every sound was amplified. Mal's whispered curse, Olivia's rapid breathing, Ellen's heart. He'd recognize it anywhere. Strong, fierce, accelerated, but steady. And her scent, weighted with aggression and irritation. Breathe, Hollis, focus. It was her voice, frustrated and impatient, but her nonetheless, and he responded to it. That other part of him, the new part, the wolf part. Here. Louis shoved a glass of water his way. He downed it, wanting more. I get it. Neither of you are ecstatic over the whole mate thing. Mal kept his voice low, calm. It was a struggle. And it'd suck to be stuck with someone I didn't like. But there's no going back now, for either of you. Going back? His gaze settled on the woman he was inextricably tied to for the rest of his life. She was his her temper and passion, her brilliance and wisdom, her loyalty and brutal honesty. All of it, all of her. She would have fought her instincts if she'd know what he'd learn. She would have fought her wolf, who she was, to keep her secrets. The only sound was the drip of blood on the laminate table. With a sigh of pure frustration, he wound a linen napkin around his hand and sat back in his chair. I like her, he argued. Like wasn't the right word. If he had it his way, they'd created a whole new dictionary of words for their alternative lifestyle. None of his words, human words, seemed to do this life or these emotions justice. Her eyes narrowed. I'm sorry, he spoke softly, his throat tight. Get used to saying that, Mal whispered. A lot. Ellen was studying him, intently. His face, his eyes, his mouth. They lingered, her teeth sinking into her lower lip and driving all his blood south. I'm done eating, her voice was husky. Are we going to play in your lab today? He'd play with her anywhere she wanted. If you change your mind, we're one phone call away, Olivia said, waving her phone. Here, Mel grabbed his hand and shoved a box into it. Biggest box I could find. He frowned, staring at the box. Condoms. Fuck. Something else that had totally slipped his mind. And hers. And fuck. 
he had apologized. Instead of an act of weakness, it had been an act of respect. For her. And the wrong he felt he'd done. Wrong or not, it was unintentional. He'd have been just as lost in the fire between them. But now that they'd made their way back to the privacy of his suite, he wasn't pressing her against the wall or dragging her to their bed. He was standing, staring at one of the large windows that lined the far wall of his room. Agitation rolled off of him. What is it? she asked, wishing they were more in tune. With a sigh, he slammed a box on the dining room table. Condoms? He glanced at her. We weren't careful last night. No, we weren't. She needed to be closer to him. We were what our wolves needed us to be. He ran a hand through his hair, his sigh beyond exasperated. Jesus, Ellen. You can't write off the biological potential of what might have happened last night. His tone was cool, clipped, the tone he used when he was working. I know what Cyrus wants. If you, if we, he stared at her stomach so long her eyes were burning. The urge to breed was inherent. Even when she'd been used by Cyrus in the pack, the thought of a child had never bothered her. But time passed, and she began to accept the truth. If I were able to bear children, I would have. Cyrus was relentless with me. Perhaps it's because of what my body has endured, but I can never give you a child. She'd never said the words aloud. Once they were out, there was no taking them back. And now they hung there, weighing down the space between them. No matter how dismissive and blasé she tried to sound, the waver in her voice told another story. Eyes pressed shut. His forehead thunked against the plate glass, a rough groan tearing from deep inside of him. I want to kill him. He pushed off the glass and spun, staring down at her. I'm going to snap. There was nothing to say. She knew what he felt. The thrum to hunt and fight and kill could be crippling and dangerous for him. His wolf had every right to be free, but it should happen under more controlled circumstances one in which power was balanced, man and beast. Not now, when the wolf was trying to take over. But she knew how to deal with his wolf. Distract him. I know what will help, she offered, closing the distance and pressing herself against him. The shuddering clench of his back muscles beneath her touch revealed how hard he was struggling. More sex. He was laughing then, laughing and dragging her into their room with the box of condoms. I require you naked, she said, unbuttoning his shirt. He shrugged out of his shirt as she tugged his pants off. Impatient, he asked, his erection straining against his boxer shorts. She stripped, trying to stay upright. Yes, I miss the feel of you inside me, she whispered. He groaned and crushed her to him, his arms lifting her just enough to carry her to the bed and dump her onto the mattress. She was laughing when he tugged her to the edge of the bed. Condoms. He was panting, hovering over her to roll one on. She didn't argue. Instead, she propped herself on her elbows. Just looking at him made her tighten with want. Beneath his conservative business attire was nothing short of masculine perfection. Big, thickly muscled, hard angles and rugged beauty. The broad expanse of his chest tapered to a narrow waist and hips. She leaned forward, eager to run a finger down the gingered trail that extended from his belly button to the rigid length of his erection. Her fingers brushed the impressive length, wrapping around him and pulling a low moan from her chest. She was pressed flat, hollis over her his hands holding hers against the mattress. The wildness on his face had her wolf panting. The raw need, the lack of control. That's when his wolf was most evident. Her wolf whimpered, hungry for him, hungry for his wolf. Seconds later, he was sinking deep, their joint moan bouncing off the hotel room walls. There was no tenderness or technique, just drive, and she welcomed the way he claimed her. He let go of her hands to lift her hips. She cried out, 
swollen and sore from the night before. Her nails bit into his back and she held on, reeling from the intensity of his invasion. Ellen, he worried over her even now. Don't stop, she pleaded, arching into him. He moaned, resuming his sweet assault on her willing body. It didn't take long. She clenched around him, blissful as she fell apart in his hold. It began again almost as soon as it ended. He let go, slamming into her, driving her hunger into a quick peak until she was coming again. He climaxed with a roar, straining against her, every muscle rigid. Watching Hollis reach his release was liberating. This man was hers, and she pleased him. When he leaned forward to rest his head on her breast, she ran her fingers through his tangled copper curls. I could do that all day, he rasped. Do we have plans? she asked. He looked at her, smiling. I could cancel them. She shook her head. I'll let you leave the room. For a while, she teased. He laughed. I need to finish up a few things at the lab. He hesitated, as if he was going to say something, but he didn't. And then? Whatever you want. He kissed her breast, his tongue teasing the tip. Her nails bit into his scalp. You keep doing that, and the lab will wait. It can wait. His tongue continued, making her writhe beneath him. His mouth worked wonders, thoroughly exhausting her until she dozed into a blissful, weakened state. She woke to an empty bed. Hollis, she called out. He wasn't there. His scent was faint. She stretched and kicked back the blankets. Her wolf was content to lie in bed and wait for him, but she was restless. His clothes still covered the floor. She scooped up the shirt he'd discarded the night before and slipped it on, burying her face in the fabric and breathing him deep. Hollis, her mate. Had her wolf ever been so satisfied? Ellen could not recall. Her wolf assured her the answer was no, but then her wolf was ridiculously pleased this morning. That her lover was talented was an unexpected delight. Of course, Hollis was a detail-oriented man, so very detailed, so very talented. Each remembered stroke and kiss, his hands on her skin, the exquisite weight of him buried deep inside of her made her body tighten and flush. It took her breath away and made her ache for him. Now, Hollis, where was he? She was on fire for him. Again. She hadn't expected this. This craving. Constant, heady, warm and throbbing. Unbearably delicious anticipation kicked in. She made her way into the bathroom and paused. There, on the counter, was a box of medicine. There was no note, but there was no need. The label said enough. Morning after pill. The words, stops pregnancy before it starts, jumped off the box, aggressively. She picked up the box, read over it, and set it back on the counter. It was a plain white box with bright green letters. Green like Hollis's eyes. Her wolf growled, adding to her unease. She walked out of the bathroom to pace the length of their hotel room, but it didn't stop her mind from racing. He was worried, of course, and now that he knew what Cyrus was capable of, what choice did he have? Knowing what Cyrus would do to Finn's children, to their child, if there was even the slightest chance one had been conceived, it was too great a variable. He didn't do variables or take risks. He was a man of science and facts and proof. For him, this was a guarantee. She marched back to the bathroom and pulled the blister pack from the box. It was a blue pill. Nothing else. The pack had pointy edges, the foil and plastic crinkling. It grated her nerves. She glared at it, sat it on the counter, turned off the light, and left the bathroom again. She tidied the room, 
hanging Hollis's things in the closet and packing the rest into the bag he'd emptied onto the floor last night. Mal's gift of prophylactics lay on the floor beside the bed. She stared at the rumpled sheets and twisted blankets, the sweep of his fingers on her skin, his lips on her breasts, his breath on her inner thigh. She shuddered. Last night had done something she'd never expected. It had given her a reason to trust and hope. Dangerous words until now. But spending the night wrapped up in each other, lost to the newness and rightness of this bond, had left her with no choice. Her wolf, she, was his. And trusting him was the only option she had. The pill waiting on the bathroom counter told her how he felt. So had the fact that Hollis had gone to get it. He couldn't risk it. Her. It was important, too important to ignore a moment longer. She walked slowly back into the bathroom, flipped on the light, and read the box again. The words were straightforward and easy to understand, and horribly ominous. She read it silently, then aloud. The pill temporarily stops the egg from releasing keeping sperm from having access to the egg and preventing the act of fertilization from taking place. This pill can be used up to five days after having unprotected sex. Use early for best results. Unprotected sex. Preventing pregnancy. Factual information. Cold, clinical, and horrible. After years of aching for a child, such notions were wrong. She had Hollis. He was her mate, and if she could conceive something she'd accepted was impossible, his child would be a joy to grow within her body and raise together. Her hands pressed against her stomach. Her wolf growled. Was this what Hollis wanted, or was this his way of protecting her? She stared at her stomach. Safe didn't exist. Cyrus would die at her hand or by one of Finn's pack. How could she give up the chance, however slight, of having Hollis's child? Because now isn't the time. She and Hollis had time. She tore open the blister pack and poured the small blue pill into her hand. It lay there, so blue and bold it made her skin crawl. Her wolf growled. She was not happy. As far as she was concerned, this was wrong. This wasn't her world. She believed in magic and fate and destiny. This, taking this, went against everything she believed in. The thump of her heart was audible. A light sweat broke out on her upper lip. The longer she stared at it, the more certain she became that this was the right choice. She tossed it into the toilet before she could change her mind. With a flush, the water swirled, and the pill disappeared. She shoved the wrapping into the box, tossed it into the trash, and stared at her reflection. Her wolf was happy. She sucked in a deep, cleansing breath and leaned heavily against the counter, relief seeping into her bones and spirit. Hollis would be, too, if the impossible happened. She had to believe that. No regrets. No going back. It was done. If it was meant to be, it was right. She turned on the shower, waited for the water to warm, then stood under the jets until her tension eased. It would be a good day, as would all the days that followed. She had been given a chance to truly live again, thanks to Hollis. Being his mate gave her purpose beyond Cyrus and the others. This was a new beginning. A mate. And a pack. That realization had her wiping soap from her eyes. A pack. She had been connected to them before, irrationally protective of Finn's maid and children. Now she understood. Her wolf had known. They were her pack. They had always been her pack. And watching over them was what pack members did. Take care of one another. Dante would have a shit fit. She could imagine his face, and it made her burst out laughing. Finn's pack was strong in a way they had yet to realize. If only they could see themselves as they were. Strong, proud warriors. 
Protectors. Defenders. Not the monsters they believed themselves to be. If they could own their power and find pride in it, nothing can stop them or defeat them. She climbed out of the shower to find Hollis leaning against the doorway. Something funny? he asked, his gaze sweeping her from head to toe. The smile on his face filled her with joy. And guilt. Damn it. Her gaze darted to the trash and the empty box. Unless she told him, he'd never know what she'd done. He'd made his position clear, and she'd agreed. How could she explain why she'd thrown it away? Thankfully, he was far too distracted by her nearly naked state. His gaze was nothing short of predatory. Her wolf approved. Good shower? His words were gruff and deep. Delicious. She nodded, running the towel over her short hair before dropping it on the ground. Her arms slid around his waist as she pressed her still wet body against his perfectly pressed and starched slacks and shirt. You could have joined me. I'm dressed, he growled, staring down at her. A requirement for leaving the hotel room. His gaze settled on her lips. We're leaving, she asked, stretching. I'm rethinking. His nostrils flared. She loved the power she had over him, loved the hunger he had for her. No, the sooner you get your work done, the sooner I can have your full, undivided attention. He cleared his throat, but didn't argue. Instead, he sat on the edge of the bed and watched her dress. She played with him, making a production of sliding on her lacy G-string and matching bra, something she'd never have worn before now. But the look on his face was reward enough for her discomfort. Until she found herself standing around his cold lab, growing more on edge with each passing moment. Since he was working on something other than the vaccine, she set aside her reservations and watched him work. He was proud of what he did here, and he should be. She'd read the framed articles that lined the halls of this building. RPR did cutting-edge research that led to truly groundbreaking discoveries in vaccines he distributed globally. Hollis wasn't just important to the pack. He was important to so many. She didn't know how to feel about that. She respected him, admired him, but she wasn't ready to share him. Hollis was bent over his files, his tussled curls falling onto his forehead. How had this man become so important to her? Some questions didn't have answers. They just were. The longer Hollis poured over his papers and numbers, the harder it was to ignore the hum in the air. The vault. Whatever was inside called to her. There were answers there, if she was brave enough to confront them. She was no coward. Hollis, she murmured. Her wolf paced, curious. His wolf reacted, instantly gaining Hollis's attention. He stood, spinning to see her. What? What's wrong? Knowing their wolves were already working together made her smile. She stood on tiptoe to kiss him. Let me in, she said against his lips. He pulled back, a furrow forming between his brows. There's no reason to put yourself through it. There is. I feel it. She pressed her hand to her chest. I can't ignore it. Her brows rose. Mate or no, don't try to shelter me from something that needs to be done. It needs to be done? She nodded. I can bring things out. It might be easier? He asked, still concerned. It was an option. One her wolf quickly dismissed. She refused to be intimidated. She was, after all, a fearsome beast. What harm can come from a room full of things? She headed to the door, waited for him to open it, and tried to shake off the sharp tingles brushing her skin. Are you sure? he asked, his fingers on the keypad. No, she had doubts, but her wolf would not be deterred. She nodded. He unlocked the metal door and pushed it wide. This time, she was prepared. Leaning heavily against the concrete walls helped her stay upright. The roar of noise and voices greeted her. 
Loud? Yes, but not hostile. There was no threat here. She pushed off the wall and into the room, taking the hand Hollis offered just in case. Low lights, he explained, letting her set the pace. Some of the documents are photosensitive due to age. She nodded, her eyes adjusting to the dim room. Her equilibrium was off, so she stopped, thankful for the strength of his arms around her. She waited, her gaze wandering around the room. A long, low table and several chairs were the only furniture. The rest of the room housed display units, drawers, and cabinets. One drawer drew all her attention, all her focus. It called to her, knew her. The pressure on her chest increased as she moved toward it. She gripped the drawer handle and pulled it wide. On a background of black velvet lay the necklace. Her necklace. Her hand shook as she reached for it, caressing the fine leather cord between her fingers. Her wolf longed to howl, to roar with pleasure and despair. The voices of her pack crashed into her. The floor tipped and she fell. Chapter 16 Paulus caught her, kneeling on the floor with her in his arms. He couldn't protect her from this, couldn't defend her, even though his wolf was pushing to do so. He hurt for her, torn and frustrated, but he could hold her close and rock her. Maybe his touch eased her the way hers did him. It was all he could give her. It's yours, he whispered. He knew. Deep down, he already knew. She nodded, cradling the necklace to her chest with both hands. He leaned back against the cabinet and waited. Whatever time she needed, he would give her. As hard as it was to accept special powers and magic existed in the real world, it made sense that Ellen would possess them. She would never abuse her gifts. She would respect them, take pride in them, as she did in being a wolf. How it felt or understanding the toll it took on her was something else. After having her life taken so violently from her, Having her past destroyed so completely, reminders would be bittersweet in a way he could never comprehend. Where did you get it, she managed. An antique shop in San Francisco. He pressed a kiss to her temple. The steamer trunk was scavenged after the quake. The lock was broken, sealed shut. But the shopkeeper had some story about the items belonging to witches, so he was too scared to force it open. Witches? She looked up at him the expressions flying across her face before he could identify what she was thinking or feeling. No, we, we were called that sometimes. We were healers. You remember? He asked, hesitant. Whatever was happening to her was intense. Now it wasn't the time to drill her for answers, no matter how many questions he had. She shook her head. No, yes, some. Her hands tightened around the beads. It's been locked away so long. Her gaze met his. Some feared us, drove us away. People fear what they don't understand. Fear had influenced him far too much. He'd been so determined to cure Finn and the pack that he hadn't stopped to consider all of the options this new life could offer. Instead of researching how to adapt and explore their new strengths and talents, He'd focused all his energy on trying to reverse their plight. But being wolves hadn't changed who they were. If he was being objective, he would acknowledge that they'd been given an opportunity to be something more. Something special. The only thing capable to taking on Cyrus and the others. For the first time, he questioned whether finding a cure was the answer. And, if it was, how could he cure something that made the woman he loved who she was? But what would a cure do to her and Finn's children? His stomach clenched hard. If it came down to a choice between curing the pack and losing Ellen, the answer was clear. He buried his nose in her hair and drew in her scent. His wolf approved, wanting to be closer to their mate. Ellen slid the necklace on and tucked it inside her shirt, pressing her hand over it. I'm fine now, she whispered, pushing out of his arms and moving toward the cabinet. You can sit. 
His hands covered hers. Let me bring the next drawer to you. He watched the way she pressed her hand against the wall, staying angered as she moved to the table. Unsteady or not, he saw the determined gleam in her gaze as she waited for him to bring her the next drawer. Oh, her voice wavered as she stared inside. She seemed to wilt before his eyes, her skin draining of color and her eyes filling with tears. Pinned to the lining of the drawer was an intricately embroidered blanket. Her fingers hovered. Her hand shook, but she refused to touch the items inside. I can't. The name Isabel was stitched into the intricate ribbon and flower border. Helena, he ground out, reaching for her. You don't have to do this now. He pulled her up against him. We can come back tomorrow. Take it piece by piece. There's no rush. Mal wants to go home, she reminded him. Which was true. Mal was chomping at the bit to get back to the refuge. The longer he went without shifting, the bigger an asshole he became. As far as Hollis was concerned, there was no reason to have Mal and Olivia here, especially now that Ellen was his mate. Knowing that eased some of the tension from his neck and shoulders. His wolf snorted in irritation. He knew Ellen would never leave them. Making Hollis feel like an ass or still having doubts. He ran a hand over her hair. I'll talk to Finn. We should talk to him in person. She rested her head against his chest. I know he has questions. Now that he is my alpha, I owe him answers. She would respect the pack hierarchy, even when she was barely capable of standing on her own two feet. Do you want to go back to the refuge? He asked, anticipating her answer. No, not yet. Her hand pressed against the shirt. Please, I'd rather not leave yet. He nodded. We can arrange a teleconference. That's easy. I can't leave them. Not yet, she whispered. Her words sliced through his heart. There's no rush on this, Ellen. When you're ready, we'll contact him. He held her until her heartbeat slowed and her breathing steadied. She pushed away from him. There is one thing. The chest. She clutched the necklace tightly. He nodded, watching her struggle. There's a book. A book hidden in the base. Her fingers worried the brown, green, and earth-toned beads as she stared blindly around the vault. A false bottom inside. He'd gotten caught up in the trunk's contents and researching each item before he could dismantle it to find any hidden treasures. I'll get it. He waited for her to sit before unlocking one of the larger storage closets. The chest was old, but still sound. He pulled it from a storage case and set it on the table, his curiosity kicking into overdrive. She stood beside him, leaned in and pulled what looked like a loose wooden dowel in the far corner. The bottom popped up to reveal a thick, leather-bound book. What is it? he asked. The voices, she said. This is the story of my pack. Her voice broke, and she looked at him. You must believe in magic now. How else would you have known? He nodded, too moved to speak. His wolf pushed, wanting to be close, needing her touch to ease him. Hollis touched her cheek. Thank you. He shook his head. He should be thanking her. Through her eyes, the world was changing into a place he wanted to be. The last four days had been exhausting. She and Hollis spent every waking hour cataloging the vault and making notes. Pressure still built inside her chest until she felt lightheaded, but she could stand on her own two feet now. It was progress. I'll come back. It was a promise she made every day to her ancestors and herself. She had so much to learn, so much to remember, things to share with Finn and his pack. When Hollis wasn't helping her in the vault, he was driving her to distraction in their bed. She wasn't sure what her favorite part of the day was, waking up in his arms or falling apart in them. She finished packing away the drawer they'd been working on and turned to find him watching her. Those green eyes searched hers for a long time, as they did every time they left the vault. She loved the concern on his face and hated how he sensed her weakness. His hand brushed her cheek, his smile taking the lingering edge off her nerves. Oh, 
How she loved this man and his timid wolf. He was so worried about her, about their pack, and it bound them even closer together. He led her from the vault, closed and locked the door behind them, then pulled out a chair by his desk. Sit. He stooped, opening the small refrigerator beneath his desk. I think I have... Yes, one soda. The sugar and caffeine will do you some good. She shrugged. I'm good. Drink it for me, he asked. The concern in his tone was too much for her wolf to resist. She nodded, taking the cold soda and sitting back with a sigh. The hiss and pop of the can made her nerves jump, but she took deep, calming breaths. Her wolf calmed down instantly. It enjoyed touching the artifacts, remembering those from their past and tracing their travels across the globe. The book was a genealogy of sorts, a log of the various packs. It connected dots, filled in holes in her memories, and brought new questions to the front. Pain was part of the process. Faces she'd never known returned to her, wrapped with such love and joy. It was impossible for her not to react. Healing was only part of what her pack did. Hunting those who went against the wolves' way was another. Her pack had been dedicated and unwavering, even when it cost them dearly. Sometimes it was too hard. But reaching for Hollis, a single stroke of his skin or brush of his fingers against her calmed both her and her wolf and allowed her to keep going. Cyrus had taught her to control her emotions, bottling them up so he couldn't use them against her. And, even though Hollis would never do such a thing, being free with her feelings, being vulnerable, was still a challenge. She took slow sips of the soda and stared right back at Hollis as he continued to study her. I'm good, Hollis. No hovering. I know you have work to do. I'm sitting, drinking, behaving, she grinned. And I'm assessing my patient, he argued. You're testing my patience, she wrinkled her nose at him. Stop. One copper brow arched, but he nodded. Fine. I do have some work to do, he agreed. His lips brushed her forehead before he crossed the lab, picked up a tablet, and returned to the desk. Watching Hollis work was interesting. His mind was a veritable playground of detailed analysis and creative solutions. He could study a problem, chemical or biological, find its working mechanism, and break down how to disable or tweak it. With one exception. The lupine infection. It was a puzzle he couldn't solve. One that directly impacted those he loved and his frustration showed. The vaccine, she asked, noting the furrow on his brow. Not going well? I thought things were progressing, but I was wrong. Hollis pointed at several Petri dishes lined up on the counter along the far wall. The tissue samples turned necrotic this morning. That was the most promising strain so far. Ellen eyed the dead mice. What happened? The first two hours, nothing. Then the cells began collapsing. Oxygen deprivation, cell wall collapse, turning the blood septic. He shook his head. In a live specimen, this would lead to full organ failure in a matter of minutes, or worse. Some of the cells actually ruptured. Whose blood did you use, she asked, to infect the tissue? Mine, he studied her. Why? Have you studied Oscar's blood? There is a slight difference in the cellular composition of those turned versus those bitten, is there not? Hollis's nod was slow. Use mine, she said. I don't believe your pack can be cured, but maybe, possibly, it could save those most recently turned by Cyrus. She sighed. As my mate, the need to make you happy can be quite confusing. Hollis smiled. What? she asked. You, his smile grew, calling me your mate. I like it. She rolled her eyes, but couldn't stop her own smile. His green gaze remained fixed on her. Are you sure? She held her arm out. Under these circumstances, I mentioned, I'm sure, she added. Maybe it will make a difference. Hollis tied a rubber tourniquet around her arm, collected a needle, and three empty tubes for her blood. He just slid the catheter into her vein when Kim walked in, pausing inside the door to stare at them. Ellen saw the fear in the woman's eyes the way Kim seemed to recoil into herself. Her heart picked up, her breath hitching at the sight of Ellen's blood. 
Something was off. Wrong. Very wrong. It was more than being territorial over Hollis. Even her wolf saw that. The coffee cup clasped in her hand was trembling so that liquid dripped onto the immaculate white floor. Come in, Hollis called out, too focused on what he was doing to look up. Kim jumped, then realized Ellen was watching her. Her face paled chalk white as she crossed the room, holding her manila files like a body shield. The coffee cup was outstretched, still shaking, still leaving a trail. She set the cup of coffee on the desk and stepped back. You spilled, Ellen murmured, softly, studying her. Kim glanced at the floor. From white to red, she stammered. I I'll get a mop. She sucked in an unsteady breath. Would you like one? She asked Ellen. Coffee, I mean. No, thank you. Ellen attempted a smile. Why was she scared of her? No, not scared. Kim was terrified. Maybe she could sense how badly her wolf didn't like her. Still, Kim's reaction puzzled Ellen's wolf, too. Kim nodded and crossed to the door, cast another glance over her shoulder, and pulled the door shut behind her. Something in Kim's eyes had the hair on the back of her neck prickling up, sending a shudder along her back. Did Kim know what Ellen was? Her wolf dismissed it. Humans didn't believe in monsters. They couldn't wrap their brains around the truth unless they were given no choice. Why Ellen was reacting to the woman so strongly was a mystery. It was more than jealousy. It had to be. But her wolf wasn't so sure. As simple, base, and primitive as the emotion was, Hollis brought out her territorial side. She doesn't like me, she murmured, puzzled. I'll fire her, he said, never pausing in his work. You didn't see that? Ellen asked, frustrated. See what? he asked, glancing at her after he'd pulled the catheter from her arm and released the tourniquet. The way she looked at us, at me. Whether or not he could shift, his ability to shut out his wolf was beyond irritating at times. Your wolf? Did he sense nothing? You must listen to him. Let him speak. You will have something to say. Hollis was distracted now, leaning in to run his nose along her temple. Maybe she could tell how much sex we'd had. He grinned at her, his green eyes sparking with passion. Or how much more was in our future? He eyed the desk. Here works. Talk of Kim could wait. She laughed, shaking her head. I thought you were right about me. I was. I am, always. His eyes were blazing now. But I know how to make you feel better. Her heart thumped, making him smile broadly. I heard that, he murmured, low and thick and so husky, her body tightened with want. His hand pressed against her chest. My wolf is far too in tune with you and the way you and your body react. You can't hide your reaction to me. I've never tried, she countered, loving the hunger in his gaze as it traveled along her neck. She grew more off-kilter and breathless with each passing second. Hollis. He kissed her, softly at first, but somehow she ended up in his lap. His lips clung to hers until he had her full attention. His hand slid along her thighs as teeth nipped her collarbone. You should wear skirts more often, he growled, tugging at her cargo pants. I can't touch you the way I want to. Where do you want to touch me, she asked, arching into his touch. Here, he said, running his fingers along the pants seam between her legs. Inside of you. Here, she asked, looking up at him. Dr. Robbins, we're in your lab. Do you keep protection in your lab? Since you became my mate, I have condoms everywhere. My pockets, my desk, my briefcase, always ready for you. His lips sealed with hers his tongue sliding into her mouth and mimicking the deep, slow strokes of his invasion. Her fingers tangled in the curls at the nape of his neck. Her teeth grazed his tongue before she sucked his tongue deep. A low growl emanated from deep in his chest. You make me crazy. She wasn't sure what she loved more, his growl or his confession. Both held the promise of the wolf inside. She couldn't wait to meet him. 
Chapter 17 Hollis's reality changed daily. His wolf was to blame. So was Ellen. His basic needs would not be neglected. Food tasted better. Smells richer. Walking made him long to run. But now his appetite for life was out of control. And sex? With Ellen? Was an Olympic sport he was happily addicted to. He had almost mapped every faded scar on her body with his lips. Nothing appeased him like the sounds she made, her scents and the tight heat that sheathed him when he was deep inside of her. He was insatiable, craving her, hard for her minutes after he'd worn them both out. He couldn't get enough of her, and he loved it. Even now, surrounded by work he'd once spent countless hours obsessing over every tiny detail, his hunger won out. She was in his arms. The tug of her fingers in his hair was the only invitation he needed. Her lips clung to his, sucking his lower lip into her mouth and making him so hard it hurt. His fingers fumbled with the waist of her pants, pushing them down and bearing the firm curve of her ass. Not worried about a colleague walking in, Dr. Robbins? She whispered against his lips. I don't care, he said, gripping her tightly. She laughed. Do you normally seduce women in your lab? He pulled back then, staring down at her. No, I don't normally seduce women, period. But I need you now. She bit her lip, the hitch of her breath driving him crazy. He lifted her, carried her across the room, and pressed her against the door. If you're worried about someone walking in... Her legs wrapped around his waist, and his pants hit the floor. Her heat teased him, making his fingers shake as he rolled on the condom. Once it was on, he thrust into her and sank deep. Oh, Hollis, she moaned, her legs tightening around his waist. He smiled, thrusting into her slowly, inch by inch, gloved tightly in her heat. Nothing felt better. Her grip tightened in his hair as her gaze locked with his. He could spend hours like this, lost in Ellen. His wolf felt the same. Her wolf was there, welcoming him, craving him. They fed off the bond, making them strong and secure, needed and valued. Two parts of one whole. Hollis, she whispered, straining against his leisurely pace. Harder, please. Harder? he asked, nipping her neck. She shuddered, her nails biting into his shoulders. He thrust deep, slid back, then slammed into her again. Yes, she moaned. Yes. Her eyes opened, locking with his, blinded with lust. For him. Whatever she wanted. He gripped her hips and pounded into her, his lips pressed against her neck. It was mindless and desperate. Her moans grew faster and faster, her heart beating rapidly, her blood rushing and every muscle clenching tightly around him in anticipation. He knew she was close, felt the quivers intensify before she stiffened. He thrust deep, loving the clenching of her body when she came apart. Watching her climax was incredible, wild, uninhibited and fierce. Fuck! he growled, sucking her nipple through the cotton of her tank top. Her fingers tugged his hair, her breath hitched, and he continued to play with her. Faster and harder, until he was mindless, out of control, pouring himself into her. He ground his teeth together, drawn so tight, he worried he'd send them both crashing to the floor. Pleasure flooded every nerve, slamming over him and into him, wiping everything but Ellen, the feel of her, from his mind. You're insatiable, she gasped, and I am sore. He slid from her, bracing himself against her and the door until the room was no longer spinning. Are you complaining? She shook her head. I like it. The heat in her gaze made him groan. His hands cradled her face. Like it? Like. Another insufficient word for what he was feeling. What else could she say? Her hand pressed against the side of his face, her mismatched gaze falling from his. I say we call it the day, doctor. Unless there's some pressing matter I don't know about. I'd like something to eat before I take you to bed. 
he stepped back, tugging up her pants and pressing a kiss to her forehead. His wolf reveled in her scent as much as he did, lingering there so he could draw her in. It took effort to release her. Almost. He dressed and disposed of the condom. Fifteen minutes? She glanced at the clock on the wall as she buttoned her pants. I'm timing you. He grinned, already heading back to his desk. I believe you. He sat in his desk chair, finishing off three emails, saving the updated data files, and plotting the latest numbers he'd received on a new dysentery pill they were developing. Her fingers smoothed between his eyebrows. You frown when you're working. I'm not frowning. I'm concentrating, he argued, catching her arm and pressing a kiss to the inside of her wrist. Which is harder to do when you're sitting there. Smelling like him, and sex, and arousal. He bit back a groan, wishing there was a way to rein in his out-of-control hunger for her. I'll move, she said, inching closer and leaning in to kiss him. He laughed against her lips. <laughs> Thanks. The sound of a throat clearing behind them had him pulling away from her. Kim stood, mop in one hand, bucket in the other. I came to clean up the office, she murmured, taking pains to avoid making eye contact. Ellen was right. Something was wrong with his assistant. He'd hired Kim Sue because she was a consummate professional. He'd admired her attention to detail, her enthusiasm for work, and her ability to stay calm under pressure. In a lab environment with controls and tight timelines, unexpected variables and frequent disappointments, Hollis valued her calm. Now she was anything but calm. Dilated pupils, accelerated heart, unsteady breathing. The scent of fear and stress. The clues were there, subtle but plain. He should have caught it. He and his wolf. We have people to do that, Kim, he reminded her. It was my fault, she argued, smiling slightly, but still not looking directly at them. Hollis glanced at Ellen. She was watching his lab assistant with unsettling intensity. That look alone would make him nervous, even without knowing she was a wolf. God, she was beautiful. And dangerous. She radiated a predatory confidence that most humans shied away from. Like Kim, now. He squeezed her hand until she looked his way. His slight frown made her posture ease, but she still wasn't radiating warm and friendly. With a sigh, he turned back to Kim. I read your notes on the stem cell trial. It looks promising. I thought you'd be pleased, she nodded. Kim? Alice paused. They'd never discussed their personal lives. He knew very little about her and hoped she knew less than that about him. It was something he appreciated about working with her, but now he couldn't sit by and say nothing. Are you okay? Only tired. I've had a cold for a while. She hedged, continuing to mop up the trail of coffee. Her heartbeat faltered, the scent of fear increasing. She was lying. Why? He glanced at his mate again, relieved to see her studying his computer screen. You've been working late the last two weeks. If you need some time off, no. The word was urgent. She looked at him then, dark eyes wide, her hand clutching the broom handle. No, I'm fine, really. Her gaze dropped to the floor. She was anything but fine. You're sure? I may be your employer, but I'd like to thank you to tell me if you needed time. Or if something was going on in your life that required your attention. I'd understand, he finished. I appreciate that, Dr. Robbins, she cleared her throat. I love my work here. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'll leave early? Hollis glanced at the clock on the wall. It was almost four. Sounds good. I hope you feel better, Kim. You're very important to Dr. Robbins and his work. Ellen's words startled him and stunned Kim. Her dark eyes regarded Ellen with dismay. He understood. There were times he didn't know what to make of his mate either. But there was still fear in the woman's gaze. And sadness. Thank you, Kim whispered. I'll, I'll go put this away and see you tomorrow. She carried the mop and bucket from the room, not bothering to look up. He stared at the door long after it shut. She's sick. It was the easiest explanation. Right now, 
He really wanted an easy explanation. Ellen snorted. Keep lying to yourself. Maybe she can sense your wolf, he suggested. She's smart, intuitive, and free-thinking. That's what makes her such an exceptional lab assistant. Ellen scowled. How nice for you. Hollis swallowed down his laughter, his gaze sweeping over Ellen's face. Do you realize how fierce you can be? Right now you look like you could rip out her jugular. I have ripped out someone's jugular. Her brows rose. Keep singing your little lab assistant's praises, and you'll see just how fierce I can be. I look forward to it. He kissed the tip of her nose. I need to finish. Your fifteen minutes are up, she interrupted, standing. You'll have to give me five more. He stared up at her. It's your fault. First you distract me, then you terrify my lab assistant. I can't leave your blood samples out, files all over the place, or my computer on. She sighed, crossed her arms over her chest, and sauntered toward the table covered with files. Where do they belong? Far left file cabinet, he said, smiling at her. I'll help, but only because I'm hungry. She glared at him, picked up the files, and went to work. In time, her natural curiosity kicked in, and she was questioning the things she was supposed to be filing. Her mind was sharp, easily digesting processes and tests it had taken his crew weeks to decipher. And her insight was, as always, staggeringly unique and illuminating. Something else to add to his growing lists of things Ellen does to turn him on. So far, that included things like breathing, running her fingers through her hair, shooting him irritated looks, and standing within fifty feet of him. If she hadn't pointed out Kim's reaction, would he have noticed? He had the ability. It was time to use it. If he was going to be any help to Ellen, he should attempt to reach some sort of understanding with his wolf, beyond the whole addicted to her thing. Whatever was troubling Kim, it wasn't being overtired or sickness. He'd seen that look before. She looked like Jessa after she'd seen her first wolf, or Olivia when she realized there was no escaping the others. Kim looked like she'd seen the monsters of this world, and knew Ellen was one of them. She didn't like being nervous, but she had good reason to be. Finn's face appeared on the massive screen on the conference room wall. He was her alpha now. This was her pack. She didn't know what that meant, or how they'd react to her being one of them. After being viewed as a possible threat for so long, she was prepared for the worst. Better? Hollis asked, adjusting the cables on the back of the projector. Since they'd stayed in San Antonio, Finn had agreed to a teleconference to check in. He and the rest of the pack were gathered in his study, in their usual chairs and grinning. Anders flipped Mal off and laughed. We can see you, Finn agreed. How are Diana and Oscar? Jessa? she asked, not seeing any sign of Finn's mate or his children. Fine. Finn smiled, looking more like a tired new father than the alpha of a mighty pack. Have time for all. You look like you could use one as well, Hollis commented, ever the diplomat. Finn nodded. When we're done. Ellen glanced at Hollis, wishing he'd look her way. Anything new there? Her mate asked. No sign of the others, Mouse spoke up. We haven't seen any movement from them in San Antonio, San Francisco... Any place we know they have a base, Finn sighed, shaking his head. They're quiet. Too quiet. Not a good sign. She didn't say it, but she knew they were all thinking the same thing. If they were quiet, they were biding their time. Could be they're still licking their wounds, Anders suggested. As much as she wanted to believe that, she couldn't. Bit by bit, they'd taken the others' known trafficking operations apart. It was a victory for Finn's pack and those girls they'd freed. Undoubtedly, their victory poked Cyrus's pride. But the bastard would have a contingency plan, or be developing a way to get even. Either way, the silence didn't bode well. So there's nothing to report, Mal asked, spinning a pen in his fingers. No, Finn said. Tess has been behaving, she snapped. As far as she was concerned, the girl was a liability one who would take any opportunity to betray them. Thinking of Oscar or tiny Diana in Cyrus's hold, her fingers gouged the wooden armrests. He paused, his jaw tightening. 
She's stayed with her father under supervision. Since he's been awake, her attitude has changed. Dante has offered to change her. Ellen was speechless. Why? Why would you allow such a thing? Brown's never asked me for a thing, Finn said. If this will save his daughter, I'll do it. She'd be one of us then, meaning no longer a threat. True or not, she couldn't shake off the unease the woman stirred within her. But things like forgiveness and the second chances weren't a luxury she could afford. Finn was Alpha. It was his decision, one he'd already made, and she'd accept it. That was the way a pack worked. Gentry's with her most of the time, Anders added, making a point of winking broadly. Ellen frowned but held her tongue. Her opinion didn't matter. She loves her father, Olivia offered up. I know she's confused, but if she could pick who she belonged to, it would be our pack. I believe that. Which is exactly what she'd want you to believe, so you won't kill her, Ellen murmured, unable to give the girl the benefit of the doubt. Instinct told her keeping the girl alive was a mistake. Cyrus had years to program her, to strip away who and what she was. Was it possible to truly remove his hold on her? Was risking the children and the future of her pack worth risking? Love isn't enough when it comes to our wolves. Mal's voice was hard. Pack loyalty comes first. Dante's glare, directed at her, was impossible to miss. So why the fuck are you siding with her? Hollis's hand tightened on her shoulder. Ellen is part of this pack now, Threat edged his voice. She is one of us, and you will be loyal to her as she is to you. Even when you're being a motherfucking asshole. Right, Dante? Dante's gaze narrowed. Right. He wasn't pleased, but there was no denying the respect on Dante's face when he looked at her mate. Her fierce and sexy as hell mate. That was some announcement, man. Mal was laughing. Guess that was one way to make it official. Anders chuckled. I can see how he swept you right off your feet, huh, Ellen? She laughed. Anders had that effect on most people. <laughs> Welcome to the pack, Finn said, chuckling. She smiled, glancing at Hollis. His gaze, filled with pride and ownership, swept over her before he looked at the screen. I keep no secrets from my pack. She spoke softly, but knew they heard. The wolf's hearing could pick up the slightest ripple of sound. If I have not been forthcoming before, it was out of self-preservation. You are not my pack. I owed you nothing. But now that has changed. Hollis's look was concerned, his brow furrowing deeply. Are you sure? No, not in the least. But she nodded. Then leaned against his desk, preparing the packs seemed to straighten, their wolves' senses heightening and pricking up with anticipation. You mean we're finally going to get answers? Anders asked, leaning forward eagerly. Ellen appreciated his attempt at levity, but it didn't ease the weight of pressing in on her. This was a way to earn trust from her new pack, and that mattered. She did never choose to be vulnerable, but she would answer whatever questions they asked of her. If you have questions, she said, do we have questions? Mal laughed. That's the understatement of the year. You must know, I have few memories before I was taken by the others, but I will do my best to answer what I can. Her hands were clammy. A light sweat broke out on her forehead. Ben studied her before asking. You knew Byron was alone? How? Not the first question she'd expected. This answer would lead to more questions, questions that would require them to set aside skepticism and force them to accept further changes to their reality. Hollis had been skeptical of magic. How would the rest of the pack take it? I call it reading, a sharing of memories and sensations through touch. She stopped, waiting. Everyone was staring at her. The book was hoping her fill in the holes. Occasionally, new images cropped up, so clear and real she knew they were from her past. As far as she could remember, it was the same. Once her gifts were known, everything changed. Most feared what she could do, thought her a freak. According to the notes in the book, they'd had to flee to avoid prosecution for witchcraft. Byron was dead, Dante's eyes narrowed. 
Ellen glanced at Hollis. Not long. The spirit lingers. The body holds on to its former state, especially if the death is violent or unexpected. It's a shock to the soul as much as the body. That's freaky shit, Ellen, Anders sounded off. I agree, Ellen nodded. It isn't always a pleasant experience. Hollis sat beside her, his thigh pressed against hers. We've been working through the vault. Most of my collection belonged to her original pack, including a journal. It contains more valuable information than all my years of research has provided. Have you read it yet? Finn asked Hollis. We've started. It's slow going. Hollis took her hand. It's exhausting work. Fucking draining. It's a record of the wolves, she shook her head. Elder scribes maintained it. Our heritage, rites and customs, maps we've traveled, and a record of births and deaths. She glanced at the faces on the screen. I remember pieces pulled from the stories read aloud, she shrugged. A wash with memories faded around the edges. So your scribes were sort of like Hollis, Anders asked. All knowing and shit? Were they condescending too? Hollis sighed, but the rest were laughing. She threaded her fingers with his. They were revered, as he is. He was looking at her, but she couldn't look at him. She'd already revealed enough to their audience. What she and Hollis shared was none of their business. Maybe if we knew more about our heritage and origin, perhaps things between us and the others wouldn't be so tense. Finn's gaze was direct. Ellen shook her head. Nothing would ease that, save Cyrus's demise. That's the only option? Dante asked. Mal rubbed his hands together. Sign me up. I'm ready. Is there anything in the book that can help us? Anders asked. Defeat him, I mean. Not so far, Hollis said. You didn't know the book was there? Finn asked Hollis. No idea. It's been hidden in the trunk for years. Hollis's thumb brushed along her knuckles. The things in the vault spoke to her. She appreciated the effort he was making to keep touching her. Did he know his touch eased her? Or was his wolf publicly staking his claim on her? Neither was bad. How does that work? Anders piped up. Books don't talk, normally, you know. I'm not saying I don't believe you, because I've seen enough shit to know things aren't cut and dry. Anders had a way with words. But this is right up there with the whole turning into a wolf thing. If you're a reader, you tend to be in tune. Alive or dead, past or present, written or spoken. I hear what needs or wants to be heard. Animate and inanimate objects, too, it seems, she murmured. It was useful for identifying wounds, their causes, and treating them. Olivia nodded. Like having a built-in CAT scan. She nodded. You were born with it? Finn asked. Not taught? I've never known a turned wolf to have the gift, she paused. From what I remember. Back up. I'm betting that went over well, Mal snorted. Having someone get into your head? Most people wouldn't like that. No, they don't. And I wouldn't. Don't. Ellen said. Cyrus knew, Finn asked, and used your power for his benefit. She stiffened but nodded. The change in mood was palpable. Anger, fear, the call to hunt, all justified. Finn leaned against his desk, his gaze searching her long and hard before he drew in a deep breath. How did you lose your memory? She sustained a massive head trauma, Hollis interrupted, the edge in his voice growing his wolf ready to defend and protect her. What happened? Finn kept his gaze pinned to her. Cyrus. He, the day my pack was wiped out, she paused, a wash in pain. She avoided the screen then, needing to stay strong. It would be natural for Finn and his pack to panic over her words. They should. But knowing what Cyrus was capable of would ensure the same fate wouldn't befall them. Your pack? Mal growled. Olivia's voice wavered. All of them? Her memories were still hazy, but she and Hollis had been able to piece together much of what happened. We had tried to make peace, to make allies with the other's pack. William was the alpha then, his brother, Cyrus, his second. Our pack's abilities made us an asset or an enemy. To avoid the bloodshed, William and I agreed to become a mated pair. 
Wait, you can choose? Anders sat forward. Then why has Finn, Mal, and Hollis all lost their minds over their mates? It's scary as shit. Couldn't they choose not to bond? And, you know, stay sane? Ellen smiled. Bonds are different. Your pack has true mated pairs, unbreakable for life, making their beasts stronger. William and I chose to for the good of the species, for peace. Once Cyrus realized we could use reading beyond healing, he became obsessed. She took the glass of water Hollis offered her and smiled at him. Say what you will about Cyrus. He can weave a spell with words. He convinced the others that we were witches capable of mind control. They'd all seen us reading. It wasn't too great a leap. No matter the species, we fear what we don't know. She paused. All who oppose him were killed. My mate and my daughter as well. The quiet that fell was too heavy with fury and sadness. His pack didn't resist keeping you? Since you were a witch, too? Finn's jaw clenched. A quick look Hollis's way told her he regretted asking the question. But it was too late. He'd asked, and she would answer. These memories were all too sharp. I had power he wanted to exploit. He said he could control me as his mate. Her teeth clenched. A silver collar weakens the body, but not the spirit. I made clear that would never happen. That's when she'd visited the hole for the first time. Motherfucker! Hollis pushed out of his chair and stalked the length of the room, his growl tearing at her calm. You don't have to do this. Hearing this hurt him. If the roles were reversed, she didn't want to think about it. But she straightened, refusing to buckle under the weight of the pack's gaze. Hers was a story of shame, but it would not define her. I'm guessing he wasn't happy about that, Mal asked, his smile hard and mean. I'd have loved to see that, you pissing him off, and there was nothing he could do about it. Cyrus had done plenty. Her skin was covered in the scars to prove it, but she didn't want to share more than she had to. Once his pack started to weaken and die, he wanted me to cure them. Their females could not breed. Those who did deliver lost their infants within days of birth. She swallowed, heat scorching her skin. She'd an old love for the pack, but the loss of those children haunted her dreams. There was nothing I could do. She cleared her throat, trying to distance herself from the shame that boiled up inside of her. I was weak from imprisonment, but even when I grew stronger, I was useless. She wrapped her arms around her waist. Their sickness had no cause or cure, nothing to treat. They're dying? Dante asked. We can't just wait them out? Not all of them. Only those Cyrus has turned in the last few years, she paused. What do you think? What does your wolf say? Finn asked. Ellen had spent hours pondering the cause. Wolves are loyal, noble, and strong. Their pack, their family, is what makes them so. Your pack is strong and united. They seek to protect and defend, as Mal did for Olivia. The others are none of those things, because their alpha has forgotten what it is to be a true wolf. Being a wolf is pretty fucking awesome, Anders chuckled. There was a rumble of overall approval, surprising her. Perhaps not all of the pack was eager for a cure. It was heartening to know. Why keep you then, if you couldn't cure the pack? Dante was still skeptical. She swallowed. My blood. It made him more powerful. And as his pack weakened, he craved strength more than anything. He needed me for that. According to Tess, still needs me. Are you fucking kidding me? Mal asked. Jesus. Anders covered his face with his hands. He drank your blood? Dante was up, rolling his neck and staring at the ceiling. I'm so sorry, Ellen. Olivia spoke softly. And I'm angry. For you. I wish there was something I could do. We will do something. Finn's words were a promise. We will kill him. Not like this. Not full of anger. Prone to mistakes. He'd like that. He'd have the advantage. She shook her head, hating the guilt and shame her past stirred. 
I will kill him. It is my right. A promise I made. A promise I must keep. All eyes were on her then, but no one said a word. What could they say? Her wolf was on alert, challenging them to argue with her. She'd bared her soul to them, but they'd be foolish to think that made her weak. Her past made her, her wolf, fierce and strong. And now they understood why. This is really some pissing match for him. The one with the biggest dick wins? Anders asked. Yes, not that I'd ever say it that way, she smiled, in spite of the tension stiffening her spine. Why target Jessa and the children, Olivia asked. Just to get to Finn? Ellen didn't want to answer that question. Olivia was still naive to know just how dark this world could be. For breeding, Finn ground out. You said your blood made him strong? Hollis spun to look at her, his eyes full of rage, his wolf's eyes. Because you're a born wolf. The moment Finn understood, he sagged forward. His hands stiffened, his fingers gripping the edge of his desk until the wood splintered and the sides collapsed in. Nothing compared to that feeling. Nothing. Cyrus wanted his children for their blood. They, like her, would make him powerful. Considering how much stronger Finn's pack was, who knew what the children's blood would do to Cyrus? Coldness seeped into her, bone deep and horrible. Hollis was breathing hard and wild-eyed, and on the verge of losing it, again, and it tore at her heart. Her wolf responded instantly. She wanted nothing more than to be alone with her mate, to give and receive comfort. But she knew the truth. Until Cyrus was dead, any comfort they'd find was fleeting. Chapter 18 Hollis was barely keeping it together. His wolf pushed to get out. As far as it was concerned, they needed to hunt down Cyrus and rip him into tiny pieces now, this minute. His body was shaking. Violence wasn't something he approved of, but the more Ellen talked, the more he was beginning to agree with his wolf. No matter how hard he concentrated on breathing and staying calm, his wolf rebelled. Skin tight, aching bones, jaw clenched, even his eyes felt dry and swollen. His wolf was growing impatient. Everything was braced, ready, but there was nothing he could do. What the hell would happen if his wolf forced his way out? He needed to learn how to communicate with his wolf, or this could end badly. It won't be easy. He's lived a long time. This, we, are merely entertainment. The edge to Ellen's voice told him she was struggling. If she was struggling, he would be fucking strong for her. She was strong and fierce and powerful, but Cyrus had kept her caged. He understood the hate she felt. It made his blood boil to think about it. It took every ounce of self-control he had to steady his heart rate, his breathing, and fight the red from his gaze. When Finn spoke, it was hard and cold. How long has he been alive? I don't know, she answered. My memories only go back so far. When was that? Finn asked. His earlier reticence gone. 1906, in the aftermath of the San Francisco earthquake. Ellen's voice was equally matter of fact. Hollis looked at her, longing to pull her up and into his arms. He respected her show of strength, but knew she'd only last so long. It had been hard for her to share with him, her mate, so this was worse but only he could see her hands, white-knuckled and clenched, resting in her lap. He reached for her, resting his hand on her back. She glanced up at him, her gaze haunted, lodging a knot in his throat. His wolf growled, rearing up inside of him. Touching her was his only choice, calming him and the wolf. He pressed a kiss to the top of her head and took in his pack's reactions. Now that he had Ellen, he knew exactly what his alpha was thinking about. Finn was thinking of Jessa. Of course he was, rigid with fear and anger. She was his mate, his world, and he had yet to turn her. He and his children would live lifetimes without her. Hollis couldn't imagine it. Luckily, he wouldn't have to. Mal tugged Olivia close, burying her nose against his temple, smiling. 
while Anders and Dante sat, stunned. Talk about taking lifelong commitment to a whole new level, Anders quipped, easing the tension in the room. Anything else? Mal asked, studying Ellen. I think this is more than enough for now, Finn argued. Mal, Olivia, head back tomorrow. Hollis, Ellen, wrap things up and head to the refuge as soon as possible. Give us a few days, Saturday, Hollis said. The plane will be on standby, Finn nodded. Once this is all over, we should all visit the vault. He smiled. I'm grateful for what you've shared, Ellen. I know it wasn't easy. Ellen nodded, but remained silent. See you soon, Finn paused. Siding or not, we need to be on high alert. The other's quiet was abnormal. They moved about with a sort of reckless challenge, daring the world to intervene and taunt their beasts. For entertainment. Ellen's simple explanation had been horrifying and illuminating. Whatever happened between the packs would decide their future. Finn's pack, their wolves, could not let Cyrus win. He had a lot to learn when it came to his wolf, but imagining Cyrus's death was something they could both enjoy. His wolf wanted to taste his blood, to split skin and bone with his teeth, to hear the man's screams and watch as the life drained from his eyes. It unsettled the shit out of him and filled him with strength that made him believe he could somehow manage to carry out this fantasy. His hands fisted at his sides, still grappling with all she'd been through. Avenging his mate was not a burden to his wolf, or to him. It was a necessity. How do you turn the thing off? Mal asked, shielding his eyes as he stooped to turn off the projector. Here, he offered, flipped off the projector and tried not to look at Ellen. If he did, she might sense his wolf. And then what? She wanted Hollis to accept him, to find a way for them to work together. He did, too. For the first time in his life, he wanted to be a wolf, to shift and fight and defend his pack and his mate. Self-loathing and frustration threatened to consume him. His heart murmur prevented his ability to shift, but that wouldn't prevent him from unleashing his wolf. Could his human form do what his wolf wanted? Glancing at Ellen, he knew the answer. He had no choice. Sitting, curled up in that chair, she was fragile. He took her hand as they made their way from the Robbins Pharmaceuticals and Research Facility and made the drive from the medical research park to their hotel downtown. He was aware of snippets of conversation, places to have dinner, going dancing, the lights and the water show along the river. But his mind was crowded and his body strung tight. When they arrived at the hotel, Ellen yawned. Tired? His gaze settled on the tattooed scar by her eye. Where had that come from? Did he dare ask? He swallowed. No, no more questions tonight. She nodded. I'll have a shower, and then we can have dinner. Sounds good, Olivia said, walking with her to the elevators. We'll be up in a minute, getting a drink first, Mal said, nudging him hard in the side. Once the women were on the elevator, Mal turned on him. You need to chill the fuck out. You're giving off all sorts of hunting vibes, and as far as I know, that's not an option for you. Hollis glared at him and headed into the bar. You're welcome, by the way. Figured you could let off some steam here and give her a break. Mal sat on the bar stool beside him. Today had to have been hell for you. He gestured for the bartender. Whiskey. Leave the bottle. In the beginning, Mal matched him drink for drink. When Mal switched to beer and he ended up drinking alone, he didn't know. Instead of comfortably numb, he wound up fuming. He knocked back his drink and then slammed the glass onto the counter. Mal stared at him, ever watchful, but blissfully silent. Done yet? Mal asked, eyeing the near-empty bottle on the bar. I need to pack. Who's stopping you? Hollis bit back. I'm not done getting drunk. Because that solves every damn thing, Mal sighed. Hollis scowled. I'm so goddamn tired of being the one to solve everything. He couldn't do a fucking thing about this. Any of it. He stared at the blinking fluorescent beer lines over the mirrored back of the bar. 
What fucking good is problem solving when you're facing sociopaths with teeth and claws? I thought you liked being the brains behind this pack. Mal sipped his beer. Maybe I'd like to be the muscle instead. You know, make an actual difference. He shook his head and pushed himself off the bar stool. Mal followed, his expression dark. Once the elevator doors closed, he said, I get you're upset. If Olivia had been through that, don't, he said on a growl. You can protect Olivia, Mal. I can't fight with the pack. I can't protect my fucking mate. Mal opened his mouth, but Hollis cut him off. I get she doesn't need much protection, but it would be nice to know I could, if the need arose. Mal kept quiet. And the vaccine? He paced the small space. The thing that's going to give us all our lives back? It's never going to work. Mal sighed. It's okay, man. I think the only person that hasn't accepted this is our life is you. I get it, too. But shifting doesn't make you a wolf. He's there. You're the only one that doesn't get that. It was like he'd been punched in the gut. His wolf was there, waiting for his place in the pack. Hollis kept pushing him aside, pretending he wasn't there, out of fear. But turning into a wolf was nothing compared to the fear of losing Ellen. Whatever Ellen and his pack needed, he'd do it. Facing Cyrus would be a hell of a lot easier if his wolf was with him. Ellen sat in the tub, her knees drawn up to her chest. It was done. Now they understood what they were up against. There had been no insults or slaps, no punishment for speaking out. No one had laid a hand on her. There had been no torture or rape. They'd listened to her and believed her. But the telling had been intense, and she was vibrating with barely suppressed anger. It was her favorite emotion. It kept her warm, active, motivated, and alive. Every cut, bite, punch, or minute in the hole had fed her anger, made it stronger and all-consuming and destructive. She'd spent so much time hating Cyrus and the others, so much time plotting their downfall, she'd stopped believing good existed. But now she had Hollis. He'd changed everything. With him at her side, she had hope. A pack. And if her wolf was right, so much more. A child. Her wolf was overjoyed, informing her as they'd wrapped up their teleconference with Finn. While the pack was rallying for a fight, she was fighting for control. How could she fight now? Are you sure? She whispered aloud. Her wolf was adamant. A child made from a pure bond. Due beneath the last blood moon of the decade. Her hands pressed against her stomach. This was what she'd dreamed of. A mate and child to love and protect. She had that now. So why was she so terrified? Her wolf growled, wanting to celebrate. This was her child, their child. To love and teach and cherish each day. I will protect you, she murmured, her hands resting against her abdomen. Your father will protect you and love you so. Father? How would Hollis react? She groaned, her head falling back against the side of the bathtub. His wolf wanted freedom. Every revelation she'd shared with the pack had driven his wolf closer to the edge. But he'd fought for control. Or his heart murmur had stopped the transformation. No matter how much she wanted Hollis to know his wolf and the freedom it would give to him, she wanted him alive more. What are we going to do? She asked, seeking guidance from her wolf. Somehow years of seeking revenge and holding on to every past wrong seemed trivial. How could she be angry, knowing she carried Hollis's child? A baby. My baby. Her wolf, the one determined to tear Cyrus from limb from limb before devouring him, had lost her fight. All that mattered now was keeping this child safe, bringing it into the world and watching it grow big and strong. Finn's pack would welcome the child as one of their own, and this child would never worry about the day Cyrus came for him or her. Finn and the pack would make sure of that. She had one job now, protecting this baby, and knowing that filled her with pure joy. 
Chapter 19 The elevator doors opened, and Hollis stalked down the hall. Leaving 30 to eat? Mal called after him. Hollis slammed into his hotel room without answering. He didn't want to go out with Mal and Olivia. He didn't want to be social. He wanted to see his mate. Touch her. Hold her until his wolf wasn't pleading to run. Over and over, the damn animal growled and snapped, refusing to be quiet. Hollis, Ellen's voice. His wolf instantly quieted to hear her. Wrapped in a fuzzy robe, fresh from the bath, she'd never looked more tempting. You look ready to shift, Hollis, she frowned, cradling his face in her hands and searching his gaze. Calm down, please. His wolf loved the sound of her voice. The damn thing practically rolled over, whimpering and groaning at the feel of her hands on his skin. His eyes closed. Shift? Me? Fucking hilarious. You're drunk. She pressed a hand to his cheek. He smiled down at her. Maybe a little. The scar by her eye enraged him all over again. Maybe not enough. Enough for what? Her gaze searched his, her hands tilting his face toward hers. To make me forget. He hated the sadness in her beautiful eyes. Just as quickly, her sadness was replaced with outrage. What do you need to forget? She pressed off his chest. You have a good pack. Your friends are loyal. And you have me. His kiss was brutal, his hands gripping her shoulders as he backed her against the wall. He needed this, needed her. Alcohol wouldn't ease the crush of fury surging in his veins, but maybe she could. He loved her fierceness. She would never cower. She wouldn't let anything hold her back, especially fear. She frowned at him, dismissing his display of temper as if he were a child. With a sigh, she gripped his hand, closed her eyes, and went completely still. His skin tingled, growing tender where she held him. Are you trying to get in my head? She ignored him, tightening her grip when he would have shaken her free. The torment on her face startled him. Her mismatched eyes flew open as she stared up at him. Lips pinched, hands trembling, and still she held on to him. This was wrong. She knew what it was to suffer, to really suffer. His inability to shift into some primal animal and vent his fury on instinct couldn't compare. Acting like an asshole wouldn't change a thing, except to make him more of an asshole. To Ellen, that's the last thing he wanted to be. He kissed her, tugging her lower lip until her mouth parted for him. The shudder of her breath rolled over him, drawing every hair on his body into the upright attention. She spun them slowly, pressing him against the wall and leaning against him. He groaned, nuzzling her jaw, behind her earlobe and along the curve of her neck. I'm sorry, he growled. I'm angry. But I shouldn't be taking it out on you. Her hold eased on his. You have every right to be angry. She drew in a wavering breath. Your wolf is just as trapped as you are. He wants to prove himself to you more than anything. I don't know how to do this, Hollis groaned, resting his forehead against hers. Help me free him, he whispered. Her lips latched onto his neck while her fingers eased the zipper of his slacks down. Her fingers slid inside, pulling his aching heart on into her grasp. His hips jerked, instantly needing her. He slid the robe from her shoulder and bit the soft skin beneath tugging the fabric apart and bearing her to him. Her breath hitched as his hands cupped her breasts, his fingertips rolling the tips until they were hard and tight. Her moan was heaven. Loving her was one of the few times he felt raw and powerful. Right now, that's exactly what he needed. She slid to her knees before he could stop her, her hands gliding his pants to the ground. Her tongue swirled around the tip of his dick. Her nails clawed his thighs, and when she sucked him deep into her mouth, his hands fisted in the short silk of her hair. Teeth and lips and tongue, she feasted on every inch of him, taking him deep into her throat, so deep that breathing grew more and more challenging. But she didn't stop, and every time he slid into the wet heat of her mouth, Hollis was one step closer to losing his fucking mind. 
she moaned, sending a bone-melting vibration along his shaft and into his balls. Once, twice, and he went over the edge. His hands cradled her head, his lungs emptied, and his heart damn near exploded in his chest. He came long and loud, leaning against the wall for support. Better? she asked, her hands still gripping his thighs. He nodded. Fuck, he rasped. That was the idea, she teased, smiling up at him. Fuck, he ground out, overwhelmed with need for her. He lifted her, bore her back onto the bed, and tugged the robe off. He loved her this way, naked and gasping beneath him, hunger blazing in her eyes. Your turn. He dropped to his knees, parted her thighs, and buried his mouth against her. He tasted the sweetness of her arousal on his tongue. Her fingers gripped his hair. No, Alice, I want you inside me, she tugged. Our wolves want it. He didn't give a shit about their wolves at the moment. Ask nicely. His tongue stroked over her. She gasped, her hands tightening and her hips shaking. Alice. His tongue stroked again. Her groan was hot as hell. He stared up at her, watching her nipples tighten and her face flush. Her head fell back as her breath powered out of her. He licked her again, sliding two fingers inside of her. She clamped down on him, groaning again. This time he groaned too. She felt so tight, so good. He couldn't wait to feel her climax. With tongue and fingers, he set a fast rhythm. She was writhing, arching into him, gasping his name over and over. And he loved it. When he nipped the tight bundle of nerves between his lips, she lost it. Her body bowed tight, the heat gloving his fingers, constricting with each spasm. Before she'd had a chance to recover, he'd slipped on a condom and driven deep. This is what you want, he growled. Always, she managed. Let's go, Hollis. Her nails clawed his back, then they bit into his ass. Don't hold back. Her wolf stared back at him. And just like that, he wasn't in control. The wolf had never been free to do as it wanted, and now it claimed the right to their mate. Whatever Ellen wanted, they would give to her. Over and over, the need to be one drove them on. He pulled out long enough to roll her onto her knees. He mapped every inch of her with his fingers and mouth. The indent of her spine, the curve of her hip, and the give of her skin beneath his hands. She arched back, hungry for him, and he didn't hold back. Oh, God, she cried out. Yes, please. Hollis ran his hands up her sides, arching over her back so he could cup her breasts in his hands. He bit her shoulder, his forefinger and thumb stroking and pinching her nipples as she tilted back for more of him. It went on until they were slick with sweat. All that mattered was her body, the need to claim her, to satisfy her, to show her that only he and his wolf could do this to her. His hands gripped her hips. He closed his eyes and let instinct take over. The slide of flesh on flesh, the taste of her sweat on his lips, the quiver of her breasts against his palms. Finally, the rhythmic clamping of her body around his dick. She came with a broken moan that released him, and he did, holding her tight against him until he was too exhausted to move. He collapsed on the bed, dragging her back into his chest. For the first time, his wolf was happy. Not that Hollis could blame him. If the animal couldn't run and hunt and fight, he could make damn sure Ellen was taken care of, often and with great enthusiasm. The wolf was there, waiting for him. He was thankful for giving him what he wanted. Ellen made him free. Hollis concentrated, doing his best to have a sort of conversation. It wasn't easy, but he tried. The wolf wanted to hunt. He wanted Hollis to let him take over so he could run. Hollis had no answer for the beast. Could a wolf understand he was too broken to shift? That he wanted to so fucking bad, but he couldn't? His frustration returned, instantly agitating himself and his wolf. Your heart picked up, Ellen said, rolling to rest her chin on his chest. 
Tell me what you're thinking. He stared at her. Or you could read me. I shouldn't have done that. She bit her lower lip, her fingers stroking along his chest. I'm no better at this than you are. Talking and sharing and... and feeling. There was no denying his smile. You do fine. Her gaze sharpened, her heart picking up as she whispered, I need to do better. He ran a hand over her head. Not for me. She opened her mouth, then closed it, her gaze searching his. Not for you, but for our baby. He stared at her, too stunned to think or speak or move or breathe. How could she be pregnant? They'd agreed to wait. They'd agreed Cyrus needed to be out of the picture before they had a family. They'd have been careless, but he'd made sure there wouldn't be consequences. Why the fuck was his wolf so happy? So damn happy. He wanted to be, but he... He wasn't sure what he was. A groan slipped through his lips, harsh and broken. Words stuck in his throat. You're angry, she whispered. Was he? No, he managed, flexing his hands. No, he repeated more firmly this time. Surprised, yes. In shock, hell yes. I couldn't take it, the pill. She lifted her chin, defiant and beautiful. I didn't believe I, we, would ever. And if there was a chance we'd make a child. Her cheeks were blazing red. I couldn't take it. According to his woof, her rationale made perfect sense. If the roaring in his ears would stop, maybe he could be logical. It didn't stop. Neither did the uneven thump of his heart, or the shallow, rapid pattern of his breathing. She was pregnant, and all of his concerns about his inability to protect her, to fight the others, to be a worthy fucking wolf reared up with a vengeance. You can't fight, he growled. She bristled. I can. I know you can. Damn it, you know what I mean. He never raised his voice, but right now he was tempted. He growled again, swallowing back most of it. You couldn't take the pill because there was a chance we'd made a child. Now you tell me there is. You won't put him, her, in jeopardy. I won't let you. I'll make fucking certain Finn won't let you. He paused, watching her closely. I can't handle that. My wolf can't handle that. After a moment's hesitation, she leaned into him. Because you love us. Heat rolled over him, from head to toe, before lodging in his chest. It was there, as sure and real as the bond they now shared. Love. Another word that didn't come close to the way he felt about this incredible, incredibly frustrating woman. His nod was stiff. This isn't about the survival of the species, Ellen. This is about our baby. Her and his. His wolf longed to howl, announcing their news to the world. He cleared his throat. Promise me you won't fight. She ran her fingers through his hair, her mismatched gaze searching his. I promise you. The fight drained out of him. I'll hold you to that. His hands cradled her cheeks. She carried his child. A baby. Your baby, she said, placing his hand against her stomach. What the child we will have. Her smile took his breath away. He crushed her against him then, overwhelmed by pride and excitement. He was going to be a father. He was happy and terrified. This child would be a wolf, something he knew far too little about but he had time to change that. He might never shift, but he was a wolf and it was time to accept that. His wolf was more than ready. Are you happy? Ellen whispered against his chest. I am, Hollis. I don't remember ever being so happy. That made him very happy. Yes, he murmured against the top of her head. But now it wasn't just him. It was Ellen, their child, and this child would be something Cyrus wanted, and Hollis was powerless to protect. His wolf was up, pacing and alert, assuring him that he'd survive a shift to protect his mate. 
Hollis didn't let her out of bed. Not when Mal came to ask about dinner. Not when Mal and Olivia left to return to the refuge. Not when room service brought them dinner on the following day. He, his wolf, wanted to show her how pleased this pregnancy made them. Apparently, they thought keeping her lost in a sensual haze of pure pleasure was the best way to do that. She agreed. Hollis had spent hours raining the sweetest torture down on her, making every inch of her overstimulated and aching. Even when he wasn't buried inside her, he kept her tight against him. She was boneless, sore, and throbbing, and delighted by the way he claimed her. His wolf was more present than ever, speaking to her wolf, confiding in his mate. He longed to run with her, worried about his inability to shift, and was tormented by his inability to protect her and their baby. His wolf fought to get out, tearing him apart in his need to protect her. Deep down, Ellen feared the same thing. But whether or not he could shift wasn't relevant. She would never put herself in danger that way. As much as I'm enjoying myself, she whispered, running her fingers through his hair, you have some work to do before we can leave for the refuge. His arm tightened around her waist. Work and wait. She pushed out of his hold and frowned down at him. Perhaps there are some things I'd like to take care of before we leave? He grinned up at her. Fine. He glanced at the clock. It's 10.30. P.M. Then no one will be there, she said, sliding to the edge of the bed. The vaccine trial with my blood should be back. You can't tell me you're not curious. Not at the moment, he teased. Who knew getting you pregnant was the greatest aphrodisiac of all time? She laughed. I'll be pregnant for some time. He kicked back the sheets and stood, stretching, giving her an incredible view of the body she'd enjoyed so thoroughly the last two days. The muscles of his back shifted as he stretched his arms high over his head. This beautiful man was hers. They showered, dressed, and headed to the lab. The evening security guard glanced up as they entered. Busy night, he said, nodding at them. Busy? Hollis asked, pausing. Miss Sue is already here, he grinned. Guess some of the research you do is time sensitive. Hollis looked her way, the suspicion on his face reflecting her own. Every instinct had told her something was wrong. Ellen was already running to the lab, her wolf urging her on. Kim Sue wasn't another. She and Hollis would know, but that didn't mean she wasn't working with them. Hollis was behind her, swiping his security badge and pushing the lab door open. Ellen followed, scanning the room, her wolf on high alert. No others, no unfamiliar sense. Just Kim. Dr. Robbins, Kim jumped, her voice echoing across the lab. I didn't know you were still here. She fumbled with the files in her hold, knocking some onto the floor. I, I was cleaning up. It's late, he said. Was there something pending I didn't know about? Kim looked back and forth between them. No, no. She was shaking. Hollis waited, but Kim didn't add anything. Why are you here, Kim? Hollis asked, closing the door behind them. Ellen focused on the woman, searching for clues. Her scent was bitter, tinged with fear. Pounding heart, rapid, short breaths. The woman was absolutely terrified. She squeezed Hollis's hand in warning. Kim's dark gaze darted between them. I had to. Her voice was unsteady, nervous, anxious. The look in the woman's eyes. She was keeping secrets. Why, she asked, keeping her voice soft. Was she stealing and selling Hollis's research? It would explain her agitation. Kim swallowed, the files in her arms shaking. Dr. Robbins. She stopped talking then, her gaze falling. My mother. Hollis frowned. I know she's been ill. Not ill. Kim shook her head. Someone took her. Ellen's heart sank. She didn't need to hear anything more. Cyrus had a hand in this. Ellen's wolf whimpered, pacing frantically. Took her? Hollis asked, shooting her a look. Have you called the police, Kim? No. He said not to. She sniffed tears streaking her cheeks. He? Ellen asked, keeping her tone as neutral as possible. Mr. White. 
Kim barely glanced at her. If that's his real name, or his real accent. She saw the slight droop in Hollis's shoulders. They both knew the truth. Cyrus had Kim's mother, and whether she did what he asked or not, the woman was probably already dead. Cyrus had no tolerance for the elderly, saying they'd outlived their usefulness, were too weak to do anything but slow things down, and they offered up their opinions without his asking. Cyrus hated that. Why don't we all sit down? Hollis suggested, crossing and taking the files from Kim. What can we do? Kim slumped into the chair Hollis pulled out. I have to do what he says. What has he asked you to do? She asked, sitting opposite the woman. Kim sniffed, taking the tissue. Initially, he was looking for people in the beginning. She sniffed again. He texted me pictures and asked me to let him know if I saw any of them. Her dark eyes settled on Ellen. You were one of them. Ellen stood, pacing the length of the lab. Of course he was looking for her. He needed her blood. He'd been without it for some time. That she was alive, helping Finn, made her a traitor in his eyes. He had to keep her alive, but that wouldn't stop him from punishing her. Her hands fell to her stomach. Her wolf growled, the hair on the back of its neck standing straight up. No matter what she'd told Hollis, she'd fight if she had to. It was hard to breathe. Hollis growled. You told him she was here? What choice do I have, Dr. Robbins? She sniffed, her voice wavering as she went on. He made it clear my mother's life was in jeopardy. She has serious health issues. Her English isn't good, and she's stubborn. Her fingers crumpled the tissue. Do you know this man, Dr. Robbins? Hollis nodded. Is he dangerous? She asked. What does he want? Our research, he murmured. You're smart, Kim. You know we've been working on things outside the norm. Her gaze met his. And I know it's important. You wouldn't take it so seriously. Be so intent if it wasn't. She glanced at Ellen. But I never thought what we were doing was dangerous, Dr. Robbins. I would never have participated if I'd known that. Risks are inherent when doing research, but not like this. They, they have my mother. We'll help you, Ellen said, noting the tightening of Hollis's posture, his pointed look her way. He wasn't pleased with her announcement. Her wolf informed her that his wolf wanted to hide her away, lock her up if necessary, until the pack had dealt with Cyrus. Her initial reaction was to remind him just how capable she was of defending herself. But she couldn't. She understood. Part of her, the damnably emotional and vulnerable part she tried so hard to ignore, wanted to be shielded from what was to come. But that was impossible. It wasn't in her to walk away from someone in need or shy away from conflict. Hollis knew that, even if it frustrated the hell out of him. Like now. She rested her hands on Hollis's shoulders, needing his touch and the calm it provided her. His hand covered hers instantly, tugging her against his back and threading his fingers with hers. Kim had no idea what was happening, or what was at stake, but they did. You said initially there was more? Hollis's voice was gruff. Kim cleared her throat. He wanted to know why she was here. I saw you taking her blood, Dr. Robbins. When I told him, he wanted the vials. You came here for them tonight? Ellen asked, her stomach dropping. Where are you supposed to deliver them, and when? Tonight, at one, she swallowed. At the Hemisphere Plaza. It will still be crowded, with fiesta going on, and public. Which was good. Maybe Cyrus wouldn't kill Kim. Maybe. He wanted to come here, but I told him about the security system and decided Hemisphere was better. Tonight, at one, Cyrus would be here. Her muscles twitched, her wolf pressing to be free before remembering the baby. If she had to face Cyrus, she'd get no help from her wolf. She sucked in a slow, deep breath and focused on remaining calm. Shit, Hollis ground out. We need to get you someplace safe. Not yet, Hollis. She took his hand. He doesn't know we know anything. They had time to come up with something, even if the pack couldn't help them. My mother? Kim asked. 
Doth this man honor his word? Is my mother safe? Ellen shot him a warning look. They knew what Cyrus was, but she didn't. There was the slightest chance he'd spare her mother. Why risk drawing attention to himself by killing an old woman? And probably Kim, before this was all over. Especially someplace public. Butterwolf was quick to point out why. Because this was Cyrus. And Cyrus didn't give a shit about drawing attention to himself or leaving destruction or pain in his wake. He wanted what he wanted, and would stop at nothing to get it. Still, she wished Hollis would buffer his answer. And to a certain degree, he did. I don't know, he murmured. Chapter 20 Hollis was fighting for control. His bones ached, strained by his wolf's efforts to break free. Now wasn't the time to panic. Being careful, deliberate, and rational was the best way to survive this. There was no chance Cyrus would honor his promise to Kim. But would he spare her life? Knowing the bastard, the chance was slight. He paced, his mind working through all Ellen had shared. The longer he paced, the more agitated Ellen and Kim became, until he stopped pacing. Kim, where is the latest strain of vaccine? he asked. Kim wiped her eyes and stood. It came back yesterday, she shook her head. No improvement, he asked. The mice died within an hour. The heart collapsed. She glanced between them. Do you want the data? Yes, and whatever samples we have left. He moved to the counter, preparing a catheter and sample tubes in case he needed more blood. What are you doing? Ellen asked, watching Kim as she retrieved the vaccine from the refrigerator. You've been gone for a while. He's probably weak. The motherfucker was probably out of his mind for her blood. Since Cyrus had grown reliant on her blood, being without it for six months would be a nightmare. Not that he could risk saying so out loud. The wolf was too close to losing his fucking mind as it was. Still, it might just give them the edge they needed. And impatient. You'll give him the tainted blood, she whispered. It will kill him or cure him. Either way, we win. He's not going to drink it right there. Ellen understood the way his mind worked, but didn't seem convinced. We'll have to make it irresistible, Hollis argued. Drink it? Kim asked horrified. Cyrus White is unlike anyone you've ever met before, Ellen offered. He focused on the task at hand, setting one vial of Ellen's blood aside and splitting the remaining into three new vials. He added the vaccine, shook the samples, and slid the rubber stopper in. You need to call Finn, Ellen said, staring at the vials on the metal tray. She looked resigned, almost defeated because she accepted they couldn't defeat Cyrus. She couldn't shift, he couldn't shift, and there was no way to win. And it had his wolf howling. He glanced at the clock as he dialed. It was almost midnight. They won't get here in time, he said. In time for what? Finn's voice reached him. What's happening? He's here. Hollis winced through Finn's long string of expletives before he summarized the evening's events. Kim's mother, the blood, Cyrus's imminent arrival, all of it. By then, the rest of the pack had joined in, too, their general sense of impatience and helplessness threatening his attempts to keep his own wolf in line. The tainted blood is a good idea, Finn said. Mal, have Gentry get the plane ready. He'll smell it, Dante argued. Knows something is different. Hollis cleared his throat then, torn between feeling guilt and pride. She's pregnant. Maybe that will cover it. Fucking A, Hollis, Anders laughed. I didn't know you had it in you. Congrats, man. With Helen? But that's scary as... Hollis silenced him with a glare. Mal interrupted. I'm with Anders on this one, Hollis. Never pegged you as a papa type. Hollis didn't disagree. What's the aversion to condoms? Dante asked. Is it a bond woof thing for you to lose your head and take stupid chances or what? Chill, Anders said. I get it. My wolf wants to get laid too. He laughed at his own joke. Congratulations, Hollis. Finn's voice was edged with command. But I imagine this complicates things? He asked, since she won't be able to shift now. 
Right, he ground the word out. Ellen was vulnerable. He was useless. And the pack was hours away. We're driving to the airstrip now. Should be in the air in five minutes. Gentry's calling up some help. Two of his former Special Forces team. They should be there soon. Might slow things down. But Special Forces didn't mean shit when a wolf was involved. They all knew that. We need more time, Hollis. You can't let her meet with him. We're 25 minutes from the city, Finn. He'll be expecting Kim at Hemisphere Plaza. The town's fiesta crazy right now, Dante groaned. People everywhere, Anders muttered. He's up to something, Finn growled. Always, Hollis agreed. We need to leave now to meet with him. She doesn't see him, he's not going to like it. Who the fuck cares, Mal asked. Don't let her go. The motherfucker will come after her and we'll be waiting. He has Kim's mother, Hollis reminded them. She's dead, Dante said, what they were all thinking. If there's a chance to save her, there's nothing I can do to stop Ellen from going, Hollis said. There was a long pause. I call bullshit, Mal said. I'm with Mal on this one, Hollis. Finn's exasperation was clear. We'll get there as fast as we can. Hollis released Ellen's hand and stood, crossing the lab and putting as much distance between him and Kim as possible. He couldn't afford having her run when she found out tonight's plan had changed it again. Where? he asked. He'll come to Kim's place, Finn sighed. Text me the address and we'll head straight there. We'll be ready for him when he comes. Were they ready? Hollis wanted to believe it. Then all of the living in fear would be over. What would life be like as a happy wolf? At the moment, it was beyond imagining. What weapons do you have? Dante asked. Some magnum prototypes still in development in the basement. Wide gauge, silver injectable bullets that dig in and release. A present for Gentry. He racked his mind for other options. Knives in the vault. Knives he wanted to use. He wasn't afraid of Cyrus anymore. He relished the idea of getting his hands on the bastard, of inflicting whatever pain he could. Puts you within his strike range, Finn argued. I'm counting on it, Hollis growled. Kim's not one of us, Finn. She's not going to let this go because you say so. Fucking lock her up, Mal jumped in. Her mother's dead. She'll be dead too if she goes tonight. Do what you need to do. Tell her whatever makes her stay, but it's not her choice. Keep her there, and we'll be there as soon as we can, Finn said. If we're lucky, this can end tonight with minimal bloodshed. The line went dead. Minimal bloodshed on their side. If he had it his way, Cyrus would be bled dry tonight. The Alpha had spoken. Kim wasn't going anywhere. It would be up to her how that went down. He didn't believe in scare tactics. His mind didn't work that way. Hard facts, information and data. He was an academic. So was Kim. I need to show you something, Hollis said, crossing the room to the wall safe only he had access to. As a woman of science, I need you to read it with an open mind. He punched in the code and opened the door, pulling the file he'd been keeping on Cyrus White out. With all due respect, Dr. Robbins, that can wait, Kim stood. My mother is all I have left. She is my world, the reason my dreams have come true. I don't understand who this man is or what he wants with your research, but I do know my mother needs my help. Hollis, she doesn't need to see that, Ellen argued. Once she knows, there's no going back. Kim stared at the file. Then Ellen. Who are you? She asked. She's a colleague. Someone who understands the infection we've been studying for the last seven years. He crossed the room and placed the file on his desk. And she's my... The woman I plan on spending the rest of my life with. He couldn't refer to her as his mate in front of Kim. Not without losing all credibility in a five-second span. This will explain things that might sound impossible. And why meeting with Cyrus White alone will only lead to disaster. Kim placed her hand on the file, her dark eyes filling with tears. All I want is my mother. Ellen grabbed the box of tissues off the top of the file cabinet and handed it to her. The look she sent Hollis's way mirrored all the restless torment that his wolf was battling. Ellen knew what she was capable of, but her pregnancy made shifting impossible. 
Hollis had no idea what his wolf was capable of, but he could never shift, or his heart would give out. Both longed to retrieve Kim's mother for her, but neither was physically capable. Help is on the way, Hollis offered, without promising a thing. Kim sat, ran her hands on her thighs, and opened to the file. Are you sure this is a good idea? Ellen asked him, her hand warm against his forearm. No, he answered honestly. But I'm not Mal. Or Cyrus. I won't lock her up for her own good, he paused, lowering his voice. Not yet. Ellen nodded, sliding up onto the counter to sit and lean against the wall. Hollis did his best to leave Kim alone, busying himself with straightening the lab before sitting at his desk to review his emails. It was 12.16. Kim sat, reading over the documents, notes, and copies of statistical documents that dated back more than a century. A list of dated accidents, victims' names, and unexplained deaths. Cyrus White's movements. What could be traced, that is. There was no avoiding the truth. Cyrus White was evil. This is the man who has my mother? Kim asked, skimming the last page. Yes, Hollis said, watching her closely. She shook her head. My mother is dead? We can't be certain, Ellen said. I feel confident she is, Hollis said, nodding at the clock. If she's not, you both will be once you give him the blood. You are like he is? Something more than human? I'd like to think we're better than he is, Hollis offered, most of the time. All this time you've sought to cure yourself and those you love? He nodded. And been unsuccessful. But you keep trying. It's what we do for those who matter. Kim stood. The blood will kill him? Or cure him, Ellen offered. That was the original design. One we've failed to achieve, Hollis reminded her. For the first time, he was glad he'd failed. Cyrus didn't deserve to live. And, damn it, carrying the pack, carrying Ellen, felt wrong. If I take it to him, I can get my mother, and you'll still have the element of surprise, Kim said. I have to try. He shook his head. I can't let you go, Kim. She stared at him, fear tightening her features. You can't let me go, she whispered. Are you going to kill me now? Now that I know your secret? Jesus Christ, Hollis groaned. We've worked together for years, haven't we? She nodded. Do you honestly think I'd hurt you? He waited for her to shake her head before going on. I can't let you go because I won't have your death on my conscience. But do you expect me to live knowing I killed my mother? Kim shook her head. She's already dead, Kim. Ellen's words were soft but firm. He's using you, telling you what you want to hear. And I promise, it will end badly for you. You can't make me stay here. Do nothing. Her dark eyes widened. I can't. You can, Hollis assured her. His wolf was more than willing to follow Mal's instructions and lock her up. This is my fault. It's my responsibility to fix it. What did Finn say? Ellen asked, pressing a hand against his back. We wait for him at Kim's place. Hollis held his hand up when Kim started to protest. I want him dead, but not at the expense of your life. He glanced at the clock. I've got something in the basement that might offer some added protection. And the knives. In the vault? Ellen asked. Well, you'll stay until this is over, he stared at her, pressing his hand to her stomach. You promised me. Her hand clasped his wrist. I promised you I wouldn't fight. I refused to hide. Don't push me, Ellen, he snapped. This isn't about you anymore. This is about our baby. Baby? Kim whispered. Ellen shoved his hand away. She could be mad at him. She could argue and fight with him. He didn't care. On this, there was no negotiating. He might not be able to shift, but his wolf was more than willing to make things clear. She was sitting this one out. I'll be back, he stared at her, long and hard, torn between pulling her close and locking her in the vault. Instead, he left them in the lab.
Ellen paced the lab, her gaze returning again and again to the large clock mounted on the wall. Each tick echoed, plucking at her nerves and driving her wolf closer and closer to the brink. It was almost one, and Hollis hadn't returned. She'd texted him, but he hadn't responded. It might be the basement. Kim had a hard time looking at her. Bad reception? But her voice was quivering. Right, she agreed. But her wolf refused to be pacified. The faint vibrations of the overhead fluorescent lights rose until Ellen's ears hurt. The air seemed too thin, making every breath unsteady and labored. Her wolf grew restless. It refused to still. Something had happened. Something was wrong. Every instinct told her to do. Her wolf was a hunter, proud and strong, but her wolf refused to act. She agreed with Hollis. The baby came first. Kim kept her phone out, staring at the screen, her long black hair spilling forward to shield her face. She was easy to read. The poor woman's nerves stretched so tight Ellen worried she'd pop. One o'clock came, and they both held their breath. But then it was five after. Ten after. No call. No Hollis. Ellen's wolf was frantic. She wasn't going to wait a minute longer. She had to know Hollis was safe. It was possible Cyrus was watching the lab. But why hadn't she or Hollis sensed another? Unless, like Kim, he was using humans to relay information. Who else is here? Ellen asked, her mind turning over possibilities. Kim listed off the essential overnight personnel. Do you know them? Trust them? Ellen asked. Dr. Robbins screens every employee carefully, Kim frowned. That didn't stop Cyrus from finding a way to control you. Ellen tried to temper her voice. I believe no one here intended to betray Hollis, but things don't always work out according to plan. If we were monitored, they'd know you never left, and we were here with you. Kim seemed to hold her breath, understanding dawning. We need to find Dr. Robbins. Ellen nodded. Not that Kim would be searching alone. Her wolf didn't approve, reminding her of how in tune Cyrus was with her. He would send her. She shuddered, the image of his lips stained with her blood flashing through her brain. Kim glanced. It's one thirty. Something's wrong? Yes, Ellen said, her stomach churning. Her wolf whimpered, frustrated and anxious. She couldn't lose Hollis. She couldn't lose this baby. She couldn't be distracted worrying over Kim and her safety. You should stay here, she said to Kim. No, Kim argued. What if you need help? If the woman hadn't been so serious, Ellen would have laughed. But Kim was truly concerned for her well-being. The woman was hardly five feet tall, and so thin, Ellen could pick her up with one hand. A wolf could snap her in two with one swipe of the paw. It's not a good idea, Ellen assured her. Neither is charging into an unknown situation, Kim straightened. Wait, Dr. Robbins has access to the security camera feeds in his office, Kim said, already brushing past Ellen and into the hallway. We should check that before you do anything. Fine, Ellen agreed. It was smart. She'd no idea of the building's overall layout. Wandering into Cyrus or another without knowing a way out would end things before they got started. Still, her anxiety only increased as Kim led her down the hallway and into Hollis's office. A quick glance around the cavernous gray, chrome, and modern space gave no insight into her maid or the man she so loved. It was sterile as the lab. All modern design and sharp edges. Cold, cool, and impersonal without a single photo or evidence of Hollis's existence. And his absence was overwhelming. Where are you? It hurt to breathe then, her mind instantly dragging up all the horrors the others were capable of. But the others weren't here. Cyrus wasn't here. Kim clicked away on the computer keyboard, glancing at the wall of monitors opposite them. He still hasn't updated the password for the new software they installed last week, she sighed, shaking her head. Ellen smiled. How long have you worked for him? Almost eight years. Kim said, hitting two more keys and sitting back. The monitors came to life. 
the sudden burst of light and color sending her wolf into a tailspin. No sign of Hollis. Nothing. No movement. Empty halls. The custodial crew should be here, Kim said, clicking through a series of rooms. All empty. The front desk? Ellen asked, hovering over Kim's shoulder. There's a security guard stationed at all times? Two, Kim agreed. They take turns patrolling. With the stroke of a few keys, the desk appeared. There's no one at the desk. Ellen stood. You have to have a key card to access this floor? She glanced at the glass door, her skin twitching. Yes, three floors require a key card and access code to be entered. The basement, where Dr. Robbins went, houses all our weapons research. Then the top two floors. What are the doors made of, she asked. The doors? Kim frowned. Why does it matter? Because we're strong, Kim. Strong enough to go through sheetrock walls and metal doors. She pressed the key Kim had used, scrolling through the rooms again. But I know Hollis, and I'm counting on him to have taken all the over-the-top precautions that would prevent the others, Cyrus, from getting in. She paused, a shadow moving across the corner of the screen. What room? She asked, tapping the screen. The warehouse, Kim murmured, glancing at her watch. We get overnight pharmaceutical deliveries. It requires less security and signatures. Just one from the overnight tech. Meaning you have employees working now? Ellen asked. Where are they? A handful of techs work on the manufacturing floor to monitor production and the machinery. Kim twisted her hair until it formed a bun. Then she stabbed a pencil through it. But there's no sign of them either. Ellen could hear the increase in Kim's heart rate and the waver in her breathing. She was scared. When is help supposed to arrive? Soon, I hope, Ellen answered, watching as Kim flipped through the screens again. She moved closer, freezing where she stood when Cyrus appeared. He was waiting, staring at the camera with a smile on his face. Oh, my God, Kim's voice broke. Is that, that him? Yes, Ellen said. Where is this? The warehouse office, Kim said, her voice almost a whisper. Look, the wall behind him. Streaks of red covered the wall. Breathe. Calm. He wouldn't kill Hollis. Not yet. Not without some answers. Where is my mother? Kim asked. Focus. Ellen didn't know what to say. Cyrus, still staring at the camera, picked up the phone on the desk and pressed a button. Kim's phone rang, making them both jump. Kim answered, putting the phone on speaker. Hello? Kim. Cyrus's voice echoed in the room. Where are you? Ellen frowned. He knew Kim was here. What else did he know? Lie to him, Ellen hissed. Your car is broken. Kim sucked in a deep breath, the words spilling out, strung together and uneven. My car wouldn't start, Mr. White. His pale brows rose. Then it's good I came. Yes. She stared at Ellen, terrified. Kim wasn't the only one who was terrified. What the hell was she supposed to do? Trapped in her human form, pledged to protect her baby. She was useless, a perfect pawn for Cyrus, if he got his hands on her. And Kim? Kim was as good as dead. Maybe it would be better to lock her in the vault. It might be the only way to save her. The back door was open. I assumed you were inviting us in, Cyrus smiled. You can see me? Yes, Kim said. Is my mother with you, Mr. White? In the car outside, he smiled. I'll take you to her as soon as I have the blood samples. Ellen shook her head, mouthing. Prove she's alive. I, I need some assurance she's alive, Mr. White, please. Kim added, her voice so unsteady her words were almost undecipherable. What you need is irrelevant at this point. His smile tightened. You're not alone, are you, Miss Sue? I smell your companions. Kim sat quickly, her dark eyes blinking rapidly as she cleared her throat. Dr. Robbins is here, working in the lab, she paused. He saw you? Cyrus asked, pale eyes narrowing. 
I told him I'd forgotten to sign off on the slips for tonight's delivery, she shrugged. In the lab? Cyrus asked. Perhaps I should come up for a visit. You'd need clearance from the security guards. I don't think so. They're no longer with us. Though they did put up a valiant fight, Cyrus finished. Oh, Kim pressed her hands to her chest. You hurt them, didn't you? Cyrus shook his head. No, I didn't hurt them. I killed them. I might make time for hurting when it comes to Dr. Robbins. He stepped back as two men pushed Hollis forward. He was duct taped into a black office chair. One eye was swollen and bleeding, the other scowling. He shook his head. His muffled protest cut short when Cyrus drove his fist into his stomach. How Ellen wound up on her knees on the carpet, she didn't know. Her wolf was frantic, torn between protecting her mate and their child. Only Hollis's words stopped her shift. This was his child. She'd promised to care for it. I'm waiting, Ms. Sue, he paused. I don't want to die, Mr. White, Kim said. We might be able to negotiate an alternative, he smiled. Shall we come up, or will you come to us? Kim stared at her, frantic. Ellen nodded. I'm on my way, Kim mumbled. Cyrus hung up. Follow me, Ellen said, all but dragging her to the lab. She pulled the one vial of untainted blood open and poured it on Kim's hands and arm. What are you doing? Kim asked, trying to pull away. He needs to drink the blood as soon as possible, she explained, pressing the other vials into her hand. The smell should be enough. Even if he only drinks one, it should be enough. I'll follow you down, Kim. I'll be right behind you. But your baby, Kim said, staring at her stomach. Dr. Robbins can't turn, can't become what Cyrus and those men are. Her mind sifted through the possibilities, but she had no other options. She fired off a quick text to Finn, pleading with him to come straight here, then faced Kim. Hollis has a heart murmur that prevents him from being what he is. As much as it pained her to admit it, if Hollis was able to shift, he would have done it by now. I can't lose him. I won't. She pulled Kim toward the elevator. I'll be right behind you. She waited for the elevator doors to shut before she typed in the code on the vault. The voices greeted her, soothing her wolf and her rage. She couldn't afford to get caught up in emotion tonight. A quick search turned up two lethal-looking amputation knives, an old scalpel, and the silver dagger kept in the vault for safekeeping. It wasn't much, but it would have to be enough. Her wolf gave up resisting. She was trapped inside. She might as well give Ellen her strength, her speed, and her fight. Chapter 21 Hollis was losing his mind. Fists punched, feet kicked, and one solid blow to the back of his head seemed to knock everything loose. Bones snapped, his ribs. One lung was filling with blood and making breathing difficult. And his wolf waited for more. Somewhere behind the pain, a red-hot fury was brewing. His vision shifted, flickering red until his eye sockets felt singed. His hands gripped the chair, nails piercing the fake leather cover and bending the metal beneath. How he ended up here was a blur. He'd gone to the basement, shoving a duffel bag full of the latest weaponry in, then headed back to the elevator. He'd grabbed a smaller gun, turning it over in his hand. He'd tested it. It was deceptively small for the punch it packed. He shoved a clip into his pocket, the gun into the waistband of his pants, and smoothed his shirt and his lab coat over it. His wolf hadn't wanted to take the elevator. That was the first alarm. He'd pulled his phone from his pocket and texted Finn. They wouldn't need to go to Kim's to find the others. His wolf assured him they were already here. Fuck. He took the stairs, pressing himself flat against the wall as he navigated each turn up to the warehouse. If he sensed them, they probably already knew he was here. There was no fucking way he was going to lead them to Ellen. He pulled the gun out and pushed through the doors. The night techs, men who had been on his payroll for years, were stacked inside the office. Bodies pale and blood spattered. They'd had their throats ripped out. 
In the time it had taken for him to realize that, he'd been clubbed on the back of the head and kicked in the chest. Now he was taped to a fucking chair, and a fucking other had his gun. Not that Hollis cared at the moment. Cyrus was watching him. Closely, those near colorless eyes blank and empty. Whatever semblance of a soul this man, this creature, once had was long gone. In his place was evil. Cyrus smiled as he pulled a long skinny knife from the shoulder holster beneath his jacket. You're the brains, aren't you? Dr. Hollis Robbins. I've read papers about you. Noble sacrificing, hoping to save the world? He shook his head. Pathetic. Considering you can't even save yourself, can you? He leaned forward, sniffing his head and face. I won't waste any silver on you, he said, slotting the knife into Hollis's chest inches from his heart. His wolf growled, thrashing to be free. Cyrus waited, watching. No wolf? With a sigh, he stepped back and waved the two others forward. We'll see what it takes to pull him out. Hollis almost laughed then, until they went to work on him. Broken nose, the spurt of hot blood on his cheeks, and crunch of cartilage was proof. The knife pulled free, then buried in his thigh, his shoulder, pinning one hand to his chair. His wolf welcomed the pain, drowning in it using it to truly wake his senses and form. The ding of the elevator ended the assault on his body. Even his wolf froze, terrified at what was waiting on the other side of the elevator doors. The sight of Kim, small and trembling, was a huge relief, and horrible. Miss Sue? Cyrus stepped forward, wiping the blood from his knuckles with a pristine white handkerchief. How delightful to meet you. Hollis stiffened at Ellen's scent. On Kim, her blood stained the woman's hands. You smell like my favorite snack, Cyrus rasped, leaning forward to sniff Kim's hands. What happened? Uh, I'm shaking, Kim explained, holding out the remaining vials. I'm sorry, too tight. Cyrus took the vials, lifted her hands closer to his nose and breathed deep. How very wasteful of you. This is nectar of the gods, Miss Sue. Did you know that? His smile chilled Hollis's insides. Addictive. His tongue traced along Kim's arm. Delicious. Kim gasped, her attempts to break free of his hold failing, miserably. No, he spoke softly. He gripped her by the throat and lifted her from the floor, shaking her. You do as I say, or you won't like the consequences. He placed her feet on the floor, his hold easing enough for her to breathe. I'm sorry to say your mother didn't listen, Miss Sue. Kim was sobbing now, her hands at her throat. Cyrus eyed the vials, a real smile on his lips. He pulled the cork free and downed one vial. His eyes closed, then opened. Another vial drained his groan enough to make Hollis's wolf see red. But then Cyrus's smile was replaced by something hard, cold, and absolutely terrifying. You, he asked, his voice coarse, his jaw thickening and stretching. You touched her? You made life grow inside her? Because she is mine, Hollis yelled the words, muffled by the tape. She was his, and Cyrus would never lay a hand on her. He closed his eyes, hoping she'd honor the vow she made him, yet knowing, deep down, she couldn't. Kim backed away. Maybe it was the sudden movement or the effects of Ellen's blood, but Cyrus snapped. He slapped Kim hard enough to send her into the wall. Her small form slid to the ground as the second elevator dinged. The doors opened, but the elevator was empty because his mate was brilliant, fierce, and made for battle. Hollis could do nothing but watch as she approached silently. With one kick, the other's knee snapped out, sending him forward, but her fingers gripped his head, twisting sharply, and tore the man's head free before he ever hit the floor. 
The surprise on his face was almost comical. Almost. Hollis jerked against his bonds, bucking against the chair when the remaining other turned, moving toward Ellen. The blade she threw lodged itself in the man's eye. He tipped back onto his heels, his arms pinwheeling, while she sliced cleanly through his neck with what looked like an antique surgical knife. She stood, knives dripping, and stared at Cyrus. You're here. The excitement in Cyrus's voice was jarring. He was mesmerized, staring at Ellen with something that made Hollis's skin crawl and his wolf howl in desperation. This is a surprise, Ellen. A wonderful surprise. God, he loved the fury on her face. There was nothing more beautiful or more terrifying. Let him go. Her growl made his wolf howl. The good doctor? Your stunted wolf of a mate? He bared his teeth. Let him go, Ellen's jaw flexed, and Kim too. Let him live? What about the dozen wolves waiting outside? They didn't come here to escort you home, Ellen. They came here looking for a fight. Cyrus's pale brows rose. Her smile was hard. They came here because you made them come here, and they will leave fight or not, if you tell them to go. His smile was surprisingly genuine. Come with me now, and I will tell them to go. Hollis jerked, fighting the tape and rope binding him in place. His protests were muffled by the tape covering his mouth. She wouldn't go. She wouldn't, but that didn't stop him from yelling. A seed of doubt had been planted. She'd said she'd put their child first. Protecting their baby was all that mattered. And yet she was the reason two men were dead on the floor. To protect him, his wolf was quick to remind him, as they would protect her. But he couldn't protect himself. How could he expect to protect her? His wolf reared up, pushing inside until it hurt to breathe. Ellen, he barked her name, over and over, cursing the fucking tape. He's worried about you, sitting there, trapped in his human body too weak to free himself, let alone defend you. Why him, Ellen? Cyrus asked, not bothering to look at him. He can't satisfy you. He can't protect you. He can't understand you. He is an embarrassment to the wolf. Ellen's lip curled, her hands fisted at her sides, but she kept quiet. Or is the abomination in your stomach what he's worried about? Cyrus shook his head. You must have gone into heat to let one of these false wolves taint your bloodline. Fuck you! I will gut you! Hollis growled against the tape, knowing his insults were indecipherable and not caring. He wished the bastard understood every word he said, wished it would taunt him into action. You're going to die! He fought harder, tugging until his skin burned from the rope. His wolf was losing it, pushing and clawing to get out. All that mattered was Ellen. Fuck Cyrus and his pack. She had to live. She had to be safe. She wouldn't go. She'd given him her word that she'd protect their child. Cyrus studied her, his pale eyes narrowing. No one else will die tonight. Ellen! Hollis pleaded. If she'd look at him, she'd understand. Ellen, damn it, don't! But she wouldn't look at him. No matter how hard he stared at her, no matter how much his wolf pleaded with hers. I give you my word, Cyrus said, holding his hand out to her. Ellen's gaze fell to the ground, searching the blood and carnage for something. His gaze followed hers, hunting until he understood. The vials. Two empty vials. As much as he wanted to believe they'd have an effect on Cyrus, he wasn't willing to risk her life on it. Or the life of his child. Her mother? There was resignation in her voice, and it turned Hollis's stomach. I prefer my dinner young and tender. But waste not, want not. Cyrus glanced at Kim. She'd be tastier. 
A snack, but filling. Ellen glanced at Kim's form, crumpled in the corner. Put the blades away, Cyrus. Hollis watched as the fight drained from Ellen. He knew deep down she'd already made her decision, and his wolf was mad as hell. I'll go with you, she mumbled. Cyrus nodded, tucking the blade back into his jacket with practiced skill. He moved quickly and tugged at the small blade from Hollis's hand. The slide of metal on his bones had his teeth on edge, but he kept quiet. Shall we? Cyrus asked, gesturing toward the warehouse door. He pressed a button, the large metal garage door sliding up and revealing the empty loading docks outside. Beyond that were three unmarked white vans waiting. She was leaving, walking away. But when she looked back at him, he saw only trust. Her wolf. She knew what he was capable of and trusted him to do it. Cyrus's hand rested on Ellen's back, his voice low. Do you understand you will be punished, Ellen? You know that. And this child of yours belongs to me. A sort of bloodlust descended on his wolf. His vision burned red. Cyrus's words echoed in his ears until his skull was bursting. His skin was hot and tight, lancing with a relentless and blinding pain. Hollis understood how pain worked. Specialized sensory receptors detected unpleasant stimuli, transforming the stimuli into electrical signals and passing them to the central nervous system. It was a chemical process all living things experienced. To free his wolf, pain was necessary and welcome. He closed his eyes and concentrated. The roll and twist of muscle made him freeze. Bones moved, each click and snap more pronounced than the last. A surge of strength crashed into him. The tape couldn't hold him. The chair he was tied to shattered beneath him. His spine and hips realigned, pushing him forward onto his hands and knees. And still the pain was welcomed. Kim's scream was faint, a distant echo. His heart was thumping, the liquid squish of his lungs growing heavy and full. His chest collapsed in on itself before swelling forward and expanding. Skin split, the tearing, searing sensation raw, but bearable. Fingers and toes broke and came together. Hands and feet twisted, long claws slicing through the newly layered muscle and fur. His heart thumped on, out of rhythm and irregular, squeezing. His jaw dislocated, the grade of bone on bone as the hinge joint ground into place. His nose, already broken, lengthened, allowing sense to sharpen. Sounds echoed, reverberated, the hum of the computer, and Kim's panicked crying. When he opened his eyes, his world was forever changed. Minute details magnified instantly, providing added depth and perception. Breathing was easier. The wounds Cyrus and the others had caused were gone, but his heart shuddered to a near stop, leaving him dizzy and disoriented. His wolf refused to be stopped. Whether or not Ellen agreed with him, their child needed protection. Nothing would stop him. He was a wolf, and it was time he started acting like it. He gritted his teeth as his heart pumped, torqued hard, and stilled for one long second. It began again beating strong and steady for the first time in his life, and the power of it rolled over him. Dr. Robbins? Kim asked. His wolf was in charge now, and he wanted blood. A long, low howl split from his throat, calling out a challenge as he ran out the open door. The first white van came to a screeching halt. The door slid open and Cyrus climbed down, smiling ear to ear. Hollis's wolf didn't hesitate. He charged. He didn't care about the vans, the others shifting for a fight, or how outnumbered he might be. It didn't matter. Where was she? As long as she was safe, as long as she was alive. His gaze swept the parking lot, scenting the air until he found her. The doors to a van was opened. She lay on the floor her hands and feet tied, and her mouth gagged, her nose bleeding and her eyes closed, a silver collar around her neck. 
It was all the motivation he needed. His wolf said they could do it. If she believed him, he wasn't about to argue. His wolf would lead. He would follow. They both agreed. No one would take her from them. Cyrus shrugged out of his jacket and shirt, waiting. He held his blade in his hand, braced and ready. No shifting. No fear. Only anticipation. Big mistake. The door stayed open, giving his wolf all the incentive he needed. Ellen would be fine. Their baby was fine. No matter what, his wolf would make sure of that. Cyrus had no idea what he'd done, but Hollis's wolf was only too happy to show him. Ellen may have shown him he was a wolf, but Cyrus had unleashed it. And now his wolf wanted nothing more than to see Cyrus bleed out on the concrete under their feet. Your loyalty is surprising, Dr. Robbins, if misguided. She's mine. She's always been mine, Cyrus taunted. His words were like gasoline on an open flame. You will die here tonight, and she will go home with me. Hollis let the fury engulf him. Instinct was all the wolf needed. A pack of others stood between him and Cyrus. His wolf looked forward to the practice. Combining his medical knowledge with the wolf's physical dominance was highly effective. A claw swipe to the back of the leg meant slicing through the fibular artery. Sinking his teeth into the belly of an attacker was easy. Teeth shredded muscle to disembowel his victim. Death wasn't necessary. Razor sharp claws shredded skin, muscle and bone, disabling his foe and freeing him to move on to the next one. He was only beginning to realize how powerful he was. And so were the others. Seven bodies lay on the ground. Six others hesitated, staring between him and Cyrus. Suddenly, their own mortality mattered. Maybe Ellen was right. Maybe cutting off the head would free the rest. Maybe killing Cyrus could end this all. If only the vaccine would work. But he saw no dilated pupils, heard no break in Cyrus's breathing, or involuntary spasms of his muscles. A challenge? Cyrus asked. You're so quick to die. Hollis charged, dodging Cyrus at the last minute. Claws gouged a hunk of meat from Cyrus's thigh. A warm spurt of blood spattered Hollis's fur, the scent mingling with the stench of fight, adrenaline, pain, and death. His wolf breathed it in. Cyrus's grip on the knife tightened as he swung the blade with enough force to split muscle from bone. The impact was jarring. The pain unexpected. Hollis shook it off, his wolf dismissing the blinding throb of the wound. He circled, moving in, then backing off. Cyrus didn't like it, so Hollis's wolf kept at it. He was light on his feet, quick. His opponent hadn't expected that, and it gave him the edge he needed. The wolf pounced, knocking the man face first to the concrete parking lot. He bit into the thick trapezius, shredding the muscle fibers on the right side before he leaped back. Cyrus rolled, his eyes blazing with rage. You can't hurt me. You're not a real fucking wolf, he smiled. That's why your mate left you. She missed a real man in her bed. A real wolf. Hollis's wolf lost control, and Cyrus used it against him. He attacked blindly, putting himself in harm's reach. Arms like steel bands clamped him tightly. A searing burn slid deep in his side. The fucker's blade fit between his ribs to puncture his lung. But it wasn't just the blade. His blood felt heavier, thicker around it, weighing him down and making his already labored breathing a true challenge. Silver, Cyrus ground out, ramming the blade deeper. Hurts, doesn't it? It will weaken you, too. You'll see. His wolf fought harder, frantic to knock the blade free. When that didn't work, he bit into Cyrus's right hand, crushing bone until Cyrus released him. Enough, Cyrus said. Is this little display because she's watching? You're the only one who doesn't know you've lost. Hollis wouldn't look at Ellen. He couldn't. He had to focus. Cyrus smiled. Have you ever fought a wolf, Dr. Robbins? Time to teach you what the pain is. Ellen moaned then, the muffled sound echoing in the van, demanding his attention. 
pain didn't describe the pressure that threatened to crush his chest. It was more urgent, desperate, and impossible to ignore. He knew what pain was. Having her in danger, their baby in danger, and knowing she hadn't trusted him to keep either one of them safe, it shredded his heart and infuriated his wolf. He's mine, Cyrus said to his pack before he fell forward onto his knees, his body contorting and stretching. Now would be a good time to attack. Cyrus had never been honorable. There was no reason Hollis had to be. His wolf could easily tear him to pieces. But he wasn't Cyrus. He scented cars arriving, aware of the rubber on asphalt, the low hum of an engine, but his gaze remained on Cyrus. Whether it was more others, police, or Finn, he couldn't afford to look. Now was the time to finish this. For Ellen, for his pack, for his child, and for his wolf. Cyrus's massive white wolf charged him, his teeth sinking into Hollis's back leg and flipping Hollis onto his back. Neck exposed, Hollis dug his back legs into Cyrus's stomach and kicked with all he had. Cyrus flew back, slamming into the parking lot, shaking his head as he stood on all fours. Cyrus wavered then, his body racked with sudden coughing. Blood dripped from his jaws, pulling on the ground beneath his front paws. The vaccine. Cyrus glared at him, his growl wet and garbled. Internal bleeding. Cyrus charged again, leaping onto Hollis's back and biting into his shoulder. He hung on, as if he knew what was coming. Teeth sunk deep. He tugged with all his strength, pulling the fur and muscle free from Hollis's shoulder. Hollis growled, falling hard onto his back and pinning Cyrus between him and the asphalt beneath. Cyrus's body going unexpectedly still. Hollis stood, staring down at the white wolf. Eyes rolled back, tongue lolling. The wolf seized violently, flopping against the concrete before going still again. White fur receded as Cyrus's involuntary shift began. Shifting now meant certain death, but staying in wolf form wouldn't help him recover this time. The vaccine stole that from him. Stunned, Cyrus pushed himself up and onto his feet. His misshapen hands clawed at his own chest and throat, an ear-splitting screech piercing the air as the man's warped chest expanded farther. Stuck between wolf and man, Cyrus's eyes bulged as he stared at Hollis, his entire body bowing tight before blood erupted from his mouth. Hollis watched, stunned, as Cyrus's chest swelled, expanding rapidly. Blood streamed from his nostrils, eyes, and ears. You did th this. His words were thick and slurred, but the hate and fear in his eyes was enough. He knew he was dying, and Hollis and Ellen had killed him. Hollis's wolf nodded. He wanted Cyrus to know. One way or another, he had killed the other's alpha. With an anguished cry, Cyrus pressed his hands to his throat. Body swaying, his chest expanded severely, then popped as his skin, muscle, and bone collapsed in on itself with a sickening wet crunch. He dropped to the ground, his pale eyes murky, the shift incomplete. Cyrus's remains were grotesquely broken, twitching and heaving on the blacktop. And then nothing. The silence stretched until the fur on the back of his neck bristled. The other's wolves were breathing hard, panicked, ready to fight but hesitant to start something with an unknown outcome, and no one to lead them. They wouldn't just be facing him now. The scent of Finn in his pack assured him he was no longer alone. Ellen was struggling to sit up in the van, eager to fight but unable. A silver collar circled her long, slim neck, infuriating his wolf, keeping him ready and willing for whatever the rest of the pack might throw at them. We don't have to fight, Finn used his alpha voice, commanding and strong. Your alpha is dead. Whatever you do now is your choice. The other's confusion was understandable. Their leader used fear and intimidation. How would they react when confronted by the people who Cyrus had convinced them were their enemies? 
his death would divide them. Some would hold on to his teachings. Others would be open to change. A lethal growl sounded before three wolves attacked, two more following. Hollis answered the growl, planting his front paws and bared his teeth. The two that followed broke off and turned back, hiding behind the protection of their pack. The clash of teeth and claws was quick. His wolf wanted this, needed it, and offered no mercy. When it was over, they lay dead, and he was bleeding from the snout and neck. But the overwhelming urge to kill was beginning to fade. Better, Anders asked him. Hollis snorted. What the hell happened to him? This is seriously fucked up shit, Mal whispered, staring down at what was Cyrus. What the fuck did you do? He sort of exploded, Dante added. Anders grimaced down at Cyrus. That was, is, the nastiest thing I've ever seen. Hollis's wolf stared at the pulpy mess. Only one thing mattered, and his wolf wasn't going to wait any longer. Hollis might be angry, but his wolf was ready to move on. He pushed past the rest of the pack and climbed into the van. He bit through her ropes, groaning at the feel of her hands sinking into his fur. Nothing in his life came close to it. Being near her, having her touch him, was heaven. He stared down at Ellen, nudging her with his nose, but the tears streaming down her cheeks caught him off guard. Why was she crying? Now, when it was over and the danger was gone. He nuzzled her face and throat, drawing her scent deep. Her scent. His mate. She was the only one who could tame his wolf. Oh, Hollis, she whispered, her lips brushing his ear. He was beautiful and strong and safe. Watching him fight had been the most exciting moment of her life and the most terrifying. His wolf groaned, nudging her with his nose. It was a simple gesture, but it spoke volumes. Neither of them were good with words, but this now was enough. It was good, even when his satisfied groan shifted to a reprimanding growl. She'd broken her promise. I'm sorry, she said, nodding. I'm sorry. I couldn't let them hurt you. He nudged her again, baring his teeth. I couldn't stand by and let them hurt you. This time he snorted. His wolf would forgive her, he told her that. But Hollis the man was hurt. He believed she hadn't trusted his wolf, that she'd fought because she feared he wasn't able. And Cyrus's insults and digs only made matters worse. She cradled his face, searching his vibrant green gaze. There was so much to ask. Say and forgive. But there was time now. With Cyrus gone, they had so much time. His wolf rubbed his head against hers, a long groan rumbling from deep within his chest. She wished she could shift. Her wolf longed to meet her mate, to touch him, smell him, and experience the bliss of his touch. Happiness bubbled up inside of her, tentative and fragile. He'd shifted to save her. I love you, she whispered against his ear. Her beautiful wolf, this beautiful man. His groan turned into a soft growl, a warning of sorts. She nodded, letting him lead the way from the van. Letting their guard down now would be a mistake. The others gathered were ready for a fight. Everyone accounted for, Finn asked, his gaze sweeping the windows of the building. No reinforcements for their team in there? Hollis's assistant is inside. No one else, Ellen said. This was a retrieval mission. She kept a hold of Hollis, pulling from his strength. Regardless of the tension in the air or the rigid posture of those facing off in the dimly lit lot, his wolf knew no fear. If it came to a fight, his wolf would win. He always sends this many for a retrieval mission? Anders asked. I get the feeling he was expecting trouble. Dante nodded at the others, still wavering. Maybe not that sort of trouble. Mal was still looking at what had once been Cyrus. I have to say, even though I didn't have shit to do this, he nudged Cyrus's foot with his own and looked at Hollis. You did good. Hollis snorted, still too preoccupied by the possible threat they were facing. Ellen stroked the thick fur between his shoulders, taking heart from his protective stance. 
Hollis had found his wolf, and his wolf was intimidating as hell. Are we fighting or what? Anders asked, rolling his head. Gentry's got his big gun loaded and is chomping at the bit to use it. She glanced over his shoulder at the Humvee that had followed the black suburban. Sure enough, she could see Gentry peeking through the roof, a massive gun resting on the roll bar. Exhaustion rolled over her, not just physical, but emotional. There's no need for that. Too many have died for him. You are no match for this pack. Surely you all see how futile that would be now. They are our enemy, another spoke up, his anger simmering beneath the surface. According to him, Ellen continued, Cyrus was the one who tormented them. If he'd left them alone, they would never have sought him out. The power was all that mattered to him. He feared losing it because he was afraid of them. He should have been. We are expendable, one of the female others said. The announcement was so matter-of-fact that all any of Finn's pack could do was stare. Ellen, however, was familiar with Cyrus's philosophy. She'd pitied those who'd so willingly believed it. Is that what he told you? Finn asked. The woman nodded. We have one purpose. The man next to her nudged her hard. He's dead, Mal pointed at the body. You're not going to get beaten or skinned, tortured or locked up for talking. That's not how we do things. The man frowned. What's the one purpose? Finn asked. Your pack, the woman said, to capture and kill you. She glanced at Ellen. And bring her back. She's the witch. Ellen saw the way the pack looked at her. She glared back at them. There was nothing to fear here. She can be a little mean sometimes, but that doesn't make her a witch. Anders' attempt to tease fell short. He says I am a witch because I refuse to believe what he said, she said. Telling you I'm a witch made you hate me instead of pity me. Her words counted for nothing. A murmur rippled through the pack, ratcheting up the oppressive weight of the air. He wanted you to kill us. Now he's dead. What's the point? Finn spoke calmly. You don't want to die tonight. Why the hell did the son of a bitch hate us so much? Anders asked. What the hell did we ever do to him? We existed, Mal growled. You want that fucking collar off? He asked her, kneeling to dig in Cyrus's pockets until he found the key. The moment the collar fell to the ground, her strength returned, as well as a throb in her face. Cyrus's work. He had barely dragged her from the room before slapping her hard enough to leave her ears ringing. It was a taste of what was to come, he'd said. An empty threat. Cyrus was gone forever. She leaned heavily against Hollis, trying to accept he was gone. Even if his pack tried to fight Finn, they'd lose. Cyrus had never been one to share power. He'd have made sure there was no one in the pack to challenge him. Now, there would be no one to lead the pack he'd left behind. He wanted justice, the man spoke. We've all lost people to you. Finn's surprise was obvious. Lost people? Ellen's hand tightened in Hollis's fur. You've all had loved ones killed? Her voice shook. Cyrus did this. By them, the woman whispered. He lied to you, as he lied to me. His best recruits were those who shared in his common enemy. She spoke clearly, hoping they'd listen. Motherfucker, Mal ground out. That's how he recruits? Blaming us for things he probably did? It's smart, Finn agreed. And from the looks of it, effective. She regarded Cyrus's remains. The bastard had left a legacy full of hate and deceit. Was there a way to convince the others their alpha was the enemy? Or was the damage Cyrus had done irreversible? Can you prove he lied to us? The man asked. I can try, Finn said. In the ten years since I was infected... I have only killed those that attacked me or my pack. Another ripple among the others. She counted eleven. Eleven pairs of disbelieving eyes and barely repressed hostility. They might be confused about Finn and his pack, but all of them had regarded her as the enemy. 
Hollis's wolf nudged her apart, wedging him between her and the others. He saw it too. She smiled at him. He said you'd say that. He said the witch would use magic on us to make us believe you. The man's voice grew thick and gruff, his shift barely restrained. He said you'd lure us in and wipe us out. Hollis nudged Ellen toward the warehouse. Even after she'd shown him what she was capable of, he sought to protect her. And their child, her wolf was quick to remind her. That was why she'd let him shield her. He was no more comfortable with her fighting than she was when he did it. Why would he say anything different, Finn asked. He needed you to do his dirty work. Convincing you we'd done horrible things made it okay for you to do them to us. You're full of shit, the man spit back, his skin going red. This man was loyal to Cyrus. She saw it in his pale gaze. Any further conversation would only delay the inevitable. It would be a quick fight. Eleven others versus their five, and Gentry, and whatever cannon he was holding. He was full of shit, Mal pointed at Cyrus's remains. You want to die over some dead asshole's lies? We can help you with that. Finn placed a hand on Mal's arm, restraining him. I'll say it again. We're not your enemies. We didn't come here to fight, only to protect and defend our pack mates. Pack is family. We protect one another, no matter what. There was a murmur among the group. You're outnumbered, the man said, a slow smile creasing his face. Do we look worried? Mal asked, bowing up. You should be, the woman spoke, falling forward to shift. The others launched as one teeming mass of teeth and claws, but Finn and the pack were ready. They met, a teeming mass of growls, snapping teeth and whimpers. Ellen dodged another, the sting of claws cutting through the flesh of her upper arm. Hollis attacked, knocking her attacker to the ground and snapping his neck. He growled at her, doing his best to herd her toward the lab while covering her. Running was against her nature. She gripped the hilts tightly. Promise her not, even her wolf knew it was foolish to remain unarmed. She picked up on movement from the corner of her eye. A gray wolf was on her, swiping her legs out from under her and sending her sprawling on the concrete to whack her head, one blade sliding out of her reach. Chapter 22 A gunshot fired, giving Gentry the permission to unload his cannon on the others. Hollis forced his shift and looped Ellen's arm around his neck, hurrying them across the parking lot. Breathing hurt like hell, but he had to get them out of there. The others had it out for Ellen. On top of the asshole he'd taken down, Mal and Finn had both jumped between her and it would-be attacker. With Gentry firing the M134 minigun, laughing his ass off, and the efficiency with which the pack was taking down the others, Hollis felt confident they could handle things without them. I'm fine, Ellen snapped, as he pulled her inside the warehouse. He didn't acknowledge her protest. An other was telling them, and his wolf wanted to fight. Stop dragging me, she tugged her arm, but Hollis held tight. Stop arguing, he bit back, glancing over his shoulder to see Anders take down the wolf. He pressed the button on the elevator, frantic to get her to safety. Hollis, Ellen's tone turned soft. Where is Kim? Damn it. He couldn't leave Kim undefended. Kim, Hollis called out impatient. Kim! Expanding his lungs to yell, hurt like a son of a bitch. The elevator opened. Dr. Hollis? She crawled out from under the desk, wide-eyed and breathing hard. What's happening? I'll tell you upstairs. Hollis waved her forward. Hurry. He glanced out the open doors. The noise and chaos outside had his wolf on high alert, but no one was coming. Kim glanced outside, her mouth dropping open. Oh, my God. Should we call the police? She paused. Who are they? Kim, he snapped. Elevator. She ran in and pressed herself flat against the back wall. Who's fighting? Why? There are no simple answers to those questions, Hollis said, hitting the elevator button. He pressed a hand to his side. Cyrus had a cut deep, piercing a lung and cracking a rib. Unlike his shoulder injury, this one hadn't healed well while he'd been in wolf form. I can stand, Ellis, Ellen murmured, pulling from his hold. She pressed a hand to her head, 
swaying on her feet until she rested her weight against the wall. I'm fine, she added. You can barely stay on your feet, Ellen. You're not fine. It took everything he had not to pull her into his arms. Kim whispered. Her head is bleeding. We'll need the first aid kit, Hollis said. So is your shoulder, Kim pointed, and your side. She paused. Are you sure we shouldn't call an ambulance? I'm sure, Hollis nodded. Gentry and Brown had plenty of connections to help them, but this was going to require a hell of a lot of cleanup first. His chest rattled with each breath. Silver? Ellen asked. He nodded. I think so. It still aches. Bastard, she hissed. Cyrus, she clarified. Yes, he agreed. He was. Her eyes opened, her gaze locking with his. Bus, she whispered. You were stabbed with silver, and you still managed to shift back? You are a mighty wolf, Hollis Robbins. A mighty what? Kim stammered. Her question hung, unanswered, until the elevator doors opened. I'll get the medical kit, Kim said, pausing at his side. You're naked, Dr. Hollis. He helped Ellen from the elevator, slid on his lab coat, and pulled an ice pack from the freezer. Here, he pressed it against the back of Ellen's head, grimacing when she winced. I'm okay, it's nothing, Ellen said, covering his hand with hers. Her mismatched gaze held him captive. I'm fine. His other hand reached up, cradling her cheek, touching her eased some of his fear and worry. Still, there were things that needed to be said. The elevator doors opened. Kim moved quickly, holding the medical kit, hiding behind Hollis and Ellen for protection. But it was Finn in the pack, bloody and disheveled, but in one piece. It's over, he asked. Finn nodded. I sure as fuck hope so. Mal growled, rubbing his jaw. Should I be scared? Kim whispered, her gaze bouncing from Finn to Anders to Dante. Hollis did the same, trying to see Finn and his pack as Kim did. Big, naked, and banged up to hell. They could be considered intimidating. But he knew them for what they were. Loyal wolves, good men, and his family. Anders laughed. No, Ellen assured her. We're the good guys, Anders volunteered. Just a little underdressed. Kim stared pointedly at the ceiling. You said it's over? What about Mr. White? Kim sniffed, tears filling her eyes. M my mother? Mr. White is dead. Hollis killed him. Ellen glanced at him before taking the woman's hand. Your mother is gone, Kim. I'm so sorry. One more casualty in a war they didn't want. Cyrus was dead, along with so many more. Was it too much to hope that this rivalry, this violence was over? He didn't want anyone else to suffer for being their acquaintance. He didn't want someone's world to be destroyed to get to Finn and the pack. Kim's sorrow rolled over them, her sobs shaking her small frame. She pressed her hand to her mouth, muffling the sound, but not the effect it had on those watching her fall apart. I'm sorry, Kim, he murmured. What can we do? Kim shook her head. Should we call someone? Anders asked. Anyone? She, she was all I had, Kim sniffed. We'll figure out what happens next, after we eat. Anders' voice softened, awkwardly patting on her shoulder. Hollis watched Anders display in astonishment, then glanced at Ellen. She held Kim's hands, clearly reading the woman's reaction. He didn't need to read Anders to see he was more than interested in the distraught woman. Anders, Kim. Kim, Anders. He thinks he's hilarious, Ellen smiled. We all play along to keep him happy. Anders shook his head. I am hilarious, but I'll wait till after we've got some food in you. I'd like to wash my hands and face, Kim murmured. Pull myself together. Anders nodded. Is there a bathroom close? Down the hall, Kim pointed, glancing at Ellen. You're still worried? We're being cautious, Anders smiled. Lead the way. Hollis watched them, the way Anders looped Kim's arm through his and the unmistakable curiosity on his face. 
That should be interesting, Dante murmured. Never seen Anders get remotely territorial like that. That's how it starts, Mal grinned. Still, we'll need to keep an eye on her for a while, just to be sure she's in the clear. Then sighed. If she has no place to go, and if there are any more crazy Cyrus followers out there, she's better off at the refuge for now. Hollis agreed Kim needed their protection, but taking her back to the refuge seemed drastic. Especially if Anders' wolf was interested in more than taking care of her. Tonight had been horrible, but it wasn't inescapable. The refuge was their world, a place there was no coming back from. Close, Mal asked. In my office, he tossed the keys to Mal. Dante, you're bleeding pretty bad. Want me to patch that up? Dante glanced at the long gash running from his lower back along his hip to his mid-thigh. Now, let's get the hell out of here before Gentry starts blowing things up. Hollis frowned. Not the lab. No, just the warehouse. It will look like a break-in and the fire was set to cover it. He's destroying the video feed and taking care of the... Dante shrugged. Evidence that might be hard to explain. Hollis shook his head. I don't want to know. Gentry's passion for firearms and explosives had saved their asses on numerous occasions. He wasn't thrilled about putting his research of the billions of dollars of equipment at risk, but Gentry was a professional. Good idea. Then you don't have to lie when the cops and insurance ask questions. Mal clapped him on the shoulder. But we should kick it into high gear. Get dressed and we'll go. Finn led them from the room. Ellen stood on the far side of the lab, braced. As much as he wanted to break the tension between them, he didn't know how. She'd hurt him deeply when she'd broken her word to him. Didn't she know what could have happened? His wolf longed for her touch, longed to be closer to her. And damn it, angry or not, so did he. Her gaze found his, then fell. He closed the distance between them, assessing her with a quick once-over. She'd survive. But seeing her battered, knowing someone had laid hands on her, made his blood boil. Let me look at your head, he murmured, distracted by the blood staining her shirt. You might need stitches. I'm fine. No, you're not, he argued. I am, Hollis. She stared at him. He ignored her, brushing away her hands and leading her under his lamp. The fluorescent bulb hummed, hurting his ears and rubbing against his already raw nerves. It didn't help that she was staring at him. One blue eye, one green eye, so intent he could hardly think straight, let alone determine if she needed stitches or not. What? he snapped. You're so angry with me, she whispered. She had no right to look sad, no right to tears. I am, he ground out, his jaw clenching as he fought for control. It was too raw too real to talk about. Not yet. Her hands cradled his face. Don't be. Eyes pressed shut. He managed to hold back his anger and sadness, fear and frustration. Barely. Don't. His breath powered out of him. You can't stay mad at me. You can't. You would have done the same thing. You are mine. I am yours. Her grip tightened, demanding he look at her. And when he did, the spark of anger in her eyes was mesmerizing and infuriating. You are mine, he growled, pulling away from her to tug up her shirt. And this is mine. He pressed his hand against her flesh. My child, a child you promised to protect. She opened her mouth, then squeezed her lips tight. He waited, hoping she'd argue. If he couldn't tear into someone physically, he'd damn well welcome a verbal throwdown. He was pissed as hell at her, but so fucking relieved that she was okay. That they were okay. It stole the air from his lungs to know that they might actually have a future together. Beneath his hands was the evidence of their bond. One strong enough to recover from whatever life threw at them. Not that he was ready to forgive her yet. No, he was too fired up, too overwhelmed. Someone cleared their throat. Were you ready? Then asked. He turned to find all eyes on them. Dante, Anders, Kim, 
and Finn, all watching and waiting, wearing various expressions. Yes, he answered, dropping the hem of her shirt and spinning away from her. Give me a minute to get a few things. I'll meet you downstairs, and we can go home. She wanted five minutes alone with him. Since they'd left the blazing warehouse, they'd been moving. From car to hotel, hotel to car, car to plane, plane to car, and finally arriving at the refuge. Always with the pack, never alone. He made sure of that. The more he kept them apart, the more irritated she grew. Now they were home, the pack reunited, and still he kept his distance. If he was going to be a stubborn ass, then she would not waste time trying to make amends. Instead, she'd be useful. Finn and Brown were already looking for activity from the remaining others. They'd gathered in Finn's office to talk strategy and preparation. It would take time for news of Cyrus's death to spread. He'd always kept the others fragmented and scattered, since smaller groups were easier to control. Using Brown and Gentry's connections, they had plenty of eyes and ears ready and willing to help track the remaining others. Nothing I like better about the hunt than the chase, Gentry said, leaning against Finn's desk. We'll find them. If any of them look like trouble, I'll call in. Chances are they'll scatter. Ellen ran her finger along the map that covered the conference table. As far as she knew, she'd traveled to every one of the other's dens. Cyrus had taken her with him, introducing her to his seconds, sharing her with those he truly favored. Her skin twitched, shoving aside those memories best forgotten. But she'd learned something important. While most of his favorites were ambitious and driven, none of them were capable of being an alpha. Without Cyrus, their pack would cease to exist. Or each group will try to form a pack, Dante pointed out. They might, she agreed, pressing a hand to her temple. Most won't live long enough to see that happen. Very few of his pack are originals. They have memories, would challenge his truths. No, best to keep the bloodlines fresh and the memories shorter. A good plan if the sickness hadn't set in, but it did. She glanced at Tess then, huddled in the corner of the couch. The girl still wouldn't look Ellen in the eye. Not that it mattered. Dante moved ever so slightly, putting himself between her and Tess. She sighed. Poor Dante. He could do better. But if his wolf had already chosen, there wasn't much he could do about it. Even if they do, there's no guarantee they'll want to follow Cyrus's master plan to wipe us out. Anders shook his head. Tonight we came off looking like one hell of a threat. It doesn't mean they won't, Mal added. If I can help, I will. Tess spoke softly, still nervous and uncertain in her new pack. She might know of dens I don't, Ellen said, her gaze returning to the map. You're to watch and report back, Gentry. Nothing more. Finn cautioned the grinning man. What if they get riled up and hungry for a fight? Gentry asked, still grinning. Finn sighed. There has to be a way to convince them the whole wolf-turf war thing was all Cyrus's idea. Olivia spoke up. Then we wouldn't have anything to worry about. That went so well last time. Mal hugged his mate close and pressed a kiss to her temple. Still so willing to believe the good in everyone. Which is why you love me, she said, pinching him on the arm. Ellen felt a twinge of envy at their closeness. Her gaze bounced to Hollis, but he was poring over some paperwork on Finn's desk. I'm with Olivia on this one, Dante shook his head. They live like we do, thinking we're coming for them. Tess cleared her throat. I don't want to put any of you, us at risk, but Dante has a point. Living in fear is living half a life. We, they, don't know how to live as a wolf without being ruled by him. They will panic. A short life, growing sick and dying, Ellen added. Cyrus gave me turning dates so I could track them. Even he realized there was something wrong. Life expectancy was no more than seven years, usually five. She paused, looking at Tess. You were with them how long? Seven years, Tess said. Now it's five. Some others three, Ellen frowned. The pack will die in time without Cyrus. Is there a way to help them? Finn asked, looking between Hollis and Ellen. I don't know, Hollis shrugged, 
sparing her a fleeting gaze. I haven't had many others to run tests on. And I'm thinking the likelihood of them lining up for us to experiment on seems pretty slight. Anders shook his head. It might be best to start small. She rolled her head slowly. I know there are some who would gladly forget the bad blood between our packs. Now that Cyrus is gone, it's possible. Tess nodded. It's true. If it's possible, then we'll try, Finn said. Mal growled. Meaning we'll research the shit out of each group, go in armed to the teeth, and be prepared to kill every last one of them. After Gentry has the place scoped out and knows exactly what we're walking into, Finn nodded. Then yes. She nodded, a sudden bolt of pain shooting up her neck and into her skull. She winced, hissing against the unexpected stabbing sensation. Is your head bothering you? Hollis asked her, bringing all conversation to a stop. Yes, it was throbbing, with the occasional stabbing pain. And that was the only reason he was looking at her, talking to her. She frowned. I'm fine. Let me see, Hollis said, crossing the room. His concern was nothing short of infuriating. She shook her head, wincing at the effort that took. Anders said, Forgot you can't shift. I can see it from here. Gotta hurt like a son of a bitch. It's fine, she ground out, hating the attention. Finn looked at her. Let Hollis check. It wasn't a request. She pushed out of her chair and stalked toward her mate. Here, she snapped. Would you prefer some privacy? He asked, jaw tight, green eyes studying her. Now you want privacy? She waited, hands on hips. You've turned this into an exhibition. By all means, see for yourself. I am fine. His hands rested on her shoulders, causing a shudder to run down her spine. This was what she craved more than anything else. His touch. She let him lead her to Finn's desk and pulled the lamp closer, stooping for a closer view. I should have stitched this before we left. But his anger had gotten in the way. His scent flooded her. You stubborn man. Her voice lacked the bite she wanted. I'm stubborn, he asked, parting her hair to assess her injury. You're the one bleeding and refusing help. I don't need help, she snapped, waiting for his hands to fall away before standing. You proved that today, his voice was low, the last word ending on a growl. She spun to face him. Hollis? If Mal had been tied to that chair, or Finn, would you have done the same thing? His eyes searched hers. Would you have jeopardized the baby's safety if you'd known their wolf was capable? She swallowed. She'd have done more than broken her word. She'd hurt him, wounded his pride deeply. Or was it just me? He pushed. She ignored the pack, ignored everything but him. Pack be damned, Hollis Robbins. You are all I have. Her hands fisted at her sides as she stared him down. I will not live without you. I cannot. She broke off, hitting the waver in her voice. Forgive me or not, I would do it again. If you refuse to understand, then you are the stubborn ass, not me. His expression revealed nothing. But no, to answer your question... I would not have acted as I did if it had been anyone else in that chair. She shook her head. But not for the reasons you think. Her hands cradled his face. I believe in you, Hollis. I've always known you'd be a fierce wolf. But my wolf, my instinct, would not be denied. I will always fight for you. And fight with you. She ran her fingers through the tangled copper locks she so loved then sighed. Believe me or not, your wolf knows the truth. She stepped back, crossing her arms over her chest, and scowled at him. His gaze bore into hers, intent and piercing and tender. I do. He pulled her close. Now you forgive me. Watching you tonight, I was wrong to expect you not to fight. He drew in a deep breath, his hand cradling her cheek. 
You are a fighter and a healer. I love who you are, as you are. Every stubborn hair on your beautiful body, your scathing insults, your lethal grace. The smile you give Oscar and Diana. The smile just for me. Because you're mine. I am, she whispered, sliding her arms around his neck. As you belong to me. My warrior. My mate. My love. He smiled. The slight flare of his nostrils revealing his hunger for her. When his lips sealed against hers, her wolf howled for more. This was what she needed. Someone cleared a throat. Not to ruin the moment here, but I'm not sure I want to see where this is going, Anders interrupted. Agreed, Dante said. We're done here, Finn chuckled. We'll talk later. Much later, Anders whispered. Mal laughed. Ellen took Hollis's hand in hers. Much later, she said. But Hollis was already dragging her from the office and down the hall to their room. She waited until they reached their room before launching herself at him. He caught her, the fire in his eyes making her throb. Your head, he said against her lips. Be gentle, she murmured, biting his lip. But love me. I do. More than my own life. He groaned, pulling back. Tonight was hell. He broke off, fear and sadness twisting his beautiful face. And for me, she said, tilting his face toward hers. But we are one. We make each other stronger. True mates. I will always be with you. Always. His nod was stiff. But sometimes it scares me how much I love you. She nodded, her fingers twining in his copper locks. I know. Epilogue Hollis ran his hand over the swell of Ellen's stomach. Their child kicked and rolled inside, stretching her skin. That was a foot, he said, pressing her stomach. It's getting crowded in there. Yes, I noticed, Ellen laughed. You're distracting me. You've been working all morning, Hollis argued. Yes, she glanced up at him. You could help. He grinned, packing up her tools and carrying them back to the cabinet. She cradled the bone in her arms, treating it as the precious heirloom it was. He'd brought it from the vault to surprise her, and she'd spent the better part of the last month studying it. After three days of reading, she'd made diagrams, jotted notes, and packed it away to continue her research online. Kim had been eager to help. Her natural curiosity made her an exceptional assistant for his very pregnant wife. What she'd learned was both impressive and overwhelming. In his years of testing and research, he'd never come close to what she'd discovered, and today she was going to share it with the pack. I'm ready, she whispered, running her hands over her stomach. I have your notes, Kim followed, a well-used spiral in her hands. They're waiting for you. He took her hand and led her into the great room. In under a year, they'd almost doubled the size of their pack. Anger and fear had been replaced with only good things. Love and hope, things he used to demean, were first. If you say we're from Transylvania, I'm leaving, Mal sounded off. I'm no vampire's guard dog. Vampires don't exist, Olivia patted his arm. As far as we know, Anders teased, moving over to make room for Kim. He slid an arm around her shoulder. Kim's only reaction was the bold color staining her cheeks. Hollis still didn't approve of the match, but appreciated the two were moving slowly. Maybe if they were both lucky, this was only a passing flirtation. Not funny, Dante shook his head. Maybe a little, Tess asked, smiling up at him. All that stood between Tess and Dante was her father. Dante had turned to Tess, and Tess was recovering well. And as grateful as Brown was to have his daughter with him, he was in no hurry to have her leave his side. Luckily, Tess and Dante understood and were doing their damnedest to keep their wolves in check. How long that would last was anybody's guess. I appreciate the time and energy you've put into researching this, Finn smiled from his place on the floor, offering Oscar another block for his tower. Ellen smiled. It's been interesting. I think you'll be fascinated. I've spent many hours reading, 
almost talking to him. It's a man? Jess asked, rocking Diana. Ellen nodded. Pascual Otero of Argentina. The room was instantly silent. Am I the only one freaking out? It's the bone has a name, Anders asked. No, Dante agreed. Argentina? Jessa looked up from her place on the floor. Oscar was busy stacking blocks, and Diana watching him from her bouncy seat. Go on, please, Finn sat forward, resting his elbows on his knees. He was born around 1516, the seventh son of a seventh son. There is a myth that probably evolved from his family, or some earlier relative. Under a blood moon, he fell victim to bloodlust and killed every member of his family. Finn's jaw locked. He was infected under a blood moon and attacked them. It was a miracle he hadn't killed them all. Or, as Ellen put it, maybe it was fate. He was devastated. The village assumed he'd been dragged off by whatever had killed his family, so he ran, hiding until he'd learned to control his wolf and his ability to shift. Then he went where he was needed. Needed? Mal asked. Call it survivor's remorse, even guilt. So many wars were fought since the 1500s. He championed the weak with everything he had and moved on. Always moving. She turned to face the map. Portugal, Spain, Italy, Rome, then America. America was undiscovered and wild. The Revolution, the Civil War, then west into Indian territory, and met a woman. Of course he did, Dante sighed. So there are other offspring from Pasquale? No. He met her after she was married. Her husband beat her, but being a woman of faith, she wouldn't leave him. He stayed, alone and hidden, to protect her. When her husband saw her speaking to Pasquale, he went into a rage and murdered her. Pasquale killed him. The woman's young son stabbed Pasquale with his father's bayonet, silver, and he crawled off to die. He was a good man, Jessa took Finn's hand. Ellen nodded. A noble wolf. There are still Oteros left in Argentina. Finn looked at her. Wolves? I've searched every way imaginable and keep coming up empty. If they are, they've learned how to cover their tracks. Hollis shrugged. The myth could have been created to hide their very real existence. Finn sat back, his gaze distant. Are we going to Argentina? Jessa asked. Finn smiled, kissing her knuckles. Maybe someday. Not while they're young. Not until after you've been turned. Thank you, Ellen, for giving the pack a heritage they can be proud of. She nodded. After the pack had peppered her with questions, taking the map off the wall to track the places Pasquale Otero had traveled and read through the entire myth of the seventh son of a seventh son, Hollis had enough. She was trying hard to hide it, but she was tired. He crept up behind her, wrapped his arms around her, and cradled her belly. You're amazing. She leaned against him with a groan. I am, she agreed. He kissed her temple. Enough about Pasquale for today. She turned. What do you have in mind? I want to hear more about you, Elena Vasiliev, and your pack. You do? She turned to face him, smiling widely. I do. He kissed her. A whisper of a kiss. They'd started reading the leather book a month ago, not long after the fire. Every evening, the words of her ancestors pulled him into a past he'd never imagined. He admired her scribes. Their attention to detail had left a wealth of knowledge for those that followed. Lists of names, places of birth, parents, birthdays, and dates of death. Each had their own narrative. Some included only facts and figures. Others included everything from herbal medicine recipes, routes traveled through specific mountain ranges, rites and ceremonies from the old country, to personal observations and anecdotes. Interesting as it was, some notes mattered more than others to Alice. Elena Vasiliev was her full name. She teased him about their age difference, now that they knew she was over 400 years old. Alice didn't care. He loved knowing she and her pack were German. Their nomadic existence was cut short when they were driven from their native country for witchcraft in 1785. She'd stared at her name for almost an hour, 
her eyes filling with tears, and a smile on her lips before she'd turned to him. I remember my mother's face. There had been so much joy in her eyes. The more they read, the more her memories began to resurface. She recorded them all. Flashes, sensory memories, voices or places. Each day she added something to her notebook, and each day she grew rounder with their child. Maybe I'm done with books and research for the day. Her mismatched gaze blazed with a need he understood far too well. He buried his nose in her hair and breathed deep. Would this hunger ever ease? Even now, safe in his arms, he craved more. My wolf agrees. Oh? What else does your wolf say? Ellen asked, her fingers tangling in his hair. That he loves you, he whispered. And you love me? That is true, she nodded. And? Hollis shook his head. He'd rather I showed you. He took her hand in his and led her to their room. This concludes Protecting the Wolf's Mate by Sasha Summers. Narrated by Connor Brown. Copyright 2018 by Sasha Summers. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Entangled Publishing, LLC, and was produced in the year 2022 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. Mm -hmm.